Chapter 11 Let us not love in words or speech, but in deed and in truth. John Chapter 3 Verse 18 That, Hope announced as the carriage pulled up in front of Great Uncle Oswald's house, was the most exciting thing I have ever seen. The music, the spectacle, the lady riders, and the way that man rode on the horse's back, standing upright. How I would like to try that. And he wasn't even holding onto the reins, her twin agreed. He was quite handsome too, in a barbaric sort of way, didn't you think? The carriage door opened. Gideon stepped out and proceeded to hand down the ladies. The twins alighted first, followed immediately by Prudence. She accepted his hand but refused to meet his eyes. Gideon suspected she couldn't. He had an idea that his little hawk was flustered beyond anything by her forwardness in kissing him at the ball. If he was any judge of feminine behavior, she was mortified as much by her obvious response to him as with her out-of-character actions. And so she was pretending it hadn't happened. Ever since the kiss, she had treated him with reserve and a great deal of formality. She was, in fact, thought Gideon, with an inner chuckle, doing her very best to pretend that they'd never even met. But if she thought severe formality would force him to keep his distance, she was in for disappointment. She was adorable as a formidable little dowager. If she treated him with much more of her disdain, he'd have to kiss her again. Gideon held her hand a moment or two longer than strictly necessary, and she stood there waiting for him to release her, refusing to look at him. Finally, she lifted her gaze and glared up at him, tugging her hand in vain. He lifted her gloved hand to his lips, turned it over, peeled back her glove, and kissed the naked flesh revealed, all the while quizzing her wickedly with his eyes. A fiery blush lit her cheeks, and she snatched her hand back and stepped briskly away from him. A moment later, a maidservant darted up the side steps onto the wet pavement and thrust a piece of paper into her hand. Gideon turned to help the next girl down, but his cousin was there before him. Miss Charity, Edward murmured reverently. Charity laid a gloved hand in Edward's and stepped down. Did you enjoy the show? The Duke inquired gravely, still holding on to her hand, even though she had alighted safely. Gideon smiled to himself. The flags of the pavement were slightly uneven, after all. Charity's face glowed with pleasure. I thought the horses were the cleverest, knowing exactly what to do without anyone telling them. If anyone had told me that horses could perform a dance with perfect timing and execution, well, I wouldn't have believed them. To think I have seen an equestrian ballet. Thank you, Your Grace, for taking us. It has been a truly wonderful experience. She smiled, and suddenly Gideon could see her resemblance to Prudence. It was obvious to him now why his cousin thought Charity a diamond of the first water. Her smile was the same as Prudence's. The pleasure was all mine, the Duke declared, flushing. Gideon observed his cousin compassionately, seeing the glazed look, the distinctly cod-like helplessness and devotion. Yes, they were both well and truly hooked. Gideon turned to assist Grace, but she had scrambled down unaided. She hooked her arm through his in a friendly manner. I like the battle scenes best, all that smoke and the cannons and the soldiers so brave and smart in their uniforms, she declared. But Gideon's attention was suddenly caught as he realized Prudence had frozen stock still. She was as pale as the crumpled piece of paper clutched in her hand. As he watched, she swayed slightly, as if suddenly faint. Gideon sprang forward and wrapped his arm around her waist. What is it, Prue? Bad news? Are you ill? It spoke volumes for Prudence's state of mind that she did not seem to notice his intimate hold, let alone his use of her name. She held up the paper, and in a somber voice said to her sisters, It's from Mrs. Burton. It was as if a small flock of happy chicks had suddenly spotted a snake above them, he thought. The carefree excitement of a moment before was extinguished by a sudden tense silence. The twins moved closer, their hands linked in unconscious solidarity, their eyes fixed on Prudence. Grace turned as white as her sister. Prudence stepped away from Gideon and gathered the little girl to her protectively. Charity stood biting her lip, 
then suddenly stepped away from the Duke and went to stand on the other side of Grace, so that Prudence and the child were enclosed. Gideon exchanged glances with Edward, and with one accord they stepped closer to the huddle of girls, in time to hear Prudence explaining. Mrs. Burton doesn't know how he found out. She thinks the new boot boy let something slip, but when she wrote this, she checked the letter again. The day before yesterday, he'd ordered the coach to be made ready for a long trip. He's coming to London to look for us. She sent this note with one of the stable boys who rode on the mail. He cannot be far behind. The girls looked wildly around as if he, whoever he was, might be anywhere. Prudence swallowed and continued in a calm voice. It is all right. We shall be safe, I promise you. You will have to flee, won't we, Prue? Charity said quietly. Prudence hesitated, then nodded. I can see no other alternative. Won't Great Uncle Oswald help us? Grace asked. Prudence looked troubled. He would try, I'm sure, darling, but he is entirely dependent on Grandpapa financially, and he has been so kind to us, I don't think we should ask him to risk his very livelihood. And he is not so strong or as vicious as Grandpapa, Hope stated bluntly. Grandpapa would just knock him down and start on us. He might not even believe us, added Faith. Nobody ever did before, not until Dr. Gibson saw Grace with his own eyes. Besides, Charity added practically, Great Uncle Oswald is away for the day, and Grandpapa could arrive at any minute. What is going on, Prudence? Gideon scanned her face worriedly. She looked so frightened, damn it. They all did. He wanted to snatch her back in his embrace, but she was surrounded by sisters. He clenched his fists. What the devil was happening? And why did they seem to think that flight was their only alternative? He glanced at Edward, who returned his look with a worried shrug. We have to leave. Now, Prudence said in a flat voice. Thanks to Mrs. Burton, we are forewarned, and by the time Grandpapa comes, we shall be gone. What do you mean? Gideon tried to catch Prudence's eye, but her eyes were only for her sisters. Like a little mother hen, she swept them all up the front steps and into the entry hall. Quick, girls, upstairs and pack a portmanteau as fast as you can. Pack for me, too, if you can. Hope, will you fetch down my special box, please? I will make other arrangements, and I'll leave a note for Great Uncle Oswald explaining everything. Now hurry, hurry. If he catches us, all will be lost. Before Gideon or the Duke could say a word, Charity, Hope, and Faith raced up the stairs and disappeared. Grace, my love, all will be well if you just hurry, Prudence urged. Grace's arms folded defensively, hunched into herself. Oh, Prue, what if... The little girl looked to Gideon's eyes, suddenly a great deal smaller and younger, pale and pinched and defenceless. He found his fists clenching harder. Prudence gathered the child into her arms and hugged her tightly. He shan't find us, Graciela. I promise you. I will... I will kill him myself before I let him take us back. I will soon be one and twenty, and he cannot touch us then. Now run along and pack. We will leave as soon as I can find a carriage to take us out of London. She gave her little sister a gentle push toward the stairs, and Grace hurried off. Gideon grabbed Prudence and swung her around to face him. What the devil is the matter? I gather your grandfather is coming to town, but why do you fear him so? Prudence shrugged him off. I'm sorry, I don't have time to explain. We must get away from here. I have to get some money and find a carriage and write a letter. But I want to know why. She flung off his hand, clearly distracted. We have to get away. Please, just leave. I thank you for your concern, Lord Caradice, and your kindness too, your grace, but we must. Hang my concern. I'm not going anywhere, snapped Gideon. Do you imagine for one minute that I could leave you in such obvious distress? Whatever it is, I'm at your service. Now what do you need me to do? Prudence could hardly believe her ears. She stared up at Lord Caradice, a long, painful moment. Do... Do, do you mean it? She stammered. You, you will help us? His face softened, and he gently smoothed back a lock of hair from her face. Foolish imp. 
You don't imagine I could see you so obviously facing trouble and just stroll out of here, do you? Prudence shrugged. Not since she was eleven had anyone seemed to care about her distress, and certainly nobody had simply offered to help. She bit her lip and stared at him dumbly, her eyelids prickling. Come, my love, don't cry now. Plenty of time for that later, if you want. I'm with you all the way, in whatever you want. His smile was a touch rueful. Well, I help you. Try to stop me. I, too, wish to offer my assistance, added the Duke. Prudence's face crumpled, but she managed to master herself. She fiercely blinked back tears, forcing herself to become businesslike. Thank you. I would be extremely grateful if you could find us a carriage. We need to get away from here on the instant, and Great Uncle Oswald has taken his to visit friends in Richmond. What sort of carriage? asked Gideon. Prudence looked at him blankly. Where are you planning to go? She shook her head. I don't know. I hadn't thought that far ahead. Out of London. It depends. It depended on how much money she had. She'd meant to sell some of her mother's jewellery before this, but she'd put the moment off, hoping it would not be necessary after all, and now see where her procrastination had got her. Gideon glanced at the Duke. What about your mother's old travelling carriage? It's a bit antiquated, but it's solid enough and should fit five young ladies in their possessions, and if you order my phaeton, that should cover all eventualities. An excellent notion, agreed the Duke. I shall nip home immediately and see to it. Oh, and Edward, tell your man and mine to throw a few things into a valise for us, and a roll or two of soft. It doesn't hurt to be prepared. Good idea. The Duke hurried out the door. Gideon turned back to Prudence, explaining. You see, Edward customarily drives a curricle, and the Landau is too. He broke off. She looked quite distracted frowning with fierce concentration, completely unaware of his presence. Her hair had fallen out of its customary knot, and loose tendrils were spiralling outward. The half-dozen freckles across the bridge of her nose stood out against her pallor, like breadcrumbs scattered over snow. She looked small, and worried, and bedraggled, and beautiful, and the forlorn expression in her eyes squeezed his heart in his chest. It's all right. Tell me what needs to be done he said in a bracing tone. I am yours to command. We need to be gone from this place as soon as possible. While the girls pack and your cousin finds us a carriage, I'll write the letter for Great Uncle Oswald, and you can... She frowned. Actually, there's nothing you can do at the moment, unless you want to help with the packing. He sighed. I'm not much use at packing feminine apparel, unless you don't mind it all crushed, but I will fetch and carry bags. He added with a glimmer of wry humour. I was hoping for a little more scope with my chivalrous instincts. Porter was not exactly the role I had in mind. Are you sure you don't need any dragons slain? He said it as a joke, but her face dimmed, as if a shadow had passed across her eyes. He couldn't bear it. In two quick paces he had her wrapped in his arms. She clung to him briefly with ragged vehemence, then stepped back, as if to isolate herself from him. Gideon stroked her cheek lightly with the back of one finger. Tell me about the dragon, Prue, he said softly. Your grandfather. Why has he got you all in a pother? I didn't think you were afraid of anything. She shook her head, not meeting his eyes, saying nothing. Grace seems terrified, he said. I always thought her a little Viking, afraid of nothing. She didn't want to tell him, he could see. She was determined to deal with it on her own. Gideon was just as determined to find out what caused a happy flock of garrulous girls to become pinched and fearful and silent. What makes a child like Grace so frightened? He persisted softly. What would make my courageous little Miss Imprudence flee in such anxiety? The backs of his fingers caressed her skin with tender insistence. Prudence shivered. She closed her eyes, a brief, almost defeated look. Then she swallowed and said simply, Grandpapa is very harsh. He beats us all, Hope said from the doorway. Violently, often, and for no good reason. 
He beats Faith just for singing, and me if I use my left hand. But he thrashes Prudence. And lately he has started on Grace in the same way. I hate him. Prue, here's the box. And Faith wants to know if we can take our new cashmere shawls. There was a moment of silence in the room. The very matter-of-fact way in which Hope had referred to the beatings chilled Gideon's blood. He thrashes Prudence. For a moment he could not think. Prudence stirred, pulled away from Gideon's touch, became almost brisk again as she took a battered wooden box from Hope. Thank you. Yes, take the shawls if you want. They are warm as well as fine, and you might need them in the carriage, but take only what you can fit in one portmanteau. We cannot carry any more. Now hurry! Hope ran off. Prudence sat down at the writing desk, picked up the pen, and began to write. She didn't look at Lord Caradice, but she could see him from the corner of her eye. He was very still. Hope's words had shocked him, she could tell. But she didn't have time to reassure him, and besides, there was nothing to say. What's done is done, and no use repining. It was now that counted, not the unhappy past. And right now, she had to get this letter written to Great Uncle Oswald. Poor Great Uncle Oswald. This morning he'd left a house full of girlish laughter. He would return to find it empty. He would read the tale of their lies and deception, and then he would have to face an enraged elder brother. It was poor thanks for the kindness and generosity he had shown them. Prudence vowed to make it up to him one day. She continued to write. Behind her, and slightly to the left, Lord Caradice stood as if frozen. He remained still and silent for several long moments. Then she felt him moving toward her, felt his hands enclose her shoulders, and gently turn her to face him. He thrashes you. His voice was deep and soft, but it contained a note she had never heard in him before. She'd thought him only capable of pleasant nonsense and laughter. She was wrong. Why does he thrash you? He asked again, in that soft, implacable voice. And why has nobody stopped him? His anger was a little frightening, to tell the truth. Frightening, and yet comforting at the same time. Because although she didn't understand such silent, cold rage, and had never experienced such a thing, she knew it was entirely on her behalf. She'd never experienced that either. A rage that protected, instead of attacked. She had no idea how to deal with the feelings his response had engendered. Had no idea how to respond. She could not look him in the eyes. She shrugged awkwardly and tried to bend over her letter. It is nothing, just some stupid prejudice he has about my hair. She mumbled. What about it? He thinks the color is a sign of the devil in me. A sign that I am wanton and wicked and evil. She stared blindly at the letter she was writing. There was some truth in Grandpapa's accusations. He had cause for his condemnation of her. Oh, not about her hair, but about other things. She heard the quick, shocked intake of his breath, and felt his palm curl around her nape, tenderly, possessively, comfortingly. His long, strong fingers slipped through her tumbled curls, loosening the final remnants of the knot stroking and caressing as he murmured. Your hair is beautiful, Prudence. It's glorious. Like a sunset over an autumn forest. Like tendrils of molten copper, fresh from the forge. I've never seen more beautiful hair in my life. The writing in front of Prudence shimmered and blurred. Of course, he was only saying it to comfort her, but still. He must admire it a little at least, Else, how would he think of such beautiful things to say? Tendrils of molten copper, fresh from the forge. A sunset over an autumn forest. She treasured up his words in a small secret corner of her heart. He pressed a warm kiss on the nape of her neck, and she shivered with fleeting pleasure, awash with weakness in the wake of his tenderness. Oh, where was the flippant rake when you needed him? She could resist him, just. But this Lord Caradice, with poetry and tenderness on his lips, and protective rage in his heart. She couldn't bring herself to look at him. She didn't know why she felt so ashamed that he knew part of her shabby little secret, 
but that was how she felt. She wanted nobody to know how viciously her grandfather beat her. She felt besmirched. She knew she should not. That Grandpapa had no moral right to continue beating her, and yet, and yet, she was not an innocent, not like Grace and her sisters. Four and a half years before, Prudence had, by her own actions, broken rules she knew Grandpapa had held sacred. Her actions had pushed him over the edge from habitual harshness to extreme and deliberate cruelty. Her physical punishment was, in some peculiar way, an expiation. That was what had made her most ashamed of all, as if there was some sort of vile complicity between them. But then he'd started on Grace, and that she could not bear. That was when she'd started to fight back. Lord Caradice moved around to stand beside her, and waited for her to look up at him. Prudence bent over the letter, trying to disguise the fact that her eyes were full of unshed tears. Prudence. My prudence, he said softly. She closed her eyes a moment, forcing the tears back. He lowered himself, slowly, with fluid deliberation, until he was kneeling before her. He took her hands in both of his, warm, strong, filling her with his strength. His face was on a level with hers. She could tell by the faint stirring of his breath against her skin. She took a deep, shaky breath and opened her eyes and found herself drowning in his dark, fathomless gaze. There was no lurking twinkle, no glimmer of mockery. No one shall ever again harm so much as a hair on your head, my prudence, nor that of your sisters, not while there is breath in my body to prevent it. It was a vow. Prudence felt like a medieval queen, with the knight of her heart declaring himself her vassal. She stared into the liquid heat of his gaze, and saw there a refuge, and a haven, and love. And the tears finally spilled from her eyes, for she was not entitled to his refuge or his love. She belonged to Philip, was bound to him by a promise she had made in the churchyard, and by a later promise even more sacred. His ring rested hard and heavy against her breast, reminding her of the weight of her oaths, even now. Oh dear, look what you've made me do, she wailed, searching in vain for a handkerchief and dashing tears from her cheeks with embarrassment. I almost never cry, and have no time to do so now, in any case. I need to be strong for my sister's sake, as well as my own. He pulled out a pristine white handkerchief and gently mopped up her tears while she tried to scrub them away with her hands. I know. He said quietly, and you are strong. But I don't care who you think you are betrothed to, at this moment you are mine to protect, and for the rest of my life, if you wish it. She shook her head distressfully, and he tipped up her chin and smiled ruefully. Don't fret, love. I haven't forgotten otter shanks. I don't mean to press you at this inopportune time. Just know that you are no longer alone in this, or any other difficulty. And he lifted her hand and kissed it with the same formality, almost with reverence, renewing and reaffirming his vow. Prudence snuffled into his handkerchief, unbearably moved. Now, he stood up and said in a very different voice, you mustn't disdain the protection of a frippery shag bag and a medium-sized duke with tendency to stoutness. We can be formidable fellows when we try, you know. He rubbed her back lightly and added in a soft voice, Dry your eyes, Miss Imprudence. We have letters to finish, bags to pack, dragons to rout. Prudence gave him a tremulous smile. Having a friend who was young and strong and independent of Grandpapa's influence and willing to stand up for her was a new experience. I gather Sir Oswald does not know the situation. Prudence shook her head and explained a little shamefacedly. No, we deceived him when we came here. I... I forged the letter in Grandpapa's hand. Great Uncle Oswald welcomed us with open arms and showed us more kindness than my sisters have ever seen in their lives, since Mamma and Papa died, that is. She stopped a moment, unable to speak for the lump in her throat. 
grandpapa is our legal guardian, at least until I come of age, which is the week after next. Once I turn one and twenty by my father's will, I am entitled to become my sister's guardian. She did not mention the need to support them as well. Then why not ask for Sir Oswald's support until then? I could not ask it of him. My sisters are right. Grandpapa would not hesitate to lay violent hands on Great Uncle Oswald. He nearly killed a groom once, for some mistake with a horse. But, and though Grandpapa is the elder brother, he is stronger and fitter, for he hunts regularly. Great Uncle Oswald lives a sedentary existence. I would not allow him to harm your uncle. She smiled mistily and shook her head. Thank you, but that is not all. As a younger son, Great Uncle Oswald is entirely dependent on Grandpapa's goodwill for his income, you see. I could not bear it if you were thrust into poverty as a result of trying to help us. Lord Caradise did not look convinced, so she continued. Great Uncle Oswald probably would defy Grandpapa, but with no income of his own, he could not support us, and though I shall have money from the sale of some jewels, I couldn't possibly support Great Uncle Oswald in the style he currently enjoys. He is rather extravagant, you know. She shook her head decisively. No. Far better that we simply take ourselves out of Grandpapa's reach until I turn one and twenty. And if Charity and... She broke off. Edward had not yet asked Charity to wed him. It could still come to naught. Your cousin said he would help us. A duke is quite powerful in some ways, is he not? Yes, said Lord Caradice. And so are the cousins of dukes. That brought a glimmer of a smile to her lips. Gideon continued. So, we are to embark on a journey. And what is our destination to be? I haven't thought that far ahead, she admitted. I just want to get away before he gets here. Oh, and I will need to sell some jewellery. I will not have sufficient. You need not sell your trinkets, he began. I shall advance a sum. I'm sorry, but I could not possibly accept money from you. Prudence interrupted him firmly. She added in a softer voice. Your help is most welcome, Lord Caradice, and I will gladly borrow your cousin's carriage. But you know it would be most unseemly for me to borrow money from you. Bah! Propriety be hanged! I have jewellery set aside for just this purpose, Prudence insisted. And I would appreciate it if you would assist me in the selling of it, for I must confess, I do not know where to start. She looked at him, her eyes troubled. It's not that I don't appreciate. Gideon scowled, then sighed and smiled at her ruefully. I know, and you are quite right. I'm sorry. I should not pinch at you for your scruples. I shall help you sell your baubles, though it goes against the grain. Finish your letter, my dear, and don't give it another thought. I think I can hear my cousin's voice in the hall, which will mean your carriage awaits you. He left the room to check arrangements with his cousin. It didn't take long for Prudence to finish the letter to Great Uncle Oswald. She left it propped up on the mantel in the drawing room, sealed with wax, his name on the front. She hurried upstairs to see to the packing of her things, but there was nothing left for her to do. Her maidservant Lily had done it all for her. The bedchamber had been swept clean of her possessions. The portmanteaus were packed and strapped onto the Duke of Dinstable's somewhat antiquated but undeniably large travelling coach. Also in the street, being walked up and down by Lord Caradice's groom, was a dashing phaeton drawn by two magnificent greys. Miss Meridue and I have a small commission to perform in the city, announced Lord Caradice. We shall travel in the phaeton and catch up with the rest of you. I hope there's room for me, Miss Prue, declared a loud voice behind them. Lily stood in the hallway, clutching a bundle to her chest. I'd rather be skinned alive with a blunt knife and me innards eaten by rats than left behind to face old Lord Derham. It's all right. We wouldn't do that to you, Prudence assured her. Of course you shall come with us. Lily glanced from the carriage with the crest on the panel to the dashing phaeton and hesitated. Which carriage are you riding in, miss? Lord Caradice said softly, Lily, it would be best if you travelled in the main coach with the Duke. Miss Prudence and I are using the Phaeton. 
Prudence opened her mouth to suggest that she needed Lily as chaperone, but he caught her attention and gave her a significant look that encompassed the battered old box. She subsided. He was right. She didn't want a witness to the shame of having to sell her mother's jewelry. It was bad enough he knew what straits she was reduced to, but Lily, good soul that she was, would gossip. And besides, she told herself, it would be an hour or so in an open carriage with a groom in attendance. No chaperone was necessary. Lily's face fell. But don't you and Miss Prudence need me here, my lord? We do, of course, but I think my cousin the Duke would be sincerely grateful for your assistance. One mere man with so many young ladies. He's relying on you, Lily. He smiled winningly. Ah, well, if the Duke needs me said Lily with the air of one accustomed to the helplessness of dukes. She handed her bundle to a groom and took her place in the carriage, swelling visibly with pride as the duke helped her to mount the steps. James, their loyal footman, stood in the evening shadows, watching the whole proceedings, doing his best to look nonchalant. Prudence saw the longing in his eyes and realized he was too proud to ask to come with them. James, we wouldn't dream of leaving you behind, she said softly. Please come with us, if you want to, that is. Oh, thank you, miss. Of course I want to. James bowed with alacrity and raced up the servant's stairs to fetch his belongings. Is there a chimney sweep you'd like to invite too? Lord Caradice murmured, and Prudence turned defensively. But his gaze upon her was warm and lit with approval and understanding, so she explained. James has been one of our only friends. She looked up at him until now. There was a lump in her throat, making it difficult to speak. Back in Norfolk, many people knew of their situation, but had turned a blind eye, leaving five young girls at the mercy of a harsh and twisted man. She cleared her throat and continued. James risked his position many times in order to protect us, Grace in particular. We could not possibly leave him behind to face Grandpapa's wrath. No, of course not. He said softly. Loyalty is your middle name, is it not, Miss Imp? James came clattering down the stairs with a bundle under his arm. He tossed it up to the roof and climbed up beside the coach driver. Good, thought Prudence. The Duke was a welcome escort, but he was not very athletic looking, and charity was his priority. If James was with them, there would be a strong masculine arm for Grace and the twins as well. Her sisters peered out of the coach, looking a great deal less anxious now that the excitement of travel was upon them. The butler watched the whole thing with a dour expression. He tweaked Lord Caradice's sleeve and muttered something under his breath. Prudence raised her brows in inquiry. Lord Caradice explained, Niblet here is concerned that my cousin and I are kidnapping you and your sisters, not to mention half the staff. I hope you will reassure him. Of course nobody is being kidnapped, Niblet. Prudence assured him. We've been called away on an urgent family matter. I've left a letter for my great uncle in the drawing room. Please make certain he gets it on his return. I shall write again when we arrive at our destination. And where would that destination be, miss? inquired Niblet. Oh, it's all in the letter, she said vaguely. Even had she decided on a destination, she wouldn't tell Niblet. He was the sort of butler who loved gossip, and who would tell her grandfather everything at the drop of a guinea, or perhaps five. Oh, you can tell Niblet, my dear? Prudence tried frantically to catch his eye, but Lord Caradice seemed oblivious. My cousin and I have planned the journey in detail. We are going initially to my lodgings, for there is something I must drop off. Then we're off to my house, he added helpfully, to my house in Derbyshire and thence north to my cousin's Dinstable seat in the far reaches of Scotland. Prudence groaned. Oh, Niblet won't betray us, my girl? Lord Caradice assured her. Will you, Niblet? He slipped a folded banknote in the butler's direction. Niblet bowed in majestic, creaky assent and pocketed the banknote without a flicker of awareness. Prudence was aghast. I wish you had not done that, she said as he assisted her into the phaeton. Niblet is not to be trusted with any secret. The moment anyone offers him even the paltriest sum of money, he will tell all. I'm sure we can rely on Niblet to do exactly what we wish. Gideon took Prudence's hand in a firm, soothing grip. Trust me, 
Miss Imprudence. I am an excellent judge of character. Prudence looked unconvinced. Lord Caradice put on his driving gloves and picked up the ribbons of the Phaeton. He nodded at his cousin, who signalled back, and the large coach rumbled away over the cobblestones, everybody waving madly. Lord Caradice signalled his groom, who released the horses' heads and leaped up behind as the Phaeton moved off down Providence Court. Behind them, Niblet smirked as he closed the front door. Chapter 12 The very instant I saw you, did my heart fly to your service? William Shakespeare As the carriage wheels rattled over the cobbles, Prudence's hand stole to her breast, where Philip's betrothal ring hung hard and heavy against her heart. It ought to be Philip who was helping her now, not Lord Caradice. And it ought to be Philip who dominated her dreams at night and her thoughts by day, not Lord Caradice. Gaslights illuminated his profile in momentary flashes as the Phaeton twisted and turned through the maze of streets. She held herself rigid and apart from him, but could not prevent herself from bumping lightly against his shoulder and thigh each time the high-slung carriage swayed and rocked. She tried to ignore the unsettling sensations each moment of contact caused her, tried to keep her back ramrod straight, but it was difficult. What she really wanted was to cling to his arm and feel his strength supporting her. Once off the main thoroughfares, the streets were eerily quiet. Though they were by no means the only ones abroad at this hour, they were the only open carriage. She shivered, though the night was not at all chilly. She leaned back a little to get a clearer view of Lord Caradice's profile and observed him obliquely, disturbed by the tenor of her thoughts. Over the past few weeks, she'd done her level best to dismiss him from her mind and heart, telling herself sternly that he was frivolous and unreliable, and that she was foolish and faithless and wanton at heart, as Grandpapa said. She'd been warned by Lady Jersey and others that Lord Caradice had merely been entertaining himself with her until something better came up. Bored persons of the Tom did that, they'd explained. Take up a person for a time and make much of them, then drop them for no reason, cutting them dead the next time they met. It was the way of the sophisticated world. And yet tonight, she'd entrusted herself and her sister's safety to them without a moment's hesitation. A notorious rake and his supposedly misanthropic cousin. And now she was alone in the darkness with the rake, and far from fearing for her reputation, she took great comfort from his presence and his words of reassurance. Who could have known the frivolous rake would turn out to be such a source of strength and comfort? It had been hard enough to withstand his blandishments before. Now it was going to be even harder. Is it far? she asked. He glanced at her sideways. The jewel broker, you mean? No, not far. In fact, just around the corner. His graze slowed and turned into a narrow street where the buildings were crowded together. It was the sort of neighborhood where no gas lights burned. Were it not for Lord Caradice's carriage lights, the darkness would have been total, for none of the houses showed even a single light burning. Prudence clutched the battered box tight against her. I never imagined it would be possible to sell jewellery at this hour of the evening. Are you sure it can be done? He smiled and eased his horses to a walk in front of a tall, narrow building. I'm sure. I have done business with this fellow many a time. He will not mind being disturbed. Prudence nodded. The sharp edges of the box bit into her chest. It was foolish, she told herself firmly. She'd known for weeks, months, that she would need to sell her mother's jewellery, and yet now that the moment had arrived, she wanted to cling to it, to the last physical mementos of Mamma and Papa. Lord Caradice jumped nimbly down, secured his horses, and held up a hand to Prudence. She took a deep breath and laid hers in his outstretched hand, but to her surprise, he shook his head, kissed her hand lightly, and returned it to her lap. It will be better if I see Sitch alone, he said. Just hand me the box, and I'll see to it. You need not spare me, she began. No, it isn't that. Sitch is a canny devil. If he sees there's a lady involved at this hour of the evening, he will surmise that the situation is urgent and use the knowledge to drive the price down. However, if I strolled in, apparently on my way to a gaming hell, 
and needing to convert a few assets into cash, well, he is used to such scenarios from clients. Lord Caradice held out his hand for the box. Prudence bit her lip. She opened the lid for the last time, took out the pile of handkerchiefs and fiddled with a hidden catch. There is a false base, she explained. Despite the dark, she could almost see Lord Caradice's brows rise. It was necessary, she said defensively. Grandpapa searched our belongings. He took Mama's diamonds when I was eleven. Said Mama was wicked and evil, and her baubles an abomination of Jezebel. She glanced at him briefly, fiddling in the dark with a hidden catch. Only she wasn't. She was good and kind and beautiful. And he was the evil one. She took a deep breath and continued. I made a stocking purse and hid it under my skirts, with the rest of Mama's precious things in it. They belonged to my sisters and me, not him. But it was too difficult to carry them all the time. They are quite heavy, you know. So I got the stable boy to make a false bottom for this shabby old box. She darted him a faintly mischievous look. I kept it open, in full sight on my dressing table holding handkerchiefs, and Grandpapa never suspected a thing, though he was certain there must be more jewels hidden away. Mama's papa was wealthy, though not well born, and Mama took her jewels when she and Papa ran away. Aha! A runaway match. A love match, she corrected him. A very great love match. Mama's papa didn't want her marrying into the dissolute aristocracy, and Grandpapa didn't want his son to marry a sit, so they ran away to Italy. The catch finally shifted, and Prudence removed the false base of the box. She dipped her fingers into the small trove of family treasure. She knew each piece by heart. Here was the sapphire necklace and earrings. Such an intense, vivid blue, the exact colour of Mama's and Charity's eyes. She'd always imagined Charity wearing them for her wedding, as Mama had at hers. And here was the heavy smoothness of the pearl choker that Mama loved so much. She closed her eyes a moment, and remembered Papa fastening it around Mama's long and elegant neck, for the clasp was always stiff and difficult. It was always an event of laughter and teasing, but each time Papa would kiss Mama on the nape after he had fastened it, a slow lingering caress, and the laughter would fade, and an odd exciting tension would fill the room. Prudence had not understood it as a child, but now suddenly, years later, sitting in a phaeton in a dark London street, she realised what the tension was that had hummed so tangibly between her parents. Desire. She glanced at Lord Caradice, standing silently watching her as their eyes caught, a sudden silence hummed between them. The moment stretched. His hand reached toward her, and she wanted more than anything to take it. Even as her hand lifted to reach out to him, one of the greys snorted and stamped restively, and the carriage jerked. Prudence grabbed the side to steady herself, and Lord Caradice went to the horse's head to assist his groom. It were a rat, my lord, a big un, she heard Boyle say. Ran right under his hooves, it did. Prudence shivered. She watched Lord Caradice murmuring soothing sounds to his horse, calming it with his hands while his groom calmed the other one. The moment was gone. Prudence knew she needed to ensure it never returned. She took one last long look at the contents of the box, blinking away the tears that stung her eyelids. Prudence and her sisters were her mother's true legacy. What were cold jewels and metal compared with the happiness of Mama's daughters? And memories. Her memories were in her head, not this dear shabby old box. There is nothing you want to keep. Her fingers lingered on the locket. It was broken, though the catch could be mended, no doubt. It was quite large and made of gold, so it would fetch a neat sum, but to her, the most precious part of it was inside. She opened it. One last look at the faces painted inside, a silent renewal of her promise to Mama as she died that she would take care of her sisters. No, there is nothing she tried to say, but the words choked in her throat. She shook her head and, with shaking fingers, closed the locket and made to replace it in the box. They were not good likenesses anyway, she told herself. His hand stopped her, closed around her fingers, enclosing the locket. 
Keep it. His voice was oddly harsh. If you need to sell it later, you can. But for now, keep it. Her fingers tightened thankfully about the old gold trinket. She shut the lid of the box carefully and handed it to him. Make sure you get a good price, she whispered. Be damned to a good price, Gideon thought. Did she think he was the sort of man who would haggle over the price of a woman's bits and pieces? He almost snatched the box from her, so uncertain was his temper. It was unbearable to see her so vulnerable, yet so determined not to accept his help. He yanked on the doorbell, sending it jangling noisily in the nether reaches of the house. After a few moments, an upstairs window opened. Old Sitch peered out, a nightcap on his head. Who is it? He quavered. Caradice! Gideon barked. Grumbling under his breath, the old man disappeared, and a few minutes later, he unbolted the door. "'Tis an unusual hour for you to come calling on me, my lord. No trouble, I hope." Gideon thrust the box into the man's hand. "'Have these cleaned, reset, and restrung, whatever is needed to bring them up to scratch again.' "'Cleaned and reset?' Old Sitch stared at the collection of jewels, then scratched his head, bemused. You came at this hour to ask me to clean some jewels. And reset any that need it, yes, Gideon said brusquely. I'm leaving town this night, immediately, and need the job done by the time I return. You're never fleeing the country, my lord. Fleeing the country? Good God, no, Gideon stared, then realized he needed some sort of rational explanation. I, uh, was called away urgently but recalled I'd promised to get these fixed. No time to delay, you know. They'll be needed pretty urgently when I return. Very good, my lord. I have them sparkling and perfect again for the little lady. Sid shuffled to the door and opened it. There is no little lady, Gideon said meaningfully. Sitch peered out into the street. Prudence sat bolt upright in the phaeton, looking anxious, fretful, and to Gideon's eye, wholly adorable. Quite right, my lord. Trick of the light. I never saw no little lady. Good man. Gideon took his leave. Prudence looked so relieved to see him, it took all of his self-restraint not to snatch her into his arms and kiss the jitters out of her. Instead, he climbed aboard the Phaeton, concentrating on sang foie. Here you are, he said in a terse voice. I hope it is sufficient for your needs. He pulled a thick roll of notes from the pocket of his greatcoat and handed it to her. The thickness of the roll made Prudence's eyes widen. London prices must be much higher than elsewhere. You've done better than I expected. Thank you. He shrugged, a trifle embarrassed by her misplaced gratitude. Sitch has done business with me for years. I knew he would not let us down. Now, we best make speed to catch up with Edward and your sisters. He lifted the reins. Are you going to hold that man in your hand all the way, or do you have somewhere to put it? She started. Oh yes, of course. She carefully peeled off half a dozen notes and placed them in the Egyptian reticule. Gideon waited with interest to see what she would do with the rest. Turn your back, please, she said briskly, looking a little self-conscious. Gideon quizzed her with a look, then shrugged. Boyle, turn your back, he called to his groom. Then he also turned his back, or as much of it as the seat of the Phaeton would allow. There was not a lot of room for manoeuvring. A shame he was bred a gentleman. He was dying to know where she planned to hide the rest of the money. He felt her wriggling beside him. A sharp little elbow nudged him high on the shoulder. Sorry, she gasped. Stay where you are. I I'm not finished yet. From the angle of that elbow, her bodice was the fuller by several hundred pounds. He surmised. He chuckled to himself. He couldn't imagine how she thought her bosom would hide that much money. Her curves might be delightful, but they were not so full as to be able to disguise a thick wad of banknotes. Not yet, she hissed. He heard the slither of fabric and a surge of velvet cloak and muslin gown frothed across his lap. Gideon grinned. Unless he missed his guess, Miss Imprudence Meridew had just exposed her legs to a London street. A silent and empty street, to be sure, but a public thoroughfare just the same. He grinned. Calling your limbs, Miss Imp? 
he murmured. A gasp and a flurry of fabric being hastily tugged down was his reward. I asked you not to look. If you were a gentleman, rest easy, Miss Imp. I didn't cheat. Then how did... I turn my back as you asked, but I'm not deaf, and when this falls across my knees, he gestured to the folds of her dress and cloak, I put two and two together. Oh, she said. Well, it is true. I did pull my skirt up a little, but there is nobody here to see, and I keep my stocking purse under my petticoat for safety. Very sensible. Now may I turn around so we can resume our journey? She made a small sound, which he took for assent. So he turned back to face the front again. He whistled to his groom, and as the horses moved on, Gideon glanced at her and smiled. So how much is your bodice worth? I'm guessing... He glanced again. Fifty pounds? Prudence blinked, then clapped her hand to her bodice with a small shriek. You did watch, you... you rogue? She thumped him on the shoulder furiously, and he laughed, denying it. Not at all. You must equip me of everything except excellence in surmise. You bumped me with your elbow, and it was in such a position that I worked out the rest. She narrowed her eyes at him. Perhaps. But how could you possibly know there was fifty pounds in my bodice? He gave her a slow, knowing look, as if to say, Work it out, my dear. She blinked. He must have... To have noticed the change in the size of her bodice, he must have looked at her intimately. Prudence blushed. He was indeed no gentleman. Exactly. He seemed to have read her thoughts. Any change in your bodice, and I would notice. That's... that's... you are quite outrageous. I know. The tone was apologetic, but Prudence wasn't fooled for a minute. I told you before of the trouble I have with my eyes, he continued. The poor things are anxious, you see too anxious for their own good. She was silent for a minute, frowning, while she debated whether to maintain an aloof dignity or satisfy her curiosity. It was fully three blocks at a smart pace before curiosity won. What do you mean anxious? Your eyes don't look anxious to me at all. As far as I can see, they are bold and perfectly wicked. He edged the greys to a walk while they negotiated a jumble of handcarts and barrows, nearing a market. Ah, but that is their tragedy. All that bold wickedness is just a brave front, you see. Underneath, they are sadly anxious, particularly about your bodice. He paused a moment, then added, I mean, what if something should fall out? It's very worrying, I can tell you. She gasped. Casting him a darkling look, she drew her cloak together, and beneath its shelter folded her arms across her bosom. You are quite incorrigible. But Gideon could see the dimple lurking in the corner of her mouth, even as she glared down her masterful little nose at him. I should turn it off without a character, if I were you, he said in a conversational tone. It betrays you every time. There was a long pause as she turned the comment over in her mind turn what off without a character? What are you talking about? I don't think I could ever turn anyone off without a character reference. You really should, you know. It betrays you time and time again. She turned to him, puzzled, and not a little suspicious. What does? That dimple. She flounced her shoulder away from him and observed the road in silence for the next moment or two. See? There it goes again he said softly. Every time you try to be cross and schoolmistressy and put me in my place, out it pops, betraying you. The dimple disappeared for a moment, then returned as she struggled for propriety. I find it adorable, he murmured, and put an arm around her to steady her as they turned a corner at a smart trot. Muffled in the voluminous folds of her cloak, she was unable to fend him off as he could see she would prefer to do. I would hate you to fall off, he murmured, and tightened his hold. So undignified, not to mention dangerous. She made a half-hearted effort to wriggle away from him, then sighed, and allowed herself to be held firmly against his side. 
A stern look gave him to understand she would tolerate no further encroachment, but after a few moments of stiff resistance, the warm curves of her body relaxed into him, swaying with the movement of the carriage in perfect synchronization with his. Gideon smiled to himself. It was the closest he'd got to her in ages. They turned onto the turnpike road, and Gideon set the greys to a steady clip, driving one-handed, unable to bring himself to release her. She would be cross with him again when she discovered he hadn't sold a thing. But he was damned if he'd let her sell her precious bits and pieces, only for some nonsensical notion of propriety. He'd had every intention of selling them for her, hadn't thought twice about it initially. What were jewels, after all, but hard pieces of metal and glittering stone, a decorative form of business transaction? Men and women traded jewels all the time in his experience. A diamond necklace for favours granted, sapphire ear bobs for an apology, an emerald bracelet as a silent farewell. A woman had always spouted stuff about symbols of love, but he'd always thought it a lot of nonsense, a polite lie to disguise basic avarice. Until now. He recalled the soft look in her eyes as she'd gazed into the box, the tender wistfulness with which she'd handled each piece as if saying a silent farewell to it. The women he knew would have been most reluctant to give up the diamond and sapphire sets. They were clearly the most decorative and valuable pieces, yet the piece Prudence had handed over with most reluctance had been a scratched and worn old locket with two amateurish portraits inside. There had been tears in her eyes as she'd handed them over. He was sure of it, even in the dark. Something about the husky tone of her voice, and the way she wouldn't look at him directly. Tears, over a scratched old locket with two bad portraits. He hadn't been able to get a clear look at both pictures, but one of them was of a man's face. Her parents? Or was the man in the locket, Otterbury? If she hadn't been battling to hide her tears, he might have asked her about it. But now was not the moment. The lights of London soon dropped away behind them. They passed through several sleepy villages at a fast clip. The only light, that of the moon and the carriage lanterns. The sound of the horse's hooves rang in the night, disturbing a few dogs here and there, leaving them barking in the distance. To Prudence, it felt like they were the only people awake in the world. She had done little travelling as an adult, and found the pace of his lordship's phaeton a little alarming, to tell the truth, particularly on the turnpike road. It was very disconcerting to be driving pell-mell into the night, not knowing quite where they were headed, so she was very grateful for the occasional light of the moon when it came out from behind the clouds. The moon, recently risen, the heavy creamy globe shone from behind directly along the road they were travelling. Lord Caradice, we are driving away from the moon, Prudence exclaimed. So we are, she tugged at his sleeve. But the moon rises in the east. So it does, and very romantic it is too, don't you think? But Derbyshire is to the north. Correct again, Miss Meridew, Lord Caradice congratulated her. I can see you're a whiz at geography. Shall we play at geographical question and answer to while away the miles then? I do so enjoy discussing geography, don't you? He tucked her hand into the crook of his arm and continued in a chatty tone. Did you know that there is a place called Goatfell in Scotland, for instance? One can only surmise that a noble goat gave its life for... Prudence snatched her hand back and said in exasperation, But you told Niblet we were going to your seat in Derbyshire. So why are we travelling west instead of north? Because if we want any supper, we must hurry along. Are you hungry? I must say I am. Oh, for heaven's sake, what are you talking about? You mean you're not hungry? Yes, of course I am, but... Well then, we'd better make haste. It doesn't do to keep a lady hungry. He urged the horses to even greater speed, and Prudence was forced to grip his sleeve again, this time for security. It really was a frightful pace, but she managed to say in a firm enough voice, Lord Caradice, I insist you explain why we are travelling west. He turned his head and his smile glinted wickedly in the moonlight. My cousin has sent a man ahead to bespeak rooms and a late supper for us all at the Blue Pelican in Maidenhead. Granted, it is not very far out of London, but we cannot wish to travel through the night like the mail does. Prudence relaxed a little, relieved to hear that her sisters and the Duke were also apparently heading for Maidenhead, though the choice of destination seemed a bizarre one. 
Whether or not we travel through the night is immaterial to me, as long as my sisters are safe. But that is not the point. Why Maidenhead? It is nowhere near Derbyshire. Neither it is, agreed Lord Caradice, apparently much struck by the notion. But you told Niblet we were going to Derbyshire, and you paid him handsomely not to tell. I did say you could trust my judgment of his character, but no, you wouldn't heed me. He attempted to look downcast by her lack of faith in him, but a tiny curl of his lips gave him away. Prudence's jaw dropped. You mean you bribed Niblet not to tell, but told him a lie, knowing he could not be trusted anyway? Lord Caradice looked affronted. Of course I trusted him. Trusted him to pass on the information instantly. How did you know he would not honour the bribe? Lord Caradice tapped the side of his nose and looked wise. Prudence wasn't fooled. You have tried to bribe him before. You have a very suspicious mind, Miss Imp. Lord Caradice looked as if butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Prudence nodded, satisfied. I thought so. It is very wrong to bribe servants, you know. But in this case, you did the right thing. Let us hope Niblet will not suddenly turn over a new leaf. It would be most unfortunate if he decided not to tell. No chance of that, murmured Lord Caradice, adjusting the reins in his grip. I only gave him five guineas. Five guineas? Prudence exclaimed in horror. But that is far too much. She knew exactly how much five guineas would buy, and it seemed foolishly improvident to squander it on bribing a devious and untrustworthy butler. Nonsense. It is sufficient to make him realise the information was worth something, but believe me, Miss Imp, Niblet holds himself a great deal more expensive than five guineas. He will be insulted by the paltry nature of the sum, and will hasten to inform your grandfather of our supposed destination. And thus, if your grandfather pursues us, he will head directly for my seat in Derbyshire, and my people there will have received the message to send him on to Scotland. Alternatively, he may decide it is too far and give up. Prudence shivered. He will pursue us, she said in a low voice. There is no doubt of that. Lord Caradice frowned at her sober certainty and laid one hand over hers. He may pursue you, he assured her firmly but he shall not find you. She gave him a look of the bleakest misgiving. In my experience, Grandpapa does not give up easily, and he is very good at intimidating others. Your people might be too in awe of him to deceive him. I doubt that, he began, and then seeing that she could not be convinced of that, added, and if by some mischance he does find you, he shall not lay so much as a finger on you. That I promise you. You are safe with me, my imp, and so are your sisters. His voice was deep and sure and steady, and Prudence was comforted despite herself. She ought to have removed her hands from his grasp, but she could not bring herself to do so. It seemed as if strength and calmness flowed into her from him. She had an overwhelming impulse to lay her cheek against his shoulder, as if she could just for a while lay all her burdens on that broad, strong resting place, but she couldn't. It was just a momentary weakness on her part. He thought his assistance, his gallantry, and his wonderful generosity in helping her would make a difference, and it did, but only to her feelings. He thought it was only a matter of time before she broke her vow to Philip, but then Lord Caradice was used to ladies who thought nothing of breaking vows, even marriage vows. To prudence, such vows were sacred. And even if her feelings had changed, even if what she once felt for Philip was a pale shadow of what she feared she now felt for Lord Caradice, she could not betray Philip's years of loyalty. She and Philip were joined. Even if not in the eyes of society and the law, a ring had been given and accepted and promises made in the churchyard under the eyes of God. And the bond had been sealed by blood. If she was ever to come to Lord Caradice, and deep in her heart she acknowledged that she wanted to, she would come to him free and clear and wholeheartedly, not as an oath-breaker. Love was too precious to be tainted. She buried her hands in the folds of her cloak. She had managed on her own before. She would manage again. Even if Grandpapa did find them and use the law to get Prudence and her sisters once more under his control, she was determined to defy him. 
she would turn one and twenty soon. And if Charity and the Duke wed, and she hoped they would, perhaps the Duke would help her to force Grandpapa to sign over the money. Lord Caradice might try, but a Duke, especially if he were a relation by law, would have more power, if the Duke and Charity married. In the meantime, Prudence could protect her sisters, surely. Assuming Grandpapa was not so enraged, he beat her insensible again. She swallowed. She must not dwell on her fears. Fears sapped your strength. If she stayed strong, Grandpapa could not get the better of her. That other time, she had been ill, feeling lost and abandoned, and he'd caught her at her most vulnerable. She would not allow that again. Chapter 13 The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Thomas Gray They changed horses at Brentford, and the pace was not quite so fast or so smooth, the horses being not so well matched, nor as smooth gated as Lord Caradice's. A few miles farther on, the land opened up before them, an endless bleak expanse of silver and shadows, lying silent and cool under the moon. Hounslow Heath, said Lord Caradice, apparently responding to the tightening of her hand on his arm. She had found it easier to ride thus, holding on to his arm, purely for security, of course. The light carriage was very well sprung, but it did tend to bounce around a little on uneven patches of the road. It has an infamous reputation, has it not? She asked. Yes, for highway robbery. But you need not be anxious, Miss Imp. It has more or less ceased to be a problem these days. Since Bow Street formed their horse patrol, a great many offenders have been caught or driven to make a living in some other way. The rule of the gentleman of the High Toby is a thing of the past. Besides, dusk is the most dangerous time, and we are well past that. I am not unused to banditry, she said. 
In Italy, when I was a child, we encountered them many times. In some parts of the country, where poverty has been a fact of life for generations, banditry is a way of life for whole families. Indeed, whole villages. Indeed. He sounded surprised by her matter-of-fact tone. It sounds fascinating, if a trifle disconcerting. Did you like living in Italy? Bandits aside, of course. Oh, yes. It was wonderful. We were all so very happy there. She sighed. Each place we lived in seemed always to be full of sunshine, and flowers, and laughter, and singing. People sang all the time. Well, I don't suppose they did, but they seemed to. The servants. The workers in the fields often sang as they worked, and Mama and Papa loved music, and we children used to put on concerts for them every Wednesday night, in English and Italian. We learned lots of folk songs, and Mama used to sing the babies to sleep every night. She smiled, reminiscing. Do you remember so much about it, then? You were only a child when you lived there, were you not? Oh, yes, but we left when I was eleven, and I can remember so much. And, of course, I've told my younger sisters all about it, over and over, so that they can remember, too, she added. It's very important to remember happy times. It makes you stronger inside when things are... less happy. Of course, as children, we probably had the best of it. Italians are extremely indulgent toward children, you know. I expect we were terribly spoiled. He chuckled. I see no evidence of that. And I imagine you and your sisters made a charming little choir. Do you play, as well as sing? She paused a moment, watching the faint shadow of the clouds scudding over the moonlit heathland, then said lightly, No, we are all woefully ignorant in that area. Grandpapa does not approve of music, you see. He considers it sinful, except in church. And even then, she shrugged. The way we lived in Italy was very, very different to life in England. She shivered, remembering what it had been like to come from the warmth of Tuscany to cold and desolate Norfolk. Five bewildered little girls, newly orphaned, and left to the mercies of a bitter, hate-filled old man. Cold, Miss Imp? Without waiting for her response, he put an arm around her and drew the fur travelling rug more securely around her. No, I'm not cold, she said. But she allowed his arm to remain around her and even leaned a little against him. She knew she oughtn't, but there was something about the moor and the moonlight and the memories of her lost childhood that was making her melancholy. The warmth and strength of his arm and the feeling of his solid body against hers was very comforting. Besides, she was tired. She glanced at his moon-silvered profile. He didn't seem the slightest bit sleepy. He was probably accustomed to staying up late. She recalled the first time she'd met him. He'd been coming home at half-past nine in the morning and regarding it as the end of the evening. There was something about travelling in the night, with shadows and moonlight and the rhythmic clip-clop of the horse's hooves, which was very conducive to the exchange of intimacies. Tell me about your childhood, she said. What were your parents like? He stiffened immediately, so that the horses checked their pace. He flicked them back to their normal pace and glanced at her, a wry expression on his face. My early years were happy enough, he said after a moment. The usual sort of childhood, I imagine. Nurses, a nanny, and tutors and the like. Learning to read and write and ride and shoot. And then, when I turned eight, I was sent off to school. Prudence frowned. Servants and tutors, things to be learned, and then sent off to school at eight. It was not her idea of a happy childhood. Were you happy at school? He shrugged. Is anyone happy at school? It wasn't bad. Edward was there too, my cousin, you know. We are much the same age. That must have been nice for you both. A little less lonely, she said. And what about your mother and father? His profile seemed to harden. Not happy, he said after a while. They married the wrong people. Oh. She wanted to ask more, but there was such a forbidding expression on his face 
She didn't like to. He glanced down at her, and his arm tightened around her. You could say they worked it out in the end. There was a long pause. Prudence could feel the tension in him. She said nothing. I suppose you might as well hear the whole blasted story, he said at last, with your sister and Edward tying the knot, and... He broke off. The old gossip will no doubt be dredged up again, and someone is bound to fill your ears. You may as well hear the truth. He took a deep breath, and said in a light tone, quite as if it didn't matter to him. My mother eloped with Edward's father when we were fourteen. She must have made some small shocked sound, because he looked down at her. Yes, it was pretty frightful. Caused a huge scandal. They were sisters, you see. Edward's mother and mine, which made it worse somehow. Yes, whispered Prudence. A double betrayal of sister and husband. Exactly. The horse's hooves thudded rhythmically on. A light breeze had sprung up, not cold, but very fresh, chasing the clouds across the night sky. It must have been dreadful for you and Edward. He shrugged carelessly, but did not respond. Prudence was not deceived by his careless manner. He cared too much to speak of it seriously. How did your father cope? She ventured after a while. He flicked the reins and said in an offhand manner. He pursued them at first, but lost them on the continent. He was very fond of my mother, you see. You might say he loved her to distraction. His voice, under the light conversational tone, held a note of bitter savagery. They drove on for several miles. Prudence could feel the tension vibrating in his body. He had not finished his story. She laid her hand on his knee and leaned into his body, offering silent comfort. The cool breeze picked up. The hooves rang out on the roadway. Finally, Gideon spoke. He returned home a broken man. Became a recluse. Prudence bit her lip and gripped his knee harder. Gideon glanced down at her. He shot himself in the end. The reins were wrapped so tightly around his hands, they must be biting into his flesh. Yet he did not pull on the horses at all. Control. There were no words for such a story. She could only offer him the comfort of human warmth. She slipped her arms around him and hugged him, and he stiffened, and then slowly relaxed. After a moment, he said in a choked voice, he simply couldn't bear the loss. He loved her, you see. Truly loved her. And the loss of her drove him to the point of madness. Killed him. They drove on for several more miles. Prudence tucked against his chest, her arms around him in silent comfort, his arm holding her tightly against him. The heath stretched before them. A bleak prospect of wild and uncultivated land, dotted here and there with dense thickets of brush and stunted trees. It must have been terrible for you and your cousin too, and your aunt. Yes, well, she went into a decline for a while, and when she heard they'd both been killed on the continent, she... They were both killed. Your mother and the Duke's father. Hmm. Yes. He nodded. Drowned in a boating accident on Lake Geneva about six months after they ran off. That was when my father shot himself, actually, when he realized there was no hope of ever getting my mother back. He added, as if to himself, I'd always believed my father to be a strong man, but... I'm sure he was a strong man, Prudence assured him warmly. But he needed your mother. She stared up at his unmoving profile, a little anxiously. We all need love, you know. It isn't a weakness. It's the most wonderful source of strength. And if people fall apart for a little while when it is taken from them, well, that is understandable. You did not fall apart when your parents died. No, because I was just a child and I did not perfectly understand how much my life would change. 
and besides, I had my little sisters to look after. Grace was still a baby, so I had no time to brood. She broke off, as it occurred to her that Lord Caradice's father had had a son to look after. A son who would have been just as devastated as his father. A son who needed support and love. Prudence's sisters had needed support and love, and by loving them, she had been healed of her grief. His son's needs hadn't stopped Gideon's father from brooding, it seemed. Where had Gideon been when his father shot himself? He seemed to know what she was wondering about, because he said, It was alone in the house when he did it. A quick, clean shot, I'm told. After a moment, Lord Caradice continued, I was at school when they ran off, and father went after them. I never saw him, never said goodbye. Nobody told us anything until they received word of the drowning accident. But that's terrible. I suppose they chose not to distress us with what, after all, was mostly rumour at that point. It was a wasted effort, however. She felt the tension rising in his body again, and laid her cheek against his shoulder. He glanced down at her, and an indescribable expression passed over his face. The ton will always gossip, you see. It feeds on such stuff, and it trickles down to the children of the ton. Prudence bit her lip and watched his face. It seemed to harden as he said, Edward and I were treated to any number of lurid tales about our parents' elopement from the other boys, not to mention all sorts of other scandalous doings. He gave a bitter self-mocking laugh. Of course, we didn't believe a word of it. We were convinced both our parents were devoted couples. Edward believed his father the soul of honour, and my mother. Well, both our mothers were above rubies. You know what boys are. He shrugged ruefully. We had a great many fights, defending my mother's honour, until Edward's housemaster told us it was true. Mama had indeed run off with Uncle Frederick. Prudence was appalled. Poor little boys, to be left to fend for themselves in ignorance, and to be told such dreadful news in such a horrid fashion. And then I suppose you went home to your respective parents. He gave her an ironic look. No, for why would anyone want two unhappy boys underfoot at such a time? We stayed at school until Christmas. Prudence hugged him tighter. At such times you needed family around you, but she knew all too well that family could not always be relied upon. It was easy in the drama of the hour for the needs of the children to be overlooked. It must have been terrible for you both. More so for Edward than me. He loathed the notoriety, of course. The gossip and teasing absolutely flayed him. Boys at that age can be very cruel, you know. And he is a great deal more sensitive than I am. Prudence doubted that. Some people showed sensitivity, others put up a defensive shell and pretended not to care. He was a fool. He showed them how much their taunts upset him, you see. Lost his temper every time. You wouldn't know it to look at him, but quiet, gentle Edward can be a tiger when roused. Well, he was in those days. He fought every blasted one of them. Fatal, of course. And naturally I fought alongside him, even though I knew there was not a particle of use in it. He shook his head. I told him and told him he should ignore them. Try to laugh it off. Show a bunch of boys you care about something, and it is an open invitation to a kicking. Edward suffered. He really suffered. It got so that he wouldn't speak to anyone except me for months. Not that we ever discussed it. One doesn't, you see. And finally, finally, Christmas came. And you went home. He interrupted. Papa shot himself two days before I came home. Prudence made a small sound in the back of her throat. Two days before he came home. Two days before Christmas. He must have known his son was coming. Poor, poor little boy to come home to that. What did you do then? Did the Duke's mother? He shook his head. No. She went into a decline and didn't leave her bed for nearly a year. 
There was a long silence, broken only by the sound of the horse's hooves and the creaking of the phaeton as it bowled along the road. He shook his head and said in a light, shaking voice, When I left for school, Papa was away for the day. My mother and the servants saw me off. The next time I went home, Mama, Papa, and Uncle Frederick were all... were all dead, and the servants called me Master. He shrugged and added in a bracing tone, There was a great deal to be seen to, for the estate had been neglected while Papa had been chasing after Mama. His words touched her deeply. She could picture it so clearly, the young Gideon, 14 years old, arriving home confused, devastated, both his parents having been snatched from him under circumstances of which a young boy could have little understanding. His closest relative, his aunt, prostrate with helpless grief. His cousin withdrawn into a protective shell, and their world prattled of their tragedy as if it was the most delicious of gossip. The phaeton swayed around a corner, clouds scudded across the moon. The servants had called a grieving young boy master and looked to him for orders. No one had comforted him. No one had put their arms around him or let him weep or rage like a grieving young boy should. So a shattered, sensitive boy had become a careless, flippant, laughing man, determined to show the world he cared for nothing and therefore could not be hurt. Prudence understood now. She hugged him in silence, her face wet with tears. I didn't see Edward for months after the funeral. He never went back to school, never went to Oxford. Had himself educated privately, away from the malicious tongues and quiet whisperings. He more or less buried himself on his most remote estate, in the wilds of Scotland. In fact, for a while he became the hermit you accused me of being that first day. His voice lightened deliberately as he said, How long ago that day seems. Oh, look. See that milestone? We are but a mile from Cranford Bridge, and thus have come safely across the heath. It is a mere ten miles more to Maidenhead. But of course you would know that, with your talent in geography. He was trying to turn the subject, but she wanted to know more. Is the Duke's mother still alive? Oh yes, she survived. She even tried once to get Edward to come to London for the season, but it all came to naught. Well. Not quite. He laughed a short, dry laugh. While she was in London, turning the house into a fashionable Egyptian nightmare, she met a fellow, an American, rich as Croesus, and he married her and took her back home to Boston. Delighted to marry a duchess, you see, and she was delighted to leave the old scandal behind her and start afresh in a new country. So you and your cousin both ended up alone, Prudence said softly. They passed through the sleeping village of Longford, woke an ostler at Colnbrook, and paid him well for his pains as they changed horses. The night continued fair and cool, and though she was very tired from the long journey and late hour, Prudence's mind was spinning. In this short time she had gained such insight into him, and it had thrown her heart into turmoil. Salt Hill ahead, Gideon said softly. On the other side of it lies Maidenhead. They had fallen silent for the last few miles. Miss Prudence was tucked into his shoulder like a drowsy little owl. Unless he missed his guess, she was almost asleep. It had been a long and exhausting day for her, and she would be tired out from her anxieties as well. It would be a long, slow haul up the hill, even for the light phaeton. But in less than an hour they would be at the Blue Pelican, and the chambers and light refreshments Edward had bespoken. She straightened, yawned sleepily, and moved a little away from him. Have we passed Windsor Castle yet? I believe it is visible from the road. No, not yet. It's a little farther on. Poor King. I wonder how he is. From out of the darkness came the sudden thunder of hooves. What the? Two horsemen burst out upon the road ahead of them, and bore down on their vehicle as if it wasn't there. At the very last minute, one of the horsemen swerved and passed on a short distance, but the other seemed as if he wished to impale his horse on the shafts of the phaeton. He wrenched to a halt mere inches away. 
With the angle of the hill and his horses plunging in flight, it was all Gideon could do to keep them under control. Blast it, man! What do you think you're... Stand and deliver! The voice rang out with startling clarity. There was a moment's confusion as the horses continued to plunge and rear. The man in front of them wore a dark muffler wrapped around the lower part of his face. Moonlight glinted on the long barrel of a pistol, aimed straight and steady at the passenger, at Miss Prudence Meridew. Gideon's heart froze. Cursing under his breath, he fought to calm the horses. Behind him, he sensed his groom moving furtively. Easy, Boyle, he snapped. I can handle the nags. No need to get down. Right you are, sir, Boyle growled. Easy, I'm waiting. Gideon nodded. Boyle had got the message. Gideon was not talking about the horses. There were two guns under the seat at the back, kept for just such emergencies. And from Boyle's response, he had them in hand and was alert for the first opportunity to use them. In other circumstances, Gideon might relish the prospect of a fight, but the presence of Miss Prudence, sitting silent and still, and no doubt terrified on the seat beside him, gave him a frantic new sense of caution. There were two highwaymen, spaced well apart. One sat his horse right beside the phaeton, the other lurked several yards behind it, farther back off the road. With the robbers dispersed like that, his groom could probably account only for the one behind them. Gideon could jump the first man and risk it, of course, but with Prudence sitting motionless and silent, looking down the barrel of the long-nosed pistol, Gideon was not prepared to attempt anything that might endanger her. Silently, he cursed himself for not carrying his own pistols. He usually did when traveling. Miss Prudence's anxious need to flee had driven more rational thoughts from his mind, and he'd forgotten them. Damn it. Unforgivable carelessness. Gideon, brainless, besotted Gideon, had come unarmed and, by doing so, had endangered his love. What the devil do you think you're about? He growled at the highwayman. There's a village just ahead. If you shoot, you'll be heard. Aye, maybe, agreed the robber. But they be nicely tucked up in bed. And I have a good fast horse, so if you'll be so good as to hand over your valuables, we'll be on our way. The pistol jerked toward Gideon suddenly. Nice and easy, the fine gent. No sudden movements. You haven't forgotten my partner, have you? He's watching nice and quiet like. Nervous he is. Finger very light on the trigger, if you get my drift. Gideon put his hands where the highwayman could see them. One hand wrapped around the reins, the other resting protectively on Prudence's knee. The robber was no fool. Damn the fellow's eyes. He'd made sure Prudence was between himself and Gideon. If Gideon tried anything, Prudence would be caught in the crossfire. Gideon was nicely hamstrung. Come on, missy. Hand over the pretties now. She didn't make a sound. Gideon watched her out of the corner of his eye. She was sitting bolt upright, one hand clutching her reticule tightly to her, the other hidden in the folds of her cloak. He glanced at her face. She looked extremely pale, but that could be the moonlight. As he took in the expression on her face, Gideon's heart sank. She was going to refuse to hand over her money. He could see it in her eyes and the stubborn, angry set of her jaw. Don't argue with the fellow imp, he said quietly. Your safety is not worth the paltry sum you carry in your reticule. He spoke loud enough for the robber to hear. She glanced at him mutinously. Oh lord, he thought in frustration. Why risk herself for such a small sum when the majority of her money was in the stocking purse concealed beneath her skirts? He was going to have to somehow push her out of the way before he could tackle the robber. Perhaps if they appeared to wrangle over the reticule, it might distract the robber. He hoped Boyle would be able to deal with the one to the rear of them. Look, sis, I know it's your pin money and all you have left for the quarter, he said, affecting a peevish tone. But really, it isn't worth it. Now, give it over, do. He heard a cross little snort beside him. He turned to the robber and smiled ingratiatingly. My sister is a little frightened. He squeezed Prudence's knee meaningfully. Runs in the family, then, don't it, sir? The robber said mockingly. Now hand it over. I'm out of patience. Gideon drew his purse from his pocket and tossed it to the robber, 
It contained a few guineas only. The majority of his money was in a secret pocket in his greatcoat. And I'll take that little box thing on your lap, miss. Prudence glared at the robber, but handed over the Egyptian reticule without fuss. Gideon felt his breath release. Thank God. She was going to be sensible after all. Right. And now I'll have that gold chain round your pretty neck. Gideon felt Prudence stiffen. Her betrothal ring was on the end of that chain, he suddenly recalled. Oh, Lord. She was going to be difficult. If only the damn robber was on his side of the phaeton. Hurry up! The man behind growled. The man closest to her said, See? My friend's getting impatient, and when he's impatient, Missy, his finger gets tighter on the trigger. A hair trigger it is too, and liable to go off at the slightest touch. Now hand over that gold chain. I won't. It is my chain, and you shan't have it. Gideon groaned inwardly. She was going to get herself killed for the sake of Blasted Otterbury's blasted ring. He loosened his hold on the reins, looping them inconspicuously around the brake handle on his right. The robber gaped. What did you say? Can't you see there's a pistol pointing straight at your heart, girl? Now hand it over! She lifted her chin. No. It's not very valuable, and you wouldn't get much money for it, but it is personally very precious to me, so I shan't give it to you. She placed her hand protectively across her chest. The robber blinked and swore under his breath. Stubborn little piece, ain't you? Well, in that case, I'll just have to help myself. He urged his mount closer to the carriage and reached across to grab her. It was Gideon's chance. With one hand he shoved Prudence backward and scrambled across her to take a flying leap at the robber. Something slammed into his shoulder and he missed the robber and plummeted into the ground. Something banged against his skull. A flurry of shots rang out. People were shouting, the horses reared and stamped, and the carriage moved jerkily back and forth in response. Gideon, confused, and for some reason unable to stand, managed to roll aside to escape the wheels. But it was as if he'd rolled into the white-hot coals of fire. The pain in his shoulder was so sudden and intense. There was a lot of cursing, then a thunder of hooves, followed by relative silence. Steady those horses, he heard Prudence call. Now, or else your master will be crushed under the wheels, he heard Boyle respond, though the words were undistinguishable. There was a swish of fabric, and suddenly he was surrounded by softness. The acrid tang of gunpowder and the smell of gardenias. Prudence, gardenias. And a prudence angel gazing down at him, all blurry and golden and beautiful, with a halo of gold. He gazed, momentarily entranced. Put the lantern in front so I can see his wound, snapped the angel. The halo abruptly shifted and Gideon was forced to squint against the sudden glare as a lantern was placed beside his head. He is alive, she called, then murmured softly. I'm sorry, oh, I am so very sorry. I, I did not mean... She fumbled with the buttons of his waistcoat and then ripped open his shirt. Oh, good God, the blood! Blood? He opened his eyes a crack and gazed up into her lovely face. She was frowning blackly. It was hard to tell if she was blazingly angry or frantically anxious. He tried to smile and pat her hand in reassurance. She said, Do not move, I beseech you. Any movement will make it worse. He could not argue with that. Whatever it was, it hurt like the very devil. There was a series of ripping sounds, and then she pressed down on his shoulder, hard. It felt like someone had plunged a red-hot poker into his shoulder. Oh, sorry. I know it hurts, but truly I must do this to stop the bleeding. He had no idea what she was doing, but if she wanted to plunge a red-hot poker into him, he supposed he deserved it for forgetting his pistols. He concentrated on not making a sound. After what seemed like an eternity, the pressure eased slightly, though the poker was burning hotter than ever. She lifted a blood-soaked pad and peered at his shoulder. The face of his groom intruded into his view as well. Gideon tried to say something, but for some reason his tongue wasn't working. Looks like a flesh wound, Boyle said. Oh, that's good, isn't it? I mean, not good, for of course any wound is frightful, but it means no bone has been damaged. Aye, 
Bones is one thing, said Boyle, but he could bleed to death yet from that little hole. There was a small feminine gasp, and Gideon felt the grip on him tighten convulsively. His senses ebbed and flowed. Vaguely, he heard Boyle say, Sorry, miss. Didn't mean to alarm you, but I was a soldier, see. We'll have to get him up into the Phaeton, get him to a surgeon fast as possible. But first, we'll see what we can do to stop that bleeding. Now, if we can just bind that pad back in place. Gideon felt a sharp wave of pain. As if from a distance, he heard, That's it, miss. Good and tight, so it'll staunch the bleeding. Above him, Prudence's face wavered for a moment as the flaming poker was plunged into his shoulder anew. When he opened his eyes again, he heard Boyle say, I've secured the horses so they can't move, so if you'll move, miss, I'll see if I can pick him up. Pick him up? As if he was a helpless child? Gideon tried to instruct Boyle to do no such thing, and to announce that he would mount the carriage himself, thank you very much. But even as his thick and muzzy tongue tried unsuccessfully to form the words, he felt Boyle's arm slide under him. There was a jolt, and everything went black. Prudence peered worriedly at Lord Caradice. He was still extremely pale, though not as pale as when Boyle and several sleepy ostlers had carried him into the blue pelican at Maidenhead the previous night, and had laid him out on the settle in the parlour. He'd been as pale as death then. She would never forget that dreadful drive, the groom whipping the weary horses over Salt Hill, and stopping to waken the inhabitants of the first house they came to, and asking for the direction of the nearest surgeon only to be told the closest one was at Maidenhead, another five miles farther on. So on they journeyed, at as fast a pace as the horses could manage, Boyle swearing, the whip cracking, the carriage swaying and bounding, and Lord Caradice lying warm and heavy in Prudence's arms, bleeding to death for all she knew, with darkness all around. Prudence had clutched his prone body to her, hugging him tightly against her heart, he lay sprawled across her body, insensible, his head cradled in the hollow between her chin and her breast. With one arm she'd held his body securely against her, with her other she pressed as firmly and steadily as she could on the pad that covered his wound, the wound that welled warm sticky blood over her fingers the whole time. She felt so miserable, so frightened, so guilty. If he died, but he had not died. Now he lay in bed, his eyelashes dark crescents against the pallor of his skin. He lay propped up against his pillows, a bandage around his head and shoulder, and a loose brocade dressing gown draped around him for warmth. Apart from the dressing gown, he was naked from the waist up. The surgeon had advised against trying to clothe him until his gunshot wound was a little better. It was a flesh wound, which was a blessing, she'd been told. But even with the smallest of wounds, there was always a danger of infection and fever, said the surgeon. They were to watch for fever especially. The head injury was another matter. Until he awoke, no further diagnosis could be made. Prudence lightly touched the skin of his chest. It felt warm. Not hot. Dry. Not clammy. That was good, was it not? She pressed her whole palm to his skin. It felt good too good. She had never touched a man's naked chest, never even seen one, not Philip's, even with the intimacy they'd shared, and not any other man's. At Derham, even the farm labourers worked fully clothed at all times, no matter how hot the weather. Her fingers stroked through the hair that was sprinkled lightly across his chest. Starting in a wedge, the darkness seemed to arrow down, down below the sheet tucked so firmly around his midriff. It was fascinating to be so close to him. She ought not to be so fascinated. She was supposed to be checking for fever only, but she couldn't seem to help herself. His eyes opened. Prudence leaned forward and laid a hand on his arm. Oh, Kit, Lord Caradice, thank heavens, I've been so worried. How are you feeling? Lord Caradice smiled faintly. She'd almost called him Gideon. All the better for seeing you. My prudence. She frowned anxiously. Yes, but how do you feel? You look frightfully pale. Gideon reached out and patted her hand. I feel perfectly well, my dear. 
he lied. Her fingers clutched his convulsively, and he felt a great deal better. She gazed at him, her expressive little countenance reflecting a series of emotions, relief, distress, guilt, anxiety. That worried pucker was back between her brows, blasted, deeper than ever. Damn that robber! I'm sore, he began. I'm so very sorry about what happened, she blurted distressfully. I truly never meant you to be injured like that. He squeezed her hand, wishing he had more strength to gather her against him and smooth out her worries with his other hand. Do not wrinkle your lovely brow over my injuries, my prudence. I'm as right as rain. I'm impervious to highwaymen. It's only beauteous redheads I have a weakness for. She seemed to flinch at that and avoided his gaze. Gideon frowned, but before he could ask her what troubled her, she said, I know. Oh, I know. I, I am so very sorry. Indeed, I could not regret it more deeply. I assure you, I would give anything for it not to have happened. Gideon smiled at her passionate tone. The extreme degree of guilt she was exhibiting, the very heartfelt nature of her distress, it could signify only one thing. His gallant defense of her had broken through the barrier of her propriety. His act had forced Miss Prudence to acknowledge there was more between them than simple dalliance, and now she felt guilty for so misjudging him. If that was the case, it was worth getting shot for. He caressed her fingers gently. So finally you admit to it, do you? He said softly. About time, Miss Imp. She snatched her hand back. Of course I admit it. I have confessed freely to the fault. But you cannot deny you are at least a tiny bit responsible for what happened. Why did you have to jump across me like that at that moment? Jump across her? He frowned until he realized she was back to talking about the highwayman. He gave her a very masculine look and explained. You were in between that blackguard and me. I had to get across you to get to him. It's not your fault. No, but if you had warned me at least, signaled your intention in some subtle fashion, I would never have... The role of protector suited him, Gideon decided. He rather enjoyed her feminine flutterings after the event, her concern for his well-being. My dear girl, how would warning you have changed the situation? His tone was pure indulgence. If I had known you were going to leap across me like that, she said with a thread of acid, I would no doubt have taken more care not to shoot you. It took a moment for her words to sink in. Taken more care not to shoot me? His brows snapped together. What the devil do you mean? That blasted robber shot me. You had nothing to do with it. She shook her head. No. I shot you. I was aiming at the highway. You shot me? Lord Caradice's face was a study of amusement and disbelief. You shot me. Prudence bit her lip. Yes, my lord. With what? If that scoundrel Boyle passed you a pistol. No, I used my mother's pistol. Your mother's... P yes, it was hidden under my cloak. It's quite small and handy, see? She bent down and took a small silver pistol from a basket beside the bed and showed it to him. His hand reached for it then hesitated. It's all right, she assured him. It's not loaded anymore, and I've cleaned it. He looked at her from under his brows. Thank you. I have handled a pistol before. He picked up the pistol, examining it carefully. Mamma and Papa always carried pistols when we travelled in Italy, even for quite short trips. I told you, we'd encountered banditti in Italy several times when I was a child. Don't you remember? He waved a vague hand, signifying something. So naturally I packed it. Oh, naturally, your mamma's pistol. He put the pistol down, leaned back against the pillows, and covered his face with his hands. Go on. His voice was muffled. Prudence looked at him doubtfully. He suddenly seemed weaker, and his chest was heaving in quick bursts. Yes, I had it in my reticule, of course, but... A muffled sound came from Lord Caradice. Are you feeling unwell again, sir? Prudence bent forward. He shook his head and mumbled from behind his hands. 
No, no. Continue, if you please. She frowned, but sat back and folded her hands. Very well. I took the pistol out of my reticule when the robber first rode up, and had it hidden under my cloak. I am extremely sorry. I did not mean to shoot you, of course. Oh, well, as long as you did not mean to. His shoulders heaved. You're laughing, Prudence accused. He moved his arm to reveal a face that was indeed alive with laughter. Who, me? How could I possibly laugh at such a situation? Shot by the woman I was trying to defend, by gad. And I imagined myself such a gallant devil, wounded while protecting one of the weaker sex. His dark eyes danced with mischief. And all the time, the weaker sex had winged me. She frowned at him, and he instantly added in a pathetic voice, I am a wounded man. You've mistaken laughter for pain, extreme pain. I need someone to soothe me. My pulse is tumultuous with pain. See? Lay your head here, Miss Prudence, and you will hear how my heart is pounding. With one hand he patted his chest, while the other feebly beckoned her closer. She looked at him mistrustfully, guilt warring with annoyance and anxiety. He was funning, but he was wounded. She had never seen anyone bleed so much. For all his nonsense, he might be in more pain than she believed. He was the kind of man who joked to hide his deeper feelings, after all. Should she check his pulse? When she didn't move, he sighed deeply. I see you don't care if I expire. You did mean to shoot me after all. Of course I didn't mean to, she assured him indignantly. I was aiming at the highwayman, meaning to wound him in his shooting arm, only for most of the time his horse's head was in the way, so I could not get a clear shot at him. That's why I got him to come closer. Got him to come? He sank back against the pillows and stared at her in silence for a moment. You mean that little piece of insanity was a deliberate ploy to get an armed highwayman to come closer to you? Prudence avoided his accusing stare. Well, not exactly a deliberate ploy. I did have no intention of giving him what was on my chain. That blasted ring! She flushed. No, not the ring. But I do admit it was convenient for him to move. Convenient? Yes. And it would have worked, except you leaped in front of me, banging my arm just as I was shooting, and so... So the wrong man got shot. The wrong man. Gideon sank into the pillows and put a feeble hand to his forehead. What a relief. And here I was wondering if you'd come to my bedchamber to finish me off. She gave him a schoolmistressy look. I may very well change my mind and do just that. He looked at her soulfully. You're a hard woman, Miss Prudence. So, are you responsible for the lump on my head as well? Since he clearly didn't recall the whole of what had occurred, Prudence's conscience forced her to finish telling him the tale, no matter how mortifying it was. No, of course not. When I, uh... Shot me? He prompted helpfully. She gave him a look of reproof, threaded with guilt. I know. There is no need to keep repeating yourself. She smoothed a wrinkle in the bed covers and continued, not meeting his eye. Well, after that, you plummeted off the carriage, startling the highwayman's horse. Remiss of me? She gave him a single piercing look, and he sat back, satisfied. It reared in fright, and we are not sure whether that is how you hit your head, or whether one of your own horses kicked you a few moments later for... Oh, undoubtedly my own nags. Everyone joining in the fun, it seems. Nonsense. We were all very upset. Even the horses? Particularly the horses. It must be excessively upsetting to have somebody rolling around beneath your hooves while guns are being fired. The amusement dropped from his face. His hand shot out and grabbed her by the wrist. Guns, you say? More than one? Did that blasted swine shoot back at you? His gaze ran over her intently, anxiously and Prudence felt herself flushing at his warm concern. She was unused to protectiveness in a man, and found it unutterably appealing. She shook her head. No, I am perfectly well. The shots were from your man, Boyle, who, in the confusion, managed to fire at the highwayman and his partner. They took fright and galloped away. In fact, our robber, 
she added confidingly, caught such a fright when I fired that he dropped my reticule, and Boyle retrieved it for me. So that was lucky, wasn't it? He gave her a look, and said in a dry voice, Oh, extremely lucky, and closed his eyes. There was a short silence, and she wondered what he was thinking. He opened his eyes and fixed her with a suddenly intent look. What did you mean, not the ring? Prudence pretended not to understand. She gave him a blank look and smoothed his sheet busily. Are you thirsty? Do you need anything? Stop avoiding the question. I thought you'd chosen to risk your life rather than hand over Ottershank's blasted betrothal ring. But when I said so just now, you said, no, not the ring. Prudence shrugged in embarrassment. I'd already given the robber the ring. I'd taken it off earlier. It was in my reticule. He gaped at her, and she added defensively. I couldn't risk anyone's lives for a ring, even if it is valuable and an Otterbury family heirloom, so I handed it over. Philip would understand. Lord Caradice sat up, but before he could ask the question that sprang to his lips, she added accusingly, And as for risking your life, well, I didn't think you'd be in any danger, because I was between you and the man's pistol except that you took it into your head to jump in front of me, that is. And if anyone is to be castigated for taking insane risks... Oh, dash it all, Imp. It's my job to protect you. Of course I jumped the blasted villain. As soon as he mentioned that blasted ring, I knew you'd... Chain. She corrected him. He only mentioned the chain. And I didn't expect you to protect me. I can protect myself, thank you. I've been doing it for years. Gideon flung her an exasperated look. What the devil was he to do with such a woman? Protect herself indeed? It galled him unbearably to reflect that she had remembered to provide herself with the means of protection when he had neglected to do so. He attempted to harness his temper and said in a clear, reasoned tone, At the time I believed the chain was attached to the blasted ring, and I knew, at least I imagined, you wouldn't hand that over. A thought occurred to him, and while we're explaining things, would you mind telling me why you would happily hand over a ring you told me you made a sacred promise on? You told me you hadn't taken it off for four years, so I would have thought that of all things. Yes, I know. She jumped in hastily. And I wasn't happy about it, not at all, but after all, it is the promise that is sacred, not the ring. The ring is a token and a symbol, but it represents something that cannot be stolen. My promise to marry Philip. That doesn't explain why you took it off. There was some significance in it. He was sure. There had to be. To his fascination, she blushed and began to busy herself smoothing his bedclothes, fussing around him like a small anxious hen, but hovering at the end of his bed, well out of his reach. I took the ring off the chain when we were back in London, when you were inside that house, and she'd given the highwayman Otterbury's ring. So you risked your life for a simple gold chain. He watched as she tucked the sheet tight around his feet, as if her life depended on it, head down to hide her blush. In truth, I hadn't intended using the pistol, unless it looked like he was going to shoot one or all of us, but when he noticed the chain and demanded I hand it over, can you adjust these covers? They feel dashed tangled. Absent-mindedly, she moved to the head of the bed and started straightening his bedclothes, as she explained. I simply couldn't hand it over, just as I knew I couldn't sell it. I mean, it's not as if he would value it, because it isn't very valuable to anyone except me, and my sisters, of course. To us, it's priceless. Ah, that's better, murmured Gideon. Oh, there's a devilishly uncomfortable wrinkle under here that's most... She bent to tug at the undersheet. And so I did risk it. And while I did not intend it, you were hurt. And for that, I most sincerely apologize. Oh, that's all right, Miss Imp. I survived. Maybe if I move like this, and you bend down, you could get it. She bent over him obediently, striving to remove the non-existent wrinkle. Her hands brushed underneath his legs. He could smell the scent of her hair, the faint gardenia fragrance of her soap. Show me what is on the chain, he murmured in her ear. She hesitated, then reached inside her bodice and drew out an old-fashioned locket attached to the gold chain. 
Gideon nodded and wrapped his arm around her waist, drawing her closer as he peered at the locket. Of course, the locket. He'd seen her face when she'd placed it with the other jewels for sale. Remember the loving way she'd cupped it in her hands, her yearning reluctance to lose it. It had cut at him, even though he knew she would lose nothing. Prudence moved to pull the chain over her head, but he stopped her with his hands. No, don't take it off. I can see it well enough from here. He pulled her closer against him, so she was half sitting, half lying on the bed beside him, his arm around her. He fumbled awkwardly with the locket. The catch is faulty, she said. I've been meaning to have it mended. Her fingers brushed against his as she opened it for him. There was a short silence as they both gazed into the locket. Gideon could feel the softness of her body relaxed against him. Her scent was intoxicating. He could feel her warm breath on his skin. His own breathing was becoming increasingly ragged. He forced himself to focus on the two slightly lopsided images in the locket. They meant so much to her. A man and a woman with old-fashioned hairstyles. The painting was clumsy. He wondered who they were. He wondered whether she'd painted the miniatures herself. He wondered whether he'd ever be able to let go of her. It is Mama and Papa. The only pictures of them we have. Her thumb ran caressingly around the gold rim of the locket. The likenesses are not perfect. They were painted by a young Italian boy who lived in the village and hoped to become a painter. Papa was to be his patron. Her voice caught and wavered on a sob. Gideon could not bear it. She bit her lip and said, I know I should not have taken such a foolish risk, but the thought of never... Hush, Gideon said gently, as he tipped her face up to receive his kiss. Chapter 14 A woman would run through fire and water for such a kind heart. William Shakespeare she did not pull away. He gave her no time to think, but covered her mouth with his, gently, possessively, tenderly, so as not to startle her into flight. She hesitated a moment, then he felt her body relax against him, and she leaned into his embrace. A sharp pain shot through his shoulder, but he ignored it, and his arms tightened around her. He felt her lips soften under his, as she began to return his kiss softly, uncertainly, surprise blooming into desire. She kissed him gently, carefully, as if he was on his deathbed, not simply suffering a minor flesh wound. He would suffer a dozen such wounds for another of these tender, heartfelt kisses. She tasted of warmth, of tears, and just a faint hint of tooth powder. Lord, but she was sweet. He could not get enough of her. Slowly he took the kiss deeper and deeper, the warmth and generosity of her shy response overwhelming him. He had been anticipating this moment since the last time he'd kissed her, but still it took him unawares. The heady rush, the surge of... of feeling, hauntingly familiar and yet piercingly, achingly new. How many women had he kissed? He did not know. He did not care. None of them had been prudence. She put her hands up to hold his face as she kissed him back, and at the feeling of those two small, cool hands cupping his cheeks so earnestly as she pressed warm, damp kisses against his mouth, he felt something inside him dissolve. He wanted a shout from the rooftops. He wanted to hoard her like a secret. Had any woman ever left him feeling so... so simultaneously powerful, and yet so... so helpless? He did not know could not think. All he could do was to kiss her, to hold her, and fight the need to possess her, for though they were alone and on a bed, this was not the moment. He knew it. His much vaunted seduction techniques, where were they? He could not think straight enough to recall a single move. This was pure instinct, pure aching emotion. Her fingers tangled in his hair, and he felt a fresh surge of tenderness as he coaxed her lips apart and deepened the kiss. Part of him felt like a boy, trembling on the brink of life, and yet another part of him looked on, immensely old. 
When had he ever been content to merely kiss and hold? When had a kiss not been the first step in a well-rehearsed dance of seduction and pleasure? His body knew the moves, craved them, even if his mind was as scrambled as his morning eggs. So where had these scruples come from? He could seduce her in an instant, he could feel it, and he needed more than anything in his life to possess her, to make her his flesh of one flesh. And yet, and yet, each careful moist kiss was precious to him. Each touch of her hand, along his jaw, in his hair, around his neck. The soft, eager press of her body against his, innocent, ignorant of the effect on him, and therein lay the problem. He would rather have a dozen heartfelt, hesitant kisses from her than one night of passion and a morning, possibly a lifetime of regret. Miss Prudence must come to him with a whole heart and in her own time. There could be no regrets afterward. That was the difference, he suddenly realized. He was going to spend a lifetime with this woman, and he wasn't going to rush his fences and jeopardize a moment of it. He would harness his urges and savor every instant, every small caress, each loving, untutored kiss. And so he allowed the embrace to end. He watched her slowly come to her senses, watched the dazed, wide grey eyes focus and awareness slowly flood her. Oh! she exclaimed. Oh dear! She pulled herself suddenly out of his arms, jumped up and began straightening the bedclothes, darting swift, embarrassed glances at him and looking away. Finally she stopped, took a deep breath and looked him in the eye. We... I shouldn't have done that, she said at last. Should we not? Gideon could not help but smiled at her flustered expression. Why not? She sighed. You know why not. I am not free. Gideon shrugged. A few kisses. You make too much of them, he said lightly. You were sad. I merely comforted you. She thought about it for a moment, and her brow crinkled uncertainly. Was that truly the reason? What else? The casual tone of his words were belied by the look in his eyes. Or was that just her own confusion, Prudence wondered? Her own wishful thinking? She was still trembling deep inside from those few moments of what he called comfort. If that was comfort, then she understood nothing. Although you might want to check again. I'm certain I must be feverish. He took her hand and laid it to his forehead. A tender smile belied the dark promise in his eyes. He turned her palm inward and pressed it gently to his face. The hollow of her palm cupped his cheekbone. Her fingers brushed his smooth brow. It was perfectly cool and not the slightest bit clammy or feverish. Prudence didn't move. Her chest felt suddenly tight. The tips of her fingers just touched the thick, dark, springy hair. She itched to run her fingers through it again, but she couldn't bring herself to move. His hand lay over hers, warm, strong, and possessive. Slowly he brushed her hand down over his cheekbones into the hollow of his cheek, warm, male, and unshaven. Prudence wondered vaguely how a failure to shave could be so wonderfully exciting, but it was, making him seem darker, more dangerous, and excitingly masculine. She shivered as he caressed her hand slowly and sensuously with his face, rubbing against her like a big lazy cat, his eyes never leaving hers, mesmerizing, enchanting, as skin to skin the embrace moved along the strong line of his jaw until it reached his lips. He paused for what felt like an eon, and she waited as if on a precipice, feeling his firm, warm mouth beneath her trembling fingers. Then slowly, he turned her hand until her palm cupped his mouth. He pressed one kiss into the hollow of her hand, and it was as if her insides turned to melted butter. He pressed another, and her knees began to buckle. That was what saved her. As her legs trembled and threatened to give way beneath her, she snatched her hand away, for balance, for security, for safety. 
At least that was what she told herself afterward. She sagged against the end of the bed, clutching at the rails at its foot, and fought for composure. She tried to make herself angry, but she couldn't. She tried to convince herself he had taken unfair advantage of her, but she didn't believe it. The truth was, she wanted to fling herself back into his arms, and have him kiss her on the mouth again, instead of the hand. And later, maybe she could kiss him on the palm, and see if he felt it clear through to the tips of his toes, the way she had. But she couldn't. She might wish to be free to love Lord Caradice, but she wasn't. She'd given Philip a sacred promise. They'd exchanged rings and... and they'd plighted their troth. Promises were not to be given lightly. She gave few promises, and when she did, she honoured them. She'd been able to control few things in her life. She had no choice where she lived, with whom, what she wore, who she saw, what she ate, or how she and her sisters were treated. The only thing she truly owned, or controlled, was her honour. In any case, her sacred vow did not only involve herself and Philip. Old and bitter grief began to well inside her. With shaking hands, she fussily began to straighten the items on his bedside table. Some things were too painful to dwell upon. What is it? Lord Caradice frowned as he watched her sudden nervous activity. Aware of his eyes steadfastly observing her, she snatched a pillow from under his head and plumped it violently, the pillow hiding her face from him. Ouch! Take care! That's the head the horse kicked, remember? Now tell me, what has disturbed you? Nothing, she muttered and briskly plumped the next pillow. Activity was better than emotion. When you were busy, you had no time to think. Doesn't look like nothing to me, he persisted. Your eyes are like smoky pools of crystal. Every feeling and emotion is reflected in them. Prudence stopped in mid-pillow fluff. Smoky pools of crystal. Nobody had ever said anything half so beautiful to her before. She'd always considered her grey eyes dull and colourless, but smoky pools of crystal. She averted her gaze abruptly, recalling that they also apparently reflected her thoughts, and if they revealed thoughts, they might also reveal secrets. He reached out and possessed her hand. Tell me. It occurred to Prudence for a fleeting moment that she ought to tell him. Though she did not know if she could bear the way he would look at her afterward, she might as well tell him and get it over with, because she didn't think she could withstand his tender assault on her virtue much longer. But as she gazed into his dark, concerned eyes, the coward in her put the moment off a little longer. It's not fair of you to undermine my principles, to disregard what I have told you about my betrothal. Haven't you heard, Imp? All's fair in love. She cut him off. But you have all the advantage here. He touched his bandage and regarded her soulfully. I do? Yes, and stop looking at me like that. You know perfectly well what I mean. Philip can't compete with you. He is far away across the sea and you are here. He did not conceal his satisfaction at that. So she added crushingly, always underfoot. He was little more than a boy when I saw him last, whereas you are a man of practiced charm, very practiced. He grimaced. You need not pull that face. You know it's true, whether you like the fact or not, and pretty compliments drip easily from your tongue. He ostentatiously wiped his mouth. Well, poor Philip writes staid and matter-of-fact letters. But not all men can be poets. It would be shallow of me indeed if I abandoned him, because he does not make my head whirl with pretty compliments. And you... She broke off, seeing by the look in his eyes that she'd said too much. Whatever, it does not matter. I am not so shallow nor so dishonourable as to jilt Philip in his absence. So we shall drop the subject henceforth, if you please. Apparently he didn't please. If he doesn't make your head whirl, and I'm not referring to compliments, he is not the man for you, Imp. Duty and honour is a dash-dry foundation for a marriage. Oh, I know many make it, but you deserve more, my prudence. You need, and deserve, to be most thoroughly and completely loved by a man who makes your head whirl. 
His words and the look in his eyes as he said them robbed her momentarily of breath. Prudence avoided his gaze. She felt shaky. Blast the man. Just as she had bolstered her resolution to resist him, he must go and say something else that made her yearn for her life to be different. To have been different. I have to go, she said. I shall order a luncheon to be brought to you. A slight frown wrinkled his brow. Something else is disturbing you, and I intend to discover what it is. I don't like to see those shadows in your lovely eyes. My prudence. I am not your prudence, she retorted, taking refuge in propriety. He did not argue, just smiled at her in a deeply masculine way that annoyed her, even as her insides melted. I'm not, she argued, flustered. He arched an eyebrow at her. I don't understand why you persist with this nonsense. I thought we'd agreed to drop the subject. He sent her a sizzling look. You agreed. I didn't. It is not for discussion. I can do nothing until I see or hear from Philip. I'm sorry, but that's how it is. Besides, there are things between him and me that... She broke off. Well, never mind that. I shan't mind if you don't, he agreed. But I'll not let you go, Prudence. I'll not pest you, but know this. I will wait until you choose to listen to your heart. For sure. It was a feeble effort. She took a deep breath and tried again. Humbug. How can you presume to know my heart? He smiled a slow, devastating smile. You are my heart. He lifted her hand and kissed it, and our hearts beat in tune. I know it. I, who used to not believe in such things, and you know it. She shook her head, but was too shaken by his words to say anything. Our hearts beat in tune. I know it. I, who used not to believe in such things. Did that mean what she thought it meant? That he, a notorious rake, now believed in love? even after what he told her of his parents, because of her. Oh, dear Lord, what a mess she was in. Promised to one man, and bound by honour and duty to keep that promise, and yet, and yet, oh, unruly heart. Even if he wasn't being rakish, even if he meant what he said, that he could perhaps have feelings for her, he didn't know her whole situation. He would think differently about her if he did. She tried to comfort herself with the reflection. Cold comfort. She had learned enough about the world that in some matters, at least, Grandpapa and society were as one. Don't fret yourself, my dear, he said. I know you hold your promise to Otterbottom sacred, and I cherish you the more for it. Kept promises have not figured largely in my life till now, so I value one when I see it but I shall wait for you. Prudence just looked at him. I cherish you the more for it. Or why must he use such words? He would not cherish her if he knew. She would have to tell him. It was the only way. Only then would he stop this relentless tender wooing that was tearing her apart. She swallowed and took a deep breath, then closed her eyes. No, she could not do it. Not now, not yet. She could not bear to tend him in his sickbed while he stared at her in disappointment, or condemnation, or worse. She would not even think the words her grandfather used so freely on her, but it would flay her alive to have Gideon say them, or even think them. She would have only a little more time with him. It was cowardly of her, she knew, but she would not tell him the truth until he was well again and she could flee his condemnation in good conscience. She gave his bedclothes one last vague, distracted swipe and turned to leave. His hand shot out and caught her wrist. Trust me, imp. His voice was deep and dark and soft with sincerity. Her heart seemed to seize in her chest like a hard, cold ball. She froze, closing her eyes. He was right. It was time. She could put the moment off no longer, and if he, after he knew the story, if he, well, her sisters could tend him, they'd be glad to, she knew. 
Very well. Since you insist, the whole story. She fetched a hard wooden chair from the corner of the room and sat a few feet from the edge of his bed. She didn't think she could do it if he was too close and able to reach out and touch her. Folding her hands in her lap, she looked at him for one last moment, drinking in the last moments of his warm, unshadowed gaze. After this, there would be a different kind of knowledge in his eyes, and she didn't think she would care to look into his dark, dark eyes again and see it there, not with the memory of tenderness and laughter. She took another deep breath, then with trembling lips, began to burn her bridges. I never thought any of us would marry. Grandpapa said our blood was inferior, and we should not spread the mongrel taint. Gideon stiffened, but before he could say anything, she held up her hand and continued. It's all right. We know we are not mongrels. He hated our mother, you see, and considers her blood tainted. But there was nothing at all wrong with her she added in an impassioned voice. She was beautiful and loving and... She broke off and took a deep breath. Mama's family was not gently born. Her grandfather began as a butcher and his son, our grandfather, was also in the butchery trade. So they were what Grandpapa calls sits, though immensely rich ones. We do not care, of course, but because of his prejudices, Grandpapa would not allow us to go about, or to attend any of the local functions, except for church, and even then we had services in our private chapel when possible. But the point of all this is that we girls grew up not knowing many people. Philip's parents owned the property next to Grandpapa's. We did not know him, for he and his older brother were away at school, but we did know Mrs. Otterbury from church, so we knew of him. Anyway, one day while we were out walking, we met him. His horse had gone lame, and Philip was leading it home, taking a shortcut through the court, that's Durham Court, where we lived, to spare the horse. So of course we started talking, and, oh, you have no idea how wonderful it was to talk to someone other than my sisters, someone of my own age. Her eyes shone with a soft, reminiscent glow. That day I walked with him to the edge of the property, and we just talked, and talked, about everything, and nothing. How old were you? Gideon interjected, feeling ridiculously envious of that glow. Oh, about fifteen, I think, she said. And from then on, we met often, in secret, of course. His mother used to visit occasionally, which was unexceptional, since she did not bring Philip. And though Grandpapa did not like her coming, and was shockingly uncivil to her, there was no actual reason for him to forbid her visits. She smiled reminiscently. She was very kind, Mrs. Otterbury, and put up with all sorts of rudeness in order to visit us. It occurred to Gideon that Mrs. Otterbury recognized an opportunity for her younger son when she saw it. Each of the Meridue girls were reputed to be handsomely dowered. An ambitious mother would certainly brave more than incivility to secure a fortune for a son otherwise unprovided for. His prudence was too unworldly to see a more mercenary motive in her neighbor's sudden friendliness. Prudence continued, unaware of his cynical thoughts. The little ones, particularly, loved her visits, as they have few memories of Mama, and Mrs. Otterbury was so warm and kind and... and motherly. You know, she even cuddled them sometimes, and it was so wonderful. Little girls need to be cuddled frequently, you know. So do big ones, he said softly, and held out his hand to her. She shook her head, but her color heightened. You think there are only a few shared childhood memories binding me to Philip, don't you? Apart from the promise and the ring, there is more. I did not plan to tell you, but perhaps if I do, you will understand and cease this, this... Courtship? prompted Gideon. She gave him a look he couldn't interpret. Just let me explain. Very well. Gideon leaned back and folded his arms, and prepared to listen. Philip's departure for India was very sudden. I had no idea he was going anywhere until just a day or two beforehand. 
Young men just didn't up and leave on the spur of the moment to take up a position in India, thought Gideon. It wasn't like taking the stagecoach to London. The trip to India took months. There were all sorts of arrangements to be made, passages to book, clothes to be fitted, special supplies to be purchased. Such as remedies against tropical diseases, the list was long. He'd wager Philip had been busy preparing for his journey for some time. He simply hadn't chosen to inform Prudence. It was very distressing, Prudence said. I didn't know if I would ever see him again. It's terribly dangerous in India. So Miss Grace informs me, Gideon murmured. Yes. Philip wanted me to marry him and go too, but of course I was too young to be able to wed without permission, and in any case, Grandpapa was growing more... She hesitated. I suppose you would call it harsh. So I couldn't leave the children with him, and Philip said India was too dangerous for the younger girls. Not too dangerous for a sixteen-year-old. Oh no, for I am not at all frail or helpless. Besides, Philip said he could protect me from danger. Gideon managed not to snort. He was hardly in a position to criticize, after all. But it was not practical for all five of us to go. Even with the assistance of my dowry, Papa's will leaves us money, even if we marry without permission, you see, for that is what he and Mama did. Gideon nodded. He did indeed see. Otterbury tried to persuade a lonely sixteen-year-old to wed him on the sly, knowing she came with a handsome dowry. Philip proposed to me at the cairn. That's what we call Mama and Papa's grave. And don't look at me like that. It isn't really their grave. But we girls made a pile of stones in the corner of the Merridew family burial yard. It is next to the Derham private chapel, so nobody goes there except family and the gardener who keeps it tidy. We planted flowers around the cairn, and when we were lonely or unhappy, we used to go and talk to Mama or Papa. It was a comfort, you see. We'd tell them things, just small items only of importance to family, like girlish secrets and Grace's teeth. Gideon frowned. Her teeth? Prudence smiled. Every one of her baby teeth was added to the cairn with great ceremony. Teeth falling out are exciting for a child, and no one else at Derham was interested, but Mama and Papa were always listening. That's what we thought anyway. She smiled to herself, a little misty-eyed. So that's where Otter Clogs proposed, Gideon said. Cunning bastard, he thought. Yes. He asked their permission first, and then... She broke off at the sound of a soft knock at the door. How is our wounded hero? A low feminine voice called. Gideon swore under his breath. It is charity, she explained, clearly flustered by the interruption. I, uh, I didn't tell them it was I who shot you. They think it was the robber. Gideon nodded. Your bloodthirsty tendencies are safe with me, Miss Imp. Damn it. She'd been about to explain the hold that blasted Otterbury had on her. He was in no mood to entertain visitors, but he could see she'd snatched at the interruption, like a drowning man snatches at a straw. She jumped up and opened the door. Charity entered on tiptoe, carrying a covered tray. Is he awake? She whispered. I'm awake, Miss Charity. Gideon responded. He's awake! A cluster of golden heads peered around the door, and in seconds his bed was surrounded by sisters and his cousin. Prudence, suddenly recalling his chest was naked, but for the bandage, quickly whisked the sheet up around his chin and tucked it in firmly, watched by four pairs of curious female eyes. How do you feel, Cubs? asked Edward. Gideon winked, and Edward relaxed. Oh, you poor brave man. Thank heavens you're recovering. I brought you some nice hot gruel. Charity set the tray on a nearby chest and lifted the cloth to reveal a spouted invalid bowl containing an ominously grey liquid. Gideon pulled a face. He had no intention of drinking gruel. Oh, look, he's in pain, exclaimed Faith. You're very brave, sir. Is it very painful? asked Hope. Of course it is, said Grace scornfully. He bled everywhere all over the landlady's best sofa. It's absolutely ruined, she pronounced with relish. Did you kill any of the villains, Lord Caradice? Prudence wouldn't discuss it. That's quite enough, Grace dear, interrupted Prudence hastily. 
We don't want to exhaust Lord Caradise, do we? Oh, Lord Caradise wouldn't mind, the invalid murmured. A little exhaustion in a good cause. Prunes blushed and seized the invalid bowl. This gruel will help you get your strength back, sir. No, I thank you. Some beef and bergen. The spout was deftly inserted between his teeth. Gideon spluttered and tried to object, but the vile stuff was poured gently but ruthlessly down his throat. His visitors stayed and chatted for some few minutes, and pleasant though it was, Gideon soon found that he was indeed exhausted. Prudence picked up on it instantly. I think our invalid needs to sleep now, she declared. When the visitors had left the room, she came back to his bedside, gently smoothed his pillows, and tucked him in, like a babe, he thought in disgust. Sleep now, she whispered, passing a hand across his brow. He caught it, and held her hand against his cheek. I still don't know what your terrible secret is, my dear, but there is nothing you could tell me that would make a difference. You have led a sheltered life. He held up a weary hand. No, don't argue with me. I have no doubt that what you think scandalous and unforgivable would not be so very dreadful to a man such as myself. I shall wait. It will make no difference to me. He subsided, and Prudence turned to leave. His words stopped her in her tracks. I shall wait for you until I am old and grey, if I must. But I'll have you in the end, my Prudence, and you'll come to me with a whole heart. You'll see. Prudence was stunned. He would wait for her until he was old and grey. The look in his eyes caused her heart to pound. She put out a shaking hand as if to hold him off, though he wasn't touching her, and hadn't made a move toward her. But you are a rake, she whispered. He gazed into her eyes for a long, long moment. Yes, and when a rake finally falls, he falls forever. He let her digest that for a moment, and then added solemnly, Besides, you should not scorn my rakishness. Having a rake about the place will come in extremely useful. She frowned in puzzlement. Useful? It was an odd word to use. What do you mean? What possible use would I have for a rake? I could tidy up all your fallen leaves each autumn. It took her a moment to perceive the jest. Laughter and tears trembled on her lips at the same time. Oh, what to do with him? How could anyone love such a wicked, funny, foolish man? How could they not? Prudence left the room. Chapter 15 But having done what hair she could devise, and emptied all her magazine of lies, the time approached. John Dryden the city of Bath rose from a green and verdant valley, the afternoon sun seeming to gild the rows and rows of terraced houses rising in serried ranks, like the steps of an amphitheatre. I had no notion Bath was so beautiful, so very splendid, exclaimed Prudence. Hope and Faith peered out from the coach windows on one side, while Prudence and Grace peered from those on the other. Lord Caradice observed the young ladies indulgently pointing out various sights along the way, lounging on his seat, his coat slung around his shoulder in a careless style that disguised the bandaging. No, indeed, agreed Grace. I was quite misled by the name. Bath, she pronounced it in mild disgust. Who would expect such a dull name to be given to such an interesting-looking place? Ah, but the name has a romance of its own, Miss Grace, explained Lord Caradice. You see, since ancient times, people have travelled for miles to drink from and bathe in the mineral springs here. Even the ancient Romans valued it and built a fine city here. Can you imagine brave Roman centurions bathing here, Miss Grace, after a battle with the wild barbarians of the north? Oh yes, washing away the blood of battle, Grace nodded, shivering deliciously. Lord Caradice chuckled. Bloodthirsty little wench! I suspect they washed that off long before they got to Bath. It is almost as if the Romans are still here, so grand and beautiful some of the buildings are, 
said Faith. And indeed, there was so much classically inspired architecture in evidence. The town did boast a decided Roman character. Once Lord Caradice was well enough to travel, they'd completed the journey in easy stages, stopping a night in Hungerford before continuing on to Bath in the morning. Prudence and Lord Caradice rode in the Duke's carriage with the girls, while the Duke drove Lord Caradice's phaeton, Charity seated beside him. Lily and James sat atop the carriage, enjoying the sights in the mild weather. It had been an unexpectedly merry journey, more like a picnic excursion than an illicit flight from their legal guardian. There had been no further accidents, and no highwaymen or injuries. Lord Caradice, who seemed unfazed by his wound, had proved to be a most entertaining companion, telling ridiculous tales which had Prudence and her sisters in fits of laughter, teaching the younger girls to make up scurrilous rhymes about the various acquaintances they'd made along the way. The waiter who sneezed on the tureen of broth, and then wondered why it came back untouched, forsoth. Lord Caradice had argued strenuously on behalf of that forsoth rhyme, claiming that when he was a boy, everyone pronounced it so. Howled down, he then demanded the girls soothe his bruised pride with music, and then when he discovered how few songs they actually knew, he set himself to teaching them, so they'd arrived in Bath a happy, laughing, singing throng. Prudence could have hugged him. Not since their parents had died had her sisters laughed and sung and giggled with such riotous glee. More than anything, it quelled her anxiety about whether she was doing the right thing. Even if it all ended in disaster, at least they'd had this. The carriage wended its slow way through the steep streets of Bath. The girls stared, entranced at the sights to be seen at this still fashionable watering place. Charity and the Duke were ahead of them by some hours, having left earlier in the faster light of Phaeton. They were hanging out of the windows, exclaiming over the sights, when suddenly Hope exclaimed, Good gracious! It can't be! No, it is. I'm sure of it. Prudence, look! It's Philip! Philip? Philip Otterbury, you goose! What other Philips do we know? It can't be. He's in India. Well, obviously he's returned, retorted Hope impatiently. He's there, in the street, walking away from us now, do you see? In the brown coat and a curly-brimmed hat. Prudence peered out of the coach, as did all her sisters. I can't see anyone in a brown coat. There's a young man in a bottle green coat who looks a bit like Philip, only much shorter, offered Faith. Not the one in bottle green, Henwit, the brown coat. Oh, he's turned the corner and gone now. Didn't any of you see him? Hope demanded in exasperation, but none of the others had seen anyone who even slightly resembled Philip Otterbury. You must have made a mistake, Hope. Prudence sat back on her seat and smoothed her skirt. She was feeling quite shaky. I didn't. It was Philip, I'm sure of it, insisted Hope. How would you know after all this time? asked Faith. It is so long since we saw him. I certainly don't have any clear recollection of how he looked. Don't you? Hope frowned. I'm sure I remember him. He was very good looking. Surely remember that. Lord Caradice frowned. Hope continued. And this man looked just like him, extremely handsome, only a little bit older, and thinner, and browner, she added with clearly diminishing confidence. Hope, dearest, even I have trouble recalling exactly how Philip looks, Prudence said gently. Indeed, Lord Caradice murmured. How very interesting. Prudence ignored him. I'm sure this man in the brown coat did look a little like Philip, but you know, we have only been gone from the court six weeks, and if Philip had been expected home, Mrs. Otterbury would have informed the world as soon as she'd heard. You know what she's like. The whole district would have known of his planned return within hours of her receiving the letter. Even if the letter came the day we left, Philip would still be weeks or more behind it, I'm sure, and we would have heard. Hope sighed. That's true. I suppose it wasn't him after all, for what would he be doing in Bath anyway? 
Faith put an arm around her sister. No doubt Philip being so much in our minds of late, you wanted him to be here and were caught by a passing resemblance. Hope nodded. If Philip were here, he'd be able to save us. Well, Lord Caradice is saving us instead, declared Grace fiercely. And I'd much rather be saved by him than Philip any day. Thank you, Miss Grace. One does hope one's poor efforts are appreciated, murmured Lord Caradice. He laughed lugubriously, and somehow everyone's eyes were drawn to the injury he had received while saving them. Only he and Prudence knew who had actually shot him, Hope exclaimed. Oh, sir, I hope you do not think me ungrateful. No, no, Miss Hope, not at all. Lord Caradice waved her apologies away. Now, up there on our left is Milson Street, where all the fashionable shops are to be found. The girls peered out in the direction he'd pointed, while he lounged back against the seats and gave Prudence a quizzing look. Prudence found herself blushing. Grace had uncannily given voice to Prudence's own thoughts. She would indeed much rather be rescued by Lord Caradice than by her betrothed. She stared out the window and tried to put the thought from her mind. Here we are, said Lord Caradice. The carriage drew up in front of a long row of terraced mansions, built of creamy gold stone and laid in a magnificent arc around a circular park enclosed with iron rails. Which house is it, sir? asked Grace eagerly. Which house? Prudence felt a sudden twinge of anxiety. She had been utterly remiss in agreeing to this. They could not stay in a house owned by Lord Caradice or the Duke, not under the same roof as an unmarried man. An unmarried man who was in no way related to them. An unmarried man who had a reputation as a rake. Not even with four sisters to play chaperone. It simply could not be done. Travelling with Lord Caradice and the Duke of Dinstable had been almost unexceptional. Even the highest sticklers would not have had much to cavil at five unmarried girls travelling with their maid and footman and escorted by two unmarried gentlemen, even if the gentlemen were unrelated to them. She squashed the thought about travelling in the Phaeton at night with an unmarried man and his groom. After all, it was an open carriage, and there was no room for anyone else, and it had been an emergency, and besides, nobody knew. But to reside, even for a short time, under the same roof as those gentlemen, no, it could not be done. Even if Charity were to marry the Duke, Prudence would not wish it whispered about that the Duke had been forced to do so, having compromised the lady. They would have to stay at a hotel or take rooms with a respectable landlady. I don't think we... Prudence began. The three houses with the yellow doors are ours, interrupted Lord Caradice in answer to Grace's question. The one on the left is mine, the one on the right is my cousin's, and the one in the middle is where our Aunt Augusta lives. She's expecting us. I sent a message ahead when I was laid up on my sickbed. You'll love Aunt Gussie, I know. She's the very best of our mother's family. He glanced at Prudence and added wryly, Had Aunt Gussie not been living in Argentina at the time, I doubt our parents would have made such a mull of it. But she's only recently arrived in Bath and is finding it dull after being abroad for so many years. She is no doubt, in transports of delight at the prospect of guests. You mean we are to stay with your aunt? gasped Prudence in relief. And not with you and the Duke? He gave her a reproachful look, but said nothing as the twins began to alight. Then as Grace stepped down the carriage steps, he shook his head and added in a voice of injured innocence. Stay with me and the Duke? I am shocked at the suggestion, Miss Imp. Shocked? I may be a rake, but I do have a passing acquaintance with the rudiments of propriety, you know. And you would not wish to stay in Edward's house, for his mother's decorating genius reached here also, and the inside is distressingly Egyptian. Roman outside, Egyptian within. He shuddered. I fear any resident other than Edward would be obliged to resort, like Cleopatra, to an asp. He, of course, is a nerd to it. He leaped lightly from the carriage and held out an imperious hand to assist her to alight. As she stepped down, he bent low toward her and murmured in her ear, In fact, 
I did plan for you to stay at my house, purely for protection, you understand. But Edward would not have it, you see. The stuffy fellow is such a stickler for the proprieties. Can you imagine how we can be related? He stepped back, winked, and offered her his uninjured arm. Prudence didn't respond. She couldn't. A lump in her throat prevented her. He'd planned for them to stay with his aunt all along. She was beginning to perceive the pattern of it. Whenever she was worried or fretting about something, he produced some piece of nonsensical impropriety to shock her and thus tease her anxieties away. Kindness and thoughtfulness buried beneath a disguise of bold and flippant rakishness. She mounted the steps in silence. The middle yellow door was flung open, and a short, immensely round lady, dressed in purple and gold silk, bustled down the steps. Ladies, I would like to present my aunt, Lady Augusta Montigua del Fuego. Aunt Gussie, may I present the Mrs. Meridew? This is Miss... began Gideon, but the lady cut across him. Not now, dear. It's far too chilly to be standing about doing the pretty. My dears, come in, come in. You must be starving. She gathered the girls together like a small friendly whirlwind and whisked them inside, talking nineteen to the dozen. In here, my dears. How lovely you all are. Yes, yes, give Shoebridge your pelisses and hats. And tea and cakes at once, Shoebridge. Gideon, what on earth have you done to your arm? In the back parlour, Shoebridge. So much more cosy, my dears. And Shoebridge, I am not at home to anyone. Does anyone wish to visit the necessary? No? Oh, the joy of young bladders. She took a deep breath, and before anyone could respond, continued without a pause. Now, my dears, which of you is Prudence? Oh, you must be she, of course, such beautiful eyes. Gideon, dear boy, you are a rascal, and I'm utterly delighted. She gathered the astonished Prudence in a soft, perfumed embrace, adding, and I'm still waiting for you to explain to me this sinister-looking bandage. Prudence gave a guilty start. Did this amazing little woman know Prudence was responsible for his injury? She opened her mouth to admit all, but the lady was still speaking. And why am I also still waiting for a kiss from the wickedest of my nef- Off! Put me down, you wretched boy! You cannot possibly- Gideon swept his aunt up into an exuberant one-armed hug, lifting her completely off her feet and swinging around in a circle. Aunt Gussie, Aunt Gussie, you are an eternal delight to me. Never, never change, he said, planting a hearty kiss on each delicately rouged plump cheek. Put me down, you dreadful creature. Dainty slippered feet kicked fruitlessly six inches above the floor. All four Meridue sisters stared, open-mouthed. Grace giggled first, then the twins joined in. Prudence was too befuddled to do anything except stare. She could see Lord Caradice twirling a short, plump lady, laughing with her and holding her in strong, protective arms. But in her mind's eye, in her heart's secret chamber, the lady Prudence saw Lord Caradice twirling was not his aunt. Never fear, Aunt Gussie. Gideon whirled her around again. You're as light as a feather. My injury is not so bad that I can't embrace my favorite aunt in all the world. Pah! snorted Aunt Gussie as she emerged from his embrace, looking rather like a ruffled, thoroughly delighted hen. She added with an assumption of severity, It was not your arm I was worried about. It was my dignity. Gideon let out a shout of laughter and hugged her again. Dreadful boy! He never did have any manners, you know, she confided to Prudence, as she slapped her nephew away. Oh, stop it, Gideon, do. Make yourself useful and find your young lady a seat over there. She indicated a crimson velvet sofa. Gideon bowed and escorted Prudence across the room with exaggerated solicitude. Prudence, feeling slightly dazed by the whirlwind of words, not to mention her rogue vision, allowed herself to be led. Your young lady. She felt like an impostor. She sat down on the sofa. Lord Caradice sat close beside her. Very close. She could feel the warmth of his limbs burning right through her dress. She shifted away. I see, he murmured softly. It is only on carriages you are prepared to snuggle up to me. Prudence gave him a look of reproof, 
She said nothing, but his words had conjured up, as he no doubt knew they would, those long hours of extreme intimacy on their journey. He was quite unprincipled in some matters. His legs shifted, and she felt its warmth again. She moved, and placed her reticule between them. He sighed ostentatiously. Aunt Gussie wrapped a plump arm around Grace's waist, beaming. And you must be little Grace, the baby of the family. Oh, my, my, what a heartbreaker you're going to be in a few years. And so like your sister Charity, except for the colouring. She and Edward arrived some hours ago, by the way, and have gone into town on some errand or other. Gideon, you didn't tell me the sisters were beautiful, too. No wonder you and Edward stood no chance. Sisters, oh, how the ton will talk. But we shall not regard. Prudence stared at her, puzzled. Gideon leaned forward and frowned, and his aunt caught herself up hastily, saying, No, no, I'm saying nothing. Grace, child, take this charming little chair here. It's quite my favourite. Don't you agree? Grace nodded, smiled, and impulsively, tentatively, gave the little lady's arm a small squeeze. Oh, you dear sweet child. Lady Augusta enveloped Grace in a soft hug. I am so very pleased you've come to stay with me. My scapegrace nephews have done something right for a change. Several things right, in fact. We are going to have such a delightful time. She patted Grace's cheek and smoothed a fiery curl back in a motherly gesture. Such beautiful, beautiful hair you and your sister have. I always wanted Titian hair, you know. Four pairs of eyes were drawn inexorably to the cluster of brilliant Titian curls, perched atop Lady Augusta's head. Unperturbed, she laughed, patting her own hair. Oh, my dears, this isn't natural. But I always say, if nature won't oblige, a good coiffeur will. My own colour is the dreariest mouse brown, so naturally I couldn't put up with that. For a mousy person I am not, nor ever was. Suddenly Lady Augusta's words echoed in Prudence's mind. You didn't tell me the sisters were beautiful too. Too. Prudence turned the words over in her head carefully. No matter how she looked at it, the words seemed to indicate that Lord Caradice had told Lady Augusta things about Prudence. What had he told her? And more to the point, why? Notorious rakes surely wouldn't discuss a little flirting and teasing with their aunts, would they? And what had she meant when she'd said, no wonder you and Edward stood no chance? Sisters, oh how the ton will talk. She could only think of one thing. It was a reference to his and Edward's father's marrying sisters. Lady Augusta gathered a twin with each arm and marched them across the room. As for you two, pretty peas in the pod, which one is which? No, let me guess. You must be Faith, for you haven't taken your eyes off my piano since you walked in. Your sister told me you loved music, and of course you must play it as often as you wish, my dear. She turned to Hope. And so you must be hope. The chaise long is for you two, so I may study you at leisure and learn to tell you apart. What a dazzling double debut you will make. The twins, bemused and vastly entertained, allowed themselves to be seated by the imperious little lady. With everyone finally seated, the Lady Augusta plunked herself breathlessly down on the nearest chair and beamed around the room. Edward has already told me the barest modicum of your story. I shall speak to you girls later and receive the whole of it, but Gideon, she stamped her slippered foot, how many times must I ask you, how did you hurt your arm? Gideon chuckled. If you had once stopped to draw breath, oh aunt, I might have found an opportunity. He held up a hand to stop her retort and hastily said, I was shot in an encounter with a highwayman, a mere flesh wound. Don't look so horrified, Aunt Gussie. There was no real damage done, and nothing was lost. Lady Augusta rolled her eyes. Men, no idea how to tell a tale properly. Miss Meridew, I rely on you to fill me in with all the details later. I understand you were there when the villains accosted you. Oh, she was indeed, said Lord Caradice. In fact, it wouldn't have been nearly such an exciting adventure without her. Lady Augusta sat forward excitedly. Oh, do tell. Prudence narrowed her eyes at Lord Caradice in a silent message. 
They had agreed that it would be better for everyone that the truth would remain their little secret. If anyone discovered it was she who had shot Lord Caradice and not the robber, she would become the object of gossip and notoriety. And though Prudence did not give a fig for what people might say of her, she did not wish to draw undue attention to herself and her sisters. They were in hiding after all. Lord Caradice responded to her quelling look with one of limpid innocence. Oh, a gentleman never tells tales, Aunt Gussie. Nonsense, Gideon. We are family, snapped his aunt. Besides, explaining to your aunt how you were injured is not telling tales. It is your duty as a nephew. She was a very forceful little lady, Prudence decided. She glanced again at Lord Caradice, willing him to silence, not trusting him an inch. That mischievous look was back in his eyes. He opened his mouth, glanced at Prudence in a show of uncertainty, leaned forward and explained. No, I am sorry, dear aunt, but indeed, it would not be gentlemanly. He glanced at Prudence again and added, Besides, it is not even interesting. Screaming and fainting never is. Prudence gasped. The wretch! Painting her as a foolish, fainting female was as bad as telling the truth. Worse, she glared at him. Lord Caradice continued hastily. However, afterwards she gallantly sacrificed her petticoat for the staunching of blood, for which I will ever more be grateful. Lady Augusta sniffed, unimpressed, and said to Prudence, Well, I dare say highwaymen can be alarming, but I was never the least bit in favour of fainting as a tactic, unless it is to avoid awkward questions, then it is very useful. But I have had many an encounter with ruffians and bandidos myself in Argentina, and I am of the firm belief that a cool head and a show of strength is what is needed in an emergency of that sort. Yes, ma'am, murmured Prudence, vowing silently to strangle Lord Caradice the moment she could discreetly do so. Lady Augusta's voice softened. Don't look so chagrined, girl. You cannot be blamed in this country. Well-bred females are only ever taught to be feeble and decorative. Such nonsense. I myself always carry a gun when travelling. You would do well to consider it. Yes, Lady Augusta, I shall in future, Prudence said, with a darkling look at Lord Caradice. He smiled benignly on her in the manner of an elderly uncle. Lady Augusta beamed. Good girl, that's the spirit. I shall even instruct you in the use of a firearm, if you wish. I have a small yet deadly pistol, especially made for me. Thank you, Lady Augusta, Prudence said politely. I would appreciate that very much. I can think of a use for a small but deadly pistol. Right now, in fact. Lord Caradice made a smothered sound, which he tried to turn into a cough. His aunt's eyes narrowed. She glanced shrewdly from her nephew to the stiffly polite young lady seated beside him. Oh ho! So that's it, is it? Gideon, you are as wicked a young rascal now as ever you were. Never mind, my dear. I perceive that this rapscallion has slandered you shockingly. No, there is no point denying it, Gideon. I can tell from the mischief in those wicked black eyes of yours. You never could lie to me. She turned back to Prudence. I collect that the edifying story he, er, uh, didn't tell us was a complete farrago of nonsense. Gideon slapped a hand over his heart. Aunt, you wound me to the quick. Lady Augusta sniffed. That confirms it. Miss Meridue, we shall speak later, and you shall tell me the whole, yes? I gather it is not for general consumption, but I assure you, I am the soul of discretion. There was another muffled sound from her nephew. When it comes to family, I mean, she added with dignity. Family. Prudence's head came up at that. She glanced wildly from Lady Augusta to Lord Caradice. What had he told her? Had he told his aunt they were betrothed? Was that why Lady Augusta was willing to have five unknown young ladies foisted on her with no notice? Family, she queried. She had to clarify the matter instantly. She could not accept this lady's generosity on false pretenses. She could not pretend she was betrothed to Lord Caradice, not to this aunt who clearly adored him. Heat rose in her cheeks. Lady Augusta, I think you should know. Aunt Gussie is referring, of course, to Edward's as yet unofficial betrothal to your sister. 
Lord Caradise interrupted in a bland voice. Prudence blinked. Aunt Garcia is Edward's aunt as well as mine. She was our mother's sister. Oh, Prudence nodded. Of course. She wanted to sink through the floor. Luckily, at that moment, the door opened, and in came the butler, Shoebridge, and several footmen carrying an immense tea tray, and another tray piled high with cakes and other delicacies. The scent of fresh-baked scones filled the room, providing an instant distraction. Lady Augusta poured tea and served scones and jam, adding dollops of clotted cream with a lavish hand. Prudence ate and drank in silence. Of course, there would be no need to pretend to his aunt that there was an understanding between them. There was no longer any need for that fiction. It had been for Great Uncle Oswald, and now its purpose was fulfilled. Charity had made her coming out, and had found herself a husband. Once she was safely married, she could keep the younger one safe until Prudence came into her own inheritance. She bit into a scone slowly. Lord Caradice was now free to do as he wished. He'd already done more than anyone could expect, escorting them to safety. He could bow out gracefully if he wanted to, leaving them in the competent hands of his cousin and aunt, and return to the carefree pleasures of his previous reprehensible way of life. That would be a relief. He wouldn't bother her any more. She would no longer have to put up with his nonsense. No more wicked teasing. No more shocking impropriety. No more illicit kissing and fondling to set her pulse leaping and her body tingling. Life would return to its usual serious purpose. It would be a relief. It would, she was sure. Once she got used to the idea. That was the trouble with his sort of frivolity and fun. It was addictive. Her life had been so grim, so serious, so without joy, until Lord Caradise came into it and viewed his way, problems seemed to shrink. Gazing into those dark, laughing eyes, she could believe that nothing and nobody could hurt her again. The trouble was, gazing into those eyes of his, she could believe almost anything, even that she was beautiful. Her looking-glass was more honest, however, and her common sense more truthful. The trouble was, she had needed him more than he needed her, and now he was free to leave. She was worrying again, Gideon saw. She had that little anxious crease between her brows. He didn't like it. Didn't like to see her fretting about anything. His fingers itched to reach out and smooth it away. He could dedicate his life to that crease, to making sure it never appeared. If she'd only let him, blast it. Talk about hoisted with his own petard. Having spent most of his life making everyone believe him a frivolous fellow who took nothing seriously, the one time he wanted someone to see through the pose for the sham it was, she couldn't. She didn't believe a thing he said, was determined to keep him at arm's length. Even now, he could feel her leaning away from him on the sofa, as if she could be compromised if they so much as touched. He almost wished she could be so easily compromised. Damn it. He would take her any way he could. Well, no, he wouldn't. She had to come to him of her own free will, without pressure, without fear, without hesitation. That was the trouble. Because of her own free will, she had promised herself to Otterbury, not Gideon. Gideon was only the substitute, the passing stranger, the next best, damn it. Just then the door opened, and Charity and the Duke came in. Excellent! exclaimed Lady Augusta. You're back, just in time for tea. Another two cups, Shoebridge. Gideon eyed his cousin. Edward looked different, excited, more assured somehow. What have you two been up to? he asked casually. They jumped and glanced at each other like guilty schoolchildren. The Duke looked a silent question at Charity. She nodded, biting her lip in excitement and trepidation. We just spoke to the bishop announced Edward. Of Bath and Wells? Whatever for? exclaimed Aunt Gussie. A bishop? Hope said in disgust. I'm sure there are much more exciting sights to see in Bath than a bishop's palace. Actually, the bishop's palace is in Wells, not Bath, said Aunt Gussie. Don't tell me you drove all the way to. But Gideon understood at once. And did you get it? Edward nodded and patted his pocket. 
Get what? I wish you boys would explain, instead of talking in this odiously cryptic manner. Aunt Gussie said crossly. Charity, my dear, what are they talking about? Charity blushed, glanced at Prudence apologetically, and said softly, Edward was showing me the sights when we heard that the bishop was visiting Bath. He thought we should take advantage of the opportunity to apply for a license without having to drive all the way to Wells. There was a sudden silence, broken only by Grace's question. A license? What for? A license to get married without having to wait to call the bands, Prudence said shakily. Oh, Charity, you're going to be married. Pandemonium broke out. Five females, Lady Augusta included, leaped to their feet and embraced Charity, pelting her with questions and exclaiming in amazement. Tea and scones grew cold, forgotten. Gideon strolled over to his cousin, who had been pushed to the edge of the excited group of females. Congratulations, cuz. She'll make you very happy, I think. Edward Beaming nodded. I never believed I could be so happy about tying the knot, Gid. When you think of how we both swore to avoid it, but with charity, it's different. I cannot imagine life without her. She's... she's perfect, isn't she? For you, she obviously is, Gideon said. You're looking extraordinarily happy, I must say. He eyed his cousin thoughtfully and added, I don't suppose you've done the deed already, have you? Prudence heard the soft question. What? What did you say? Done the deed already? She stared at Edward a moment and turned back to Charity. Don't tell me you're already married, Charity. You haven't, have you? Edward reached out and gathered Charity to his side. No, we haven't. But it wasn't for want of trying. Prudence stared at him. What? Edward shrugged. I could have talked the old boy into doing it then and there, I'm sure. There are advantages to being a duke after all. He smiled at Charity, who nestled happily into the curve of his arm. But my bride wanted to wait. Of course she did, you silly boy, exclaimed Aunt Gussie. She doesn't want a hasty hole-in-the-corner wedding. She'll want to purchase bride clothes and send out invitations and order a special dress, and then there's a wedding breakfast. Oh no, interrupted Charity gently. I don't care about any of that. I would have been very happy to be married immediately. A small and private ceremony is exactly what Edward and I want, and I have plenty of lovely new clothes, thanks to Great Uncle Oswald's wonderful generosity. Then what delayed you, child? Charity said simply. When I marry, I want my sisters with me. We've all anticipated this day so much. She flushed and added in a low voice, Only, I never expected it to be such a happy occasion. Gideon watched as Prudence's lovely eyes grew bright with tears. You are happy, aren't you, Char? She whispered. Charity's eyes flooded. Oh yes, Prue, I am very happy. She wiped her eyes and added, I never dreamed I could feel like this. She leaned closer to the Duke's embrace. Just like you promised. Prudence's face crumpled. Oh, Charity. Gideon handed her a handkerchief. She clutched at it blindly. He took it back and proceeded to dry her eyes, ignoring her half-hearted efforts to repel him. Don't fuss him, he said softly. All eyes are on the bride. Nobody is looking at you. You are, she said in a watery voice. Yes, but I can't help myself. You couldn't stop me looking at you if you wanted to. And you're beautiful when you're damp. For some reason, this brought on a fresh flood of tears. And Gideon busied himself with drying them too. Aunt Gussie frowned and turned to the younger girls. We'll get no sense out of this lot for a while. So come and sit over here by the fire, and while the gentlemen dry your sister's eyes, we shall plan our wardrobes. Don't worry about the tears, Grace Child. Everyone cries at weddings. It's a tradition. She smiled at them all. I'm very glad you girls have come to stay with me. I was bored to death, you know. Bath used to be extremely fashionable before I left this country, but these days the town is crowded with people I've never heard of. Dowdies, fossils, and mushrooms, and... Do you know the worst thing about it? The girls shook their heads. 
Nothing ever happens. Lady Augusta sat back and regarded them with satisfaction. At least it didn't until the marriage you girls arrived. She raised her voice and said, Edward, when is this wedding to be? We booked the church for next Wednesday. He responded vaguely, still preoccupied with his pride. Wednesday? That is a bare week from now. Lady Augusta surged to her feet. Come, girls, there is much to arrange. A private ceremony is one thing, but it need not be a shabby affair. Your sister may think she has enough pretty dresses, but she's about to become a duchess. And you shall be the sister-in-laws of a duke. And if that is not the best excuse for shopping, I don't know what is. She sailed from the room, sweeping the twins and Grace in front of her. Gideon glanced at his cousin and Charity. I think we should give them a little privacy, don't you? He murmured. Prudence, still feeling a little emotionally unsettled, nodded and allowed him to escort her from the room. He led her through a passage and into a small pretty room, furnished in blue and gold. Before she knew it, she was seated on a sofa, wrapped in a firm, immensely appealing masculine embrace. Oh no, I shouldn't, she muttered feebly. Hush. He tucked her securely against his chest. Just let me hold you for a moment. Just for comfort. There's nobody to see, and I promise you, I shall be the soul of propriety. Prudence gave a watery chuckle. I don't think the high sticklers would think much of your notion of propriety. Even being alone with him was indiscreet, let alone the way he was holding her. But she didn't care. It was lovely being held like this, even for a short time. Just for comfort, she told herself for friendship. Tell me about this promise Charity mentioned. Oh, it was just something I used to tell them when things were at their darkest. His right hand stroked the soft inner skin of her arm, sending warm ripples through her. Tell me, he insisted softly. Mama and Papa were very happy, very much in love, she began. And we lived in Italy. I think because theirs was a runaway marriage, and they, and we, were wonderfully happy until they died. How did they die? She drew in a deep, shaky breath. It was a fever. They caught it in the city where they'd gone for a party, staying a week or more. Papa died in the city, very quickly, and when Mama returned with the terrible news, it was clear she was ill from the moment she arrived. She shivered, remembering. The servants recognized the illness at once, and fled. I found Conchetta, our nursemaid, sneaking out the back. She told me why everyone else had gone. He put his arm around her, and she allowed herself to lean against him, just for comfort. She said, I convinced Conchetta to take the baby and the children with her to safety. And you, a child yourself, stayed behind to look after your mother. She nodded. Her face crumpled as she whispered. But she died anyway. He hugged her tight then, as she wept a few more tears. Tell me about the promise, he prompted after a long interval. When she was dying, Mama made me promise to look after the little ones. She promised that no matter what happened in our lives, we would each find great love and happiness. She scrubbed at her eyes, embarrassed at the outburst. But then we were sent to live with Grandpapa, where there was no sunshine, and no love, and certainly no laughter, though we managed to have a few moments of happiness. So when life was bleakest, I used to promise my sisters that no matter how bad it seemed, one day we would all live like we did in Italy, with sunshine, and laughter, and love, and happiness. I see. Yes. She sighed. And now Charity is the first of them to find love and happiness. Is she indeed? He murmured, tucking a stray curl behind her ear. Why do you say them like that? As if you don't believe in that promise for yourself. Prudence hesitated. I do not think I was born lucky. Why not? He asked softly. Well, I thought I'd found. She broke off. You thought you'd found love when you were sixteen, he said in a deep voice. 
She nodded. And then when you found you'd made a mistake, that otter shanks had feet of clay and a brain to match. Yeah, no. I don't want to talk about this anymore, she said, suddenly struggling to sit up. He allowed her to sit up, but caught her by her shoulders, facing him. A twinge of protest came from his injury, but he ignored it. Gazing intently into her eyes, he said deliberately, He left you, imp. Abandoned you to fate and the mercy of your grandfather who, according to your sisters, thrashes you. Did Otterclogs know about the thrashings? Her gaze dropped. So he did know, and he left you to... No, she cut him off. They were never as bad until... until after Philip left. Gideon's eyes bored into her. What happened after Philip left, imp? He asked softly. What happened to make your grandfather treat you so badly? I was... Her face twisted with grief, and she tried to pull away. No. No, I, I can't. You can tell me anything, love, he said gently. What happened after Philip left? There was... I found... I... She closed her eyes for a moment swallowed convulsively, took a deep breath, and said, I discovered I was with child. That is what binds me to Philip, not simply the promise. In fact, she hadn't even realized it herself. It was Grandpapa who'd noticed she couldn't keep her breakfast down five days in a row. Grandpapa who'd recognized symptoms of which she was ignorant. Grandpapa, who informed her that, like the harlot he'd always known she was, she was breeding a bastard. It was the worst day of her life. Until now, she'd told no one, no one except Philip. Not even her sisters knew. Now, she'd told Gideon. Without waiting to see his reaction, she fled the room. Chapter 16 Love is the whole history of a woman's life. It is an episode in a man's. Madame de Stael. Prudence flew up the stairs, her heart in turmoil. She hadn't been able to look him in the eye. She wasn't sure why. Her grandfather's words came back to her as she sought the sanctuary of her room. No man will want another man's leavings. Was that how Lord Caradice would see her now? As another man's leavings, she shuddered. No, it was an ugly image planted in her mind by a twisted old man. She ought to know better than to think of it. She wasn't anyone's leavings. She was herself. Prudence Meridue. No particular bargain, perhaps. But still, she shuddered again. It was a disgusting expression. She would banish it from her mind this instant. She opened doors, searching for the bedchamber allotted her, but her mind worried at the question, like a tongue at a sore tooth. Would this change Lord Caradice's opinion of her? And if so, how? Would he still want her, now that he knew the dreadful truth? She would find out soon enough. Had he ever truly wanted her in the first place? She'd been warned repeatedly that he was a here and thereian, that the chase was what he liked and she had led him a chase. Self-doubt crowded in on her. Other people's warnings echoed in her mind. Just because he sounded sincere did not mean he was, and just because she wanted to believe him, it did not mean he could be believed. Girls were ruined every day because they believed what men told them. A girl would have to be foolish to take a well-known rake at his very appealing word, wouldn't she? No doubt the more appeal, the more danger, no doubt of it at all. The only use any man would have for the likes of you is a whore. Stop it. Stop thinking such vile thoughts. She clapped her hands over her ears, as if the thoughts could be blocked out like that. Lord Caradice would never think of her in that way, she told herself firmly. He wasn't a bitter and twisted old man. He was more compassionate, more understanding. He wouldn't try to take advantage of her secret. Prudence was certain of it. She discovered her portmanteau sitting at the foot of a bed in the room in front of her. Her hat was on the bed. 
She entered the bedchamber, closing the door quietly behind her. Prudence sat down on the bed, her knees suddenly weak. Lord Caradice had said once that Prudence was too innocent for the company of women like Teresa Crowther. Yet Mrs. Crowther had once been his own mistress. He hadn't spoken of her with respect. She thought of how hard it already was for him to behave with even a semblance of propriety toward her. Now that he knew she was no virtuous maiden, would he still think she didn't belong with Mrs. Crowther and her ilk? Of course he would, she decided. He was kind. He was not a hypocrite, like many in society. It was good that he knew her secret, knew the final guilty tie that bound her to Philip. She removed her short Spencer jacket and hung it in the closet. Grandpapa had painted a terrifying picture of what fallen women suffered. Had she not lost the babe, she would have learned those consequences firsthand. Grandpapa would have cast her out, never mind the slur on the family name. He'd called the death of her baby a judgment on her. Prudence's eyes filled with slow, bitter tears. She'd been forced to grieve in silence and in secret. Had she disobeyed, her sisters would have suffered even more for her sin. She was bidden to silence, and so had told no one of the child, only Philip in two letters that he must not have received, for he'd never responded. She'd spent many an hour at Mama and Papa's cairn, however, weeping alone until her eyes were swollen and dry. She'd added many a small pebble to Mama's cairn for the baby. Pouring some water out of the ewer on the dresser, she wondered whether if Grandpapa had cast her out, and if she had by some stroke of chance met Lord Caradice. No. The idea was ridiculous. She would have died in a gutter of starvation, no doubt. Or perhaps she would have gone to Mrs. Otterbury, and then Philip would have sent for her. Only Philip hadn't sent for her. She splashed cold water on her face. Why not? She wondered for the hundredth time. Mama said you had to seize your chance at happiness. Prudence had been given her chance. She'd refused to run away with Philip. She hadn't been able to leave her sisters behind. She'd made her choice. And because of it, her baby had died. Prudence had to live with that. A child? Gideon was stunned. It was a bigger barrier than he'd realized to win her. He'd felt quite confident of his ability to win her from Otterbury. But a child? He couldn't compete with a child. She clearly felt the child bound her to Otterbury. He felt a surge of rage. Damn it. What sort of loose screw was Otterbury to get a young, gently bred girl with child and then abandon her to seek his fortune? He wondered about the child. Was it still alive? Many babes did not see their first birthday. He tried to think back to how she had put things. That is what binds me to Philip, not simply the promise. That being the child. Binds, she had said, not bound. So the child was still alive. Was it a girl or a boy? And where was it? Not in Norfolk. She wouldn't leave a child with her grandfather and flee herself. So had the babe been wrestled from its mother and hidden away from sight, farmed out to strangers for a few guineas? It was the usual thing in such cases. Only Prudence was a rare, loyal creature. She couldn't even give up on a man who'd left her alone to face the consequences of his lust. Left her for four long years. If she couldn't forget a creature like that, could she forget her own child? Never. Not a woman like his prudence. Did she ever see the child? Would she be allowed? Did she even know where he or she was? Was it a boy or a girl? He pictured a tiny girl with prudence's eyes. He hoped it wasn't a girl. He couldn't bear a little girl with Prudence's face growing up alone and unloved. And if it were a boy, he imagined a small boy with curly red hair, a look of dogged determination on his little face, a stubborn little chin, just like Miss Imp's firm little chin. Oh God, the whole idea was unbearable. He had to speak to her at once. Damn it, Aunt Gussie, she won't speak to me. It's been days now, and I haven't been able to get her alone. Not even for a moment. Well, what do you expect, you foolish boy? She's busy, and so am I. 
Has it escaped your notice that her sister and my nephew are getting married the day after tomorrow? But this is important. Aunt Gussie waved a dismissive hand. Pooh! You can talk to her any time. A wedding is but once in a lifetime. And don't look at me like that, young man. It is not my fault that both my husbands died. Women have more stamina than men, that is all. And stop distracting me. There are a thousand things to be done. Even the smallest, most private ceremony takes a great deal of organization, you know. Gideon gave her a blank look. I don't see how that follows. All you need is a bride, a groom, a parson, and a couple of witnesses, and that's it. So there should be plenty of time for Prudence to... His aunt rolled her eyes. That is exactly what Edward said to me. You men have no idea, do you? She said. It is still a very important day in a young woman's life, no matter how small and private it may be. Whether there are to be five hundred guests or five, it must be a day young Charity can look back on without regrets. She is being rushed into this as it is. She has barely had a coming out, poor child, and if she had, she would have had all London at her feet. She shook her head. Such an exquisite creature should have been able to spread her wings a little, experience the power of her beauty before tying the knot and being dragged off to the wilderness, as I am sure Edward will do. The wretched boy. Gideon shrugged. I don't know what plans they have, but Charity seems very happy to me, and Edward is floating on air. But I need to speak to Prudence, and she's avoiding me. His aunt threw up her hands. You are all too besotted to understand a thing. So it is left to me to ensure that the arrangements are perfect. There are flowers and food and champagne and all sorts of things to arrange. Edward's house is to be set in order, not to mention the matter of bride clothes. She said she had plenty of clothes. His aunt gave him a scornful look. You cannot possibly imagine that I would allow that beautiful child to be married in a gown she has worn before, do you, Gideon? Have you forgotten to whom you're speaking? She shook her head in disgust. I have a reputation to maintain, and it shall not be said that I had the most beautiful creature in England under my care, and I allowed her to be married in her old gown. Prudence is more beautiful, and anyway, Charity's dress can hardly be old. She said, Pah! Out of my way, you foolish boy. I cannot waste time bandying words with a man who has only one thing on his mind. She swatted him aside like a fly, and bustled past. Aunt Gussie! Gideon was shocked. His aunt turned, her black button eyes sparkling with mischief. Well, you do, don't you? Rake Caradice? She tilted her head and gave him a very knowing look. Or are you going to suggest the idea of bedding Miss Prudence hasn't crossed your mind, hmm? To his chagrin, Gideon felt his face reddening. Well, damn it. Of course it has crossed my mind, but only in the most honourable way. He retorted, said the man who swore he'd never, ever marry. She peered up at him and laughed. And you're blushing. The hardened rake is actually blushing. If I'm blushing, it's for your atrocious manners, Aunt Gussie. Gideon scrambled for a shred of dignity. It is hardly proper behavior for an aunt to quiz a man on his love life. Your time in the Argentine has... Aunt Gussie laughed delightedly. The libertine lecturing on propriety. Oh, I am enjoying this. When a rake falls, he falls so hard. She reached up and patted his cheek. There is not a particle of use telling me of your intentions, honourable or not, dear boy. I am only your aunt. Speak to Miss Prudence about it, and don't waste any more of my time. I have a wedding to organise. Yes, but that's the problem retorted Gideon, exasperated. She won't even see me. But his aunt was off, sailing from the room, like a small battleship in a high wind. Well, what about this ribbon? Do you think it matches your new dress or not? Or is it not quite the right shade of blue? The Merridew sisters frowned over the ribbon. Perhaps a shade too much lavender in the tone. What about this one, Charity? Faith suggested. Charity chewed her lip, undecided. Take them all to the window, and we shall compare them to your satin in the daylight, Prudence decided. They trooped to the window and scrutinized various ribbons carefully against a small piece of celestial blue satin from Charity's new wedding dress. 
I think the darker blue will look best against... Charity began. Look! It's Philip! It is! It is! Shrieked Hope suddenly. Outside, Prudence! In the street there! See? I wasn't mistaken the other day. Prudence looked to where her sister was pointing and froze. Philip. She stared through the window. It was Philip, here, strolling down a street in Bath. Vaguely, she felt ribbons slithering from her slackened hold. Some part of her heard her sisters exclaiming and chattering as her mind tried to grasp it. Philip wasn't in India. He was here in Bath. Bath? But how? When had he come home? Her mind tried to make sense of it, but it kept slipping out of her grasp. Go on, Prue. Don't just stand there. Run out and catch him. Hope urged her. Prudence turned and blinked. She felt almost dizzy, hollow, even a little bit sick. Her sisters beamed at her. Isn't it wonderful, Prue? exclaimed Charity. Philip will have no idea you are here. What a marvellous surprise for you both. He'll be thrilled. Yes, Prudence said dazedly. She tried to gather her senses. I wonder what... I mean... Why? She glanced back out of the window, and it was true. Philip Otterbury was strolling along the opposite pavement, as large as life, jauntily swinging a cane as he perused the contents of various shop windows through a quizzing glass. Hurry! Charity urged, taking the last of the ribbons from Prudence's limp fingers. Before he disappears again! Yes. Yes, I must. Prudence hurried out into the street, then stopped abruptly. What would she say to him after all this time? She took another few steps toward him and stopped again, suddenly uncertain as questions crowded in again. Why was he in Bath and not in Norfolk? Why hadn't he written to let her know he was returning? How long had he been back in England? Was that why he hadn't responded to her letters these last few months? Because he was in England and her letters had gone to India? Go on! Hope gave her a push from behind. He's right there, Prue. What's the matter with you? Hey, Philip! Philip Otterbury! She called and waved, oblivious of the curious looks they were receiving. Philip turned, a slight smile on his face as his gaze swept the street. His jaw and his quizzing glass dropped as he spotted them. He glanced quickly around him, as if to check whether he was observed, and then simply stood and stared at Prudence. She stared back. He wasn't moving. Why not? Her gaze swept over him. He looked different, as Hope had said, thinner and browner and not as tall as she had remembered, but he was unmistakably Philip. He was still handsome, more handsome than she remembered, though not as tall. His golden hair was burnished, brushed into careful curls and looking even fairer against the darkened color of his skin. Philip was back in England. He looks very fine and elegant, does he not? She heard Faith murmur behind her. And indeed, he was very fashionably dressed in breeches of the palest primrose, high white-topped boots, and a coat of bottle green, padded extravagantly at the shoulders, nipped in tight at the waist, and embellished with large silver buttons. His shirt collar was high and stiffly starched, supporting a starched necktie of complicated design. He wore a very high-crowned hat and carried a black lacquered cane. She didn't remember Philip as being interested in fashion, but it seemed he now was. It was, after all, more than four years. Go on, Prue. What's wrong with you? Hope pushed her again. Prudence's other sisters crowded in behind her, murmuring encouragement. As if in a trance, Prudence slowly closed the gap between herself and Philip. Why didn't he move? What did that look on his face mean? And suddenly, they were face to face. Philip, she said, then not knowing what to do, held out her hand. He quickly glanced around them, then took it, frowning. Prudence, my dear girl, it is you. I thought I must have been mistaken. What on earth are you doing in Bath? Prudence blinked. Over the years, she had imagined this moment hundreds of times. She'd imagined all sorts of places, and had enacted many different scenes in her head, 
Not one of them bore the faintest relation to this mundane meeting in a public street. My sisters and I are visiting friends here. I could ask you the same question, Philip. He cast another glance back up the street and said hurriedly, Oh, uh, me too, me too. Visiting friends, that is to say, colonial acquaintances, mere acquaintances. Nobody you need to worry about. He peered past her. Good grief. Your little sisters have grown up a great deal, have they not? It has been more than four years. He laughed heartily, as if at some witticism. Four years? Yes, indeed, how time does fly! He pumped her hand energetically. I am delighted to see you, delighted, my dear, though I might wish our meeting was not in so public a place. I cannot believe you are here in Bath, he gestured, taking in the whole street. Amazing coincidence. He seemed very nervous, thought Prudence, ill at ease. She supposed it wasn't surprising. She felt quite peculiar herself. She couldn't believe that this was Philip, that he was here in Bath and not thousands of miles away. How is your mother, Philip? Is she here too? No, she is at home with my father. Who are you visiting? Anyone we know? Well, feeling a little awkward about explaining how she and her sisters were fleeing her grandfather, Prudence tried to think of some innocuous way to explain her presence in Bath. Charity is to be married tomorrow. How nice. To whom? He said, looking back the way he'd come. She is to be married to the Duke of Dinstable. He started. Good heavens! Her Duke! How very splendid! I must congratulate her! He waved at the girls who had been hanging back. At his signal they hurried forward excitedly, only Grace hanging back. As they drew nearer, he lifted his quizzing glass to observe them, and exclaimed, Well, you never told me Charity had grown into a beauty. She's a regular little diamond. No wonder she snagged a duke, even without the disadvantage of your mother's connections. In fact, all your sisters are dashed pretty, Prudence, if I might say so. What do you mean, the disadvantage of our mother's connections? began Prudence indignantly. But before she could finish, her sisters arrived, and the conversation was swamped as her sisters pelted him with questions, the questions Prudence had been too stunned to ask. He'd returned to England a couple of months ago. Yes, his mother was well. Yes, he'd been home to Norfolk, and indeed, he had been extremely surprised to hear they were not at home. And of course, terribly disappointed to miss seeing them, especially since even the younger ones had grown into such beauties. Ha ha. No. He hadn't actually heard anything about scarlet fever, although now that he came to think of it, his mother might have mentioned something of the sort. Of course, he hadn't called at Derham Court, not formally, well, no point in that, after all, with their grandfather being the dashed, inhospitable fellow he was, and besides which, since they were not at home, there was little p- How did he know they were not at home? Oh, one of the servants must have told him. He couldn't remember who. Someone had mentioned it at any rate. Scarlet fever. Well, possibly that was it. But nobody had suggested they had come to Bath. He would most certainly have remembered that. So had Lord Derham brought them to Bath to take the waters after their illness. Oh, they hadn't had scarlet fever, but didn't someone just say? And he'd heard some talk of the old man having broken his... They'd what? Run away from Lord Derham? He turned to Prudence. Are you mad, Prudence, to run away from your legal guardian? Five unmarried girls? I've never heard anything so ill-judged in my life. He held up his hand at the chorus of explanations and justifications that began and said, Who, may I ask, assisted you in this extraordinary piece of folly? Do you understand what it would do to your reputations? Prudence, casting a minatory glance at her sisters to hush them, said calmly, The girls exaggerate. It is not the dramatic event you seem to think it, Philip. Until recently we have been staying with our great uncle, Sir Oswald Meridew, in London, and we were escorted here to Bath by Charity's affianced husband, the Duke of Dinstable. We are staying in the home of Lady Augusta Montigua del Fuego, so you see, there is nothing to cause the least risk to our reputations. That's right! Grace butted in, her hands braced belligerently on her hips. It's not fair of you to speak to Prudence like that, when you have no idea what's been happening. She wouldn't have had to rescue us if you'd been there in the first place. But Prudence always looks after us. 
and she wouldn't let anything bad happen, not even to our reputations, would you, Prue? She added. And besides, Lord Caradice escorted us to Bath too, and he saved Prudence from a highwayman, and he likes Prudence, and he's really nice. Caradice? Never heard of him. Philip glared down at her. Grace, isn't it? Well, why don't you go away and look in the shop windows or something, while your sister and I discuss adult matters? Charity glanced from Philip to Prudence, and said hastily, Yes, let's, girls. Philip and Prue need to talk privately. Prue can catch up with us in a few moments. Grace and Hope looked unimpressed by this suggestion, but Charity was firm in her resolve, and coaxed them away. Philip turned back to Prudence. This whole thing sounds extremely heavy cavy to me, Prudence. Scarlet fever and highwaymen, running away. And I don't begin to understand why anyone would imagine you need rescuing. And as for you staying with these so-called friends, I've never heard of this Caradice fellow, and I can't say I like the sound of him escorting you thither and yon. Where is your great-uncle? And as for Lady whoever Montigua del Watsit, what sort of name is that, I ask you? It's an Argentinian name, Philip sniffed. I knew she couldn't be English. Lady Augusta Montigua del Fuego is the extremely English aunt of the Duke of Dinstable, Prudence explained in a tight voice. Her second marriage was to an Argentinian gentleman, but having been widowed, she has now returned to live in England. Oh, well, if she is a Duke's aunt, I expect it is all right. It is. She has been wonderfully kind to us, Philip, and I will not have her disparaged in any way. Prudence said in a voice that made Philip blink at her in surprise. Well, I wasn't meaning to... He began. No, I'm sure you weren't, she said briskly. But the street is no place to discuss this or any other personal matter. You may call on me at Lady Augusta's house this afternoon. Er, uh, yes. Very well. He bowed stiffly. Here is Lady Augusta's direction. She scribbled on a small piece of paper and pressed it into his hand. I shall expect you this afternoon. What time would suit you? Uh, he glanced around at the street again, as if for inspiration. Two? Two will do very nicely. I will see you then, Philip. We have much to discuss. Prudence said crisply and hurried off down the street, gathering her sisters as she went, leaving Philip staring after her. Her legs were shaking by the time they reached Lady Augusta's, even though it was but a few minutes' walk. Her sisters discussed the extraordinary coincidence of running into Philip all the way home, speculating on what had brought him to Bath, how he had changed, how fashionably he was dressed, and above all, what his return would mean to Prudence and themselves. They seemed to think all their problems were solved. Prudence herself said not a word. If asked, she would have said she was delighted to see him, but Actually, she'd been severely jolted by the encounter. She felt almost betrayed by his return to England unannounced. How long had he been in England? She walked slowly up the stairs to her bedchamber. Not even the most optimistic of people could think that little scene in the street was the reunion of long-parted lovers, said the small voice within. But she still wore his ring on the chain around her neck and he still clearly felt he had the right to reprimand her about her behaviour, as an affianced husband might. After so many years apart, each of them was bound to have changed, grown in different directions. He had become more assertive, as had she. It was only natural. But what did Philip expect of her? Had he told his parents of their betrothal? Was she still, for him, the sole dream that keeps me going in this hellhole on earth? as he had once written. It didn't appear so, but appearances could deceive. He did not seem overwhelmed with emotion, for one could not embrace in the street after all. It was not surprising if a certain amount of self-conscious awkwardness attended their initial meeting. And if he did still want her, how was she going to deal with that? Her stomach fluttered with nerves. At two o'clock they would meet again in private, and it would all be sorted out, she told herself. She stared into the looking-glass, tidying her hair absent-mindedly. When she thought of the natalie dressed stranger she'd met in the street, she didn't feel anything. She didn't feel betrothed to him. She didn't feel connected to him in any way. 
and yet they'd made a child together. Gideon had spent the past hour pacing back and forth, peering out of the upstairs window on the lookout for the return of Miss Prudence and her sisters, having forced himself to wait until it was a decent hour to call on Miss Prudence again, he'd been frustrated to discover that all the young ladies had gone shopping. Again. He'd returned to his own house and proceeded to wait, as patiently as he could, which was not very. He'd made his decision and could not wait to speak to her about it. He would marry Miss Prudence forthwith and fetch her child to her at once. The child would live with them and be adopted as his son or daughter. It would cause a deal of talk, of course, but he had thought it all through. If any scandal-mongering did arise, he would simply have whispered abroad that the child was his, and thus there would be no slur on Prudence. The Ton might even honour her charitable nature for taking in his base-born child with so little fuss. Not that he gave the snap of his fingers what the world thought, as long as that dreadful blind grief was banished forever from her eyes. At last he saw the Meridue girls walking down the street, a small knot of bustling femininity, engaged in animated conversation. Not Prudence, he saw. She wasn't talking at all. It was a little difficult to see under the bonnet she was wearing, but he thought she looked a little pale, a little solemn and anxious. He'd soon put the roses back in her cheeks. Gideon ran down the stairs, hurried next door, and sent up a message asking to speak to Miss Prudence. He paced the floor of the front drawing room and awaited her arrival. Prudence hesitated, her hand on the door handle. She felt drained, first the encounter with Philip in the street, and now this. She'd managed to avoid him for several days, but now events were crowding in on her. She had to deal with Lord Caradice before Philip arrived, his note said in private. What did that signify? Something he would not wish to speak of in public or with a chaperone present. She hoped he wouldn't bring up the child. A true gentleman would simply never refer to it again. He wasn't like Grandpapa. He wasn't. He might not approve of her immorality, but he was kind. He wouldn't condemn her. She felt sick. He must realize she had to speak to Philip first, clear things with him before she could think about anything else. Once that was over, the clock in the hall chimed, half past one. Philip would be here in half an hour. She would have to get the interview with Lord Caradice over quickly. She didn't think she could bear it if he was still here when Philip arrived. She tidied her hair and straightened her clothes. There was a hollow ache inside her. Nerves, she told herself. She took a deep breath and quietly entered the room. Lord Caradice strode right up to her, much too close for comfort. You are pale, he exclaimed. There is no colour in your cheeks at all. I cannot help that, she responded stiffly and took a pace backward. If he so much as touched her, she would cave in completely. She had to keep her strength. He followed her, looming so close she could even smell his cologne water. His face was creased with concern. No, I know. It is my fault. And Prudence, I am so sorry for pressing you to speak about your past. Sorry for causing you distress, I mean. I cannot regret learning your story, but... I am glad you found it edifying, she said distantly, and stepped backward again. Edifying? He frowned. A strange word. But never mind that. I won't. He gave her an odd look, then closed the gap between them again. Prudence. It doesn't matter. She sidestepped him. I think it does. He followed and took her shoulders in a firm, possessive grip. Yes, of course it matters, but I meant it doesn't make any difference to me. I want you. Let me take care of you. Let me protect you. I... This was what she'd so wanted. One part of her was bursting with joy for him to say such things, for this man to want her. But she was still betrothed. She was promised to Philip. How could she speak of love with this man before she'd broken off her engagement, if indeed she could break off her engagement? She must. While I am still betrothed, I can have no answer for you. She thrust him away and retreated, panting slightly. You don't care about Otterbottom. You don't love him. 
You can't possibly love a fellow who left you in such a case and stayed away for four long years, leaving you to the mercy of... Philip is back. His jaw dropped. Back? Black brows snapped together. Where is he then? When did he arrive in England? That was the number one question, she thought. She said only, He is here, in Bath. He will be here, she glanced at the clock on the mantel, in twenty minutes. Here in Bath? He looked shocked, but recovered and said in an urgent voice, You can't possibly just pick up where you left off, Prudence. You haven't seen him since you were sixteen. If you ever did love him, it was a young girl's infatuation, that's all. And even so, if you'd been allowed any normal society, I doubt whether you would have given him the time of day. From what you and your sisters have said, your grandfather kept you all more or less as prisoners, and I've heard prisoners even befriend rats and mice. They are so lonely. Otter Boots was your rat, that's all. But you are out of your prison now, and... Otter... B Philip is not my rat, he... Only a rat would desert you when you found yourself with child imp, he continued ruthlessly. There was a short silence. She could not think of what to say. She had to speak to Philip. To break her promise to Philip now, without speaking to him first. No, she'd given him her promise. She owed him an interview at least before she fell into another man's arms. As desirable, as irresistible as those arms were. So somehow she managed to shrug, and said only, Well, he's back now. And she had no idea what to do. No excuse, he said. I would have come back. No, I wouldn't. I'd never have left you behind in the first place. His persistence was irritating, even as it warmed her heart. She wished he would just go away and let her deal with Philip, and then she would know in what case she stood. Instead, he was pushing her toward a declaration she was not ready to make. And she didn't like to be pushed, not even by Gideon. Ha! She managed. You are a notorious rake. You must have left dozens of women behind. Hundreds, even. Her voice grew a little added uncertain, and she stepped behind a small footstool. She needed to put some distance between them. A gleam of laughter crept into his eyes. Oh... By all means, hundreds, to be sure. My stamina is legendary. He prowled toward her. Well, I don't know how many. She broke off, perceiving that the conversation was in danger of descending into farce. The point is, Philip could not help leaving me. The circumstances. He could, imp. He stepped over the footstool and caught her hands in his good one. She tried to tug them away, but his grip, though gentle, was firm. He looked down at her, and the mischief died away as his eyes caressed her. These mythical hordes of women aside, I've never seduced an innocent, nor taken up with any woman who wanted more from me than a little light-hearted dalliance. Prudence just looked at him, trying to work out what he was telling her. Her head ached. Her mind was spinning. Philip would be here any minute. Gideon was rambling on about rats and seduction. Maybe she'd misunderstood his declaration. Was he trying to tell her she was only a light-hearted dalliance, too? He continued. It's not to my credit, I admit, but I've never left a woman worse off for knowing me, and I've never left any woman carrying my child. His words froze her spinning mind. Why was he telling her this? Why did he have to talk about the child again? She could not deal with this any more. She held up her hand as if to ward him off. She had to put some distance between them. Please, I beg of you, say no more on this subject. I am waiting for Philip. Until then, I can think of nothing else. You don't mean that. I do. I really, truly do. Gideon felt more worried by the minute. She was withdrawing from him. He could tell it by the look in her eyes, the stiffness of her body. What more could he say to convince her? She simply had to agree. He could not bear it if finally, after all these years, he had found his true love and she rejected him because she thought she owed a duty to Otterbury. But she was definitely pulling back. All his skills with women seemed to have deserted him. That was the trouble. She was not women. She was prudence. 
gloriously, uniquely Prudence, his beloved. He could not simply walk out now and let Otterbury keep her, for he would, Gideon knew. Seeing Prudence after all these years, Otterbury would fall in love with her all over again. He had to win her now, get in before Otterbury renewed his suit. Otterbury had all the winning cards, the ring, a promise kept for more than four years, and a child. All Gideon had to offer was the heart of a rake, a heart that, by his own admission, had never before been constant or tested in any way. His mind searched in vain for words to win her over, but he had no words he had not already said, and they had proven useless. The bard, poetry, yes, that was the language of love, but he could think of no Shakespeare except for now is the winter of our discontent. He squeezed her hands again. Forget, Otter Boots. Come to me. It was hardly poetic. Lines from Marlowe came to him, blessedly, and he quoted, Come live with me, and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove. She stared at him as if confused, and as she started to shake her head, he hastened to reassure her. Your babe can live with us, and... That blank look came into her eyes, one he was beginning to recognize. Gideon felt suddenly frantic. What is it, imp? Oh, God, I'm making such a mull of this. What have I said now? She shook her head and turned away. He followed her. Prue, speak to me. What is the matter? She put up a shaking hand as if to keep him at bay. You misunderstood. There is no child, not living. Grandpa, I, I became ill and my, she swallowed. My baby was born dead before its time. She added, I can bear no more of this. Please leave. Philip will be here any minute. She moved toward the door. He said in a ragged voice, I've never felt like this about any woman. I need you with me, Imp, more than I've ever needed anyone or anything in my life. He reached for her again, but she backed away, shaking her head in frantic denial. It was too much. There was too much filling her mind, filling her heart. She felt torn. She needed some time alone, time in which to think. I'm sorry, but I cannot. She fled from the room. Gideon walked out of his aunt's house like a sleepwalker. He was shattered, and more deeply in love than ever. A year ago he would not have believed that a woman like Prudence could exist. It was simply not in her to betray a vow. It didn't matter that she made the promise to a man who abandoned her, nor that the witnesses to her vow were dead. He thought of all the women he'd known who'd broken vows. He thought of his own mother, who made and broke promises so lightly, who cared not a snap of her fingers for the vows she had made to her husband, or the duty she owed to her son. Never mind that the man she eloped with was her own sister's husband. How could the son of a woman like that understand a woman like Prudence? He might not understand her, but oh, how he wanted her. He was a fribble. A rake, a man who had neither given nor kept a promise to a woman his entire adult life. He was shallow, selfish, and possibly even a little vain. He did not understand her. He did not deserve her. But he would not give her up, not to a creature like Otterbury. Otterbury had been given his chance to make her happy, and instead he'd left her in the most dire situation a woman could face, and in the hands of a vicious bully. Otterbury deserved no consideration. Gideon could give her up to a more worthy man, perhaps. Or perhaps not. He thought darkly. Definitely not. He wasn't giving her up to anyone. Prudence needed to be made happy. And Gideon needed to be the one who made her happy. He was the right man for the job. He was the only man for the job. And there and then, Gideon made his own vow. The first of his new adult life, it was private, without witnesses, and not even voiced aloud. But he meant it with every fibre of his being. 
he would marry Prudence Meridew and spend his life trying to give her the promise she had made to her sisters. Sunshine and laughter and love and happiness. Chapter 17 Love never dies of starvation, but often of indigestion. French proverb. The clock in the hall ticked with agonizing slowness, the hand inching toward the hour. Prudence paced back and forth on the landing above. Her head rang with echoes of the conversation with Lord Caradise. She had thought of almost nothing else since he left. Had he truly meant what she thought he had? Come live with me and be my love. It was a clear declaration. He did want her, possibly even as much as she wanted him. Two o'clock chimed. She glanced at her reflection in the looking glass and smoothed back an unruly curl. She'd made herself as neat and tidy as she could, cultivating a serene exterior. She smoothed the fabric of her dress with damp hands. She could do this. As the last golden chime died away, the doorbell jangled in the hall below her. Even as a boy, Philip had valued punctuality. It was one of his virtues. The butler, Shoebridge, glided languidly toward the entrance, stopped to adjust a floral arrangement with maddening deliberation, then, as the bell jangled again, opened the door with a dignified sweep. Prudence peered over the rails. The entrance was out of her sight, but she could hear the low murmur of masculine voices, then footsteps on the polished parquet floor, and finally Philip came into sight. He'd changed his clothes, she noticed as Shoebridge took his high-crowned beaver hat, black and silver-trimmed walking cane and overcoat before conducting him to the front drawing room. His hair was elaborately curled and pomaded in the latest style. His boots were glossy and small tassels swung from their sides. His coat fitted tightly, the shoulders warded broad and the waist nipped in tight. Philip had become a pink of the tom. She swallowed. The finale to a four-and-a-half-year prelude. She took a deep breath and slowly descended the stairs. She had been caught unawares in the street. She would do better this time. For years she had imagined Philip's return. Now all she could think of was Gideon and the words that made her heart belatedly sing. Ironic that when Gideon was uttering those very words, all she could think about was the imminent interview with Philip. She recalled his face when she had asked him to leave. Her anxiety had made her clumsy. Still, he could have, should have waited until she was free to come to him, free to say yes to him. She would make it up to him. She hugged the gloriously romantic words to her heart. Come live with me and be my love, and we shall all the pleasures prove. She had no doubt that if anyone could prove all the pleasures, it would be Gideon. She shivered as she thought of it. Further lines echoed in her head as she descended the stairs. And I will make thee beds of roses, and a thousand fragrant posies. Beds of roses. There would be an occasional thorn, no doubt, but with Gideon, who would notice, or care. Fair lined slippers for the cold, with buckles of the purest gold. She had no need of gold buckles on her slippers, a ridiculous extravagance, not to mention out of date. Besides, once she was free, she would go to him barefoot. She reached the drawing room. It was time to put aside the dream of a love without cost or judgment, of proving pleasures and lying in beds of roses with dark-eyed laughing men. First she had to face what she had done with her life. Only then could she move on. Philip. She greeted him as she entered the drawing room. My dear Prue, Philip strode across the room, placed his hands on her shoulders and kissed her carefully on each cheek. It was as if she was standing outside her body, observing the whole with dispassion. He smelled of some exotic scent, patchouli and musk perhaps. It was oddly redolent of the Duke of Dinstable's butler. How bizarre. Here she was, being embraced by her long-lost fiancé, and his scent reminded her of someone's butler. At last he released her. Ah, Prudence! Prudence! 
he exclaimed. How you have grown up. He stared at her for a moment, then placed a kiss on her lips. Prudence, feeling guilty, endured it stiffly. It was not how he'd kissed her in the past. His lips were seeking, demanding. She kept her own lips firmly closed. His ardour was very disconcerting. She hadn't expected it. She should have. As far as Philip was concerned, they were still betrothed. He loosened his grip, and Prudence stepped quickly backward. Still a shy little mouse, I see. She tried to smile, to mitigate her rejection of him. It's been such a long time, Philip. I... I'm sorry. I must say I expected a warmer welcome from you, little prudish, he said. We did a sight more than that when you were a girl, if you recall. Only once, and I didn't want it then either, she retorted. And there were such consequences of that act. She bit off the word. It was not fair to greet him with complaints and recriminations. Not after all this time. Water under the bridge. She was finished with this man. She softened her tone. I am sorry, Philip. We are not the people we once were. We need to acquaint ourselves with the people we have become. Much has happened since that day we became betrothed. He frowned. She drew the ring from the neck of her gown. I have kept your family ring safe all these years. He looked a bit nonplussed. Ah, yes. Good. This was the moment she had been waiting for. She slipped the ring off the chain and said, Philip, I'm sorry, but I cannot keep your ring any longer. I cannot marry you. There was a short silence in the room. He placed his hands on her shoulders and turned her to face him. You are breaking the betrothal, his voice was incredulous. After four and a half years of wearing my ring, she swallowed and nodded. The first promise she had ever broken. Why? She said nothing. She held the ring out to him. He took it and examined it carefully, hefting it in his hand as if gauging its weight. Solid. Well, it would have to be to have been handed down by all those female ancestors, wouldn't it? Female ancestors? Oh, yes. Indeed, yes. The ancestors. He fiddled with it, as if unsure what to do. Does Lord Derham know about this? If you mean the ring, no. I kept it hidden, as you instructed. If you mean does he know of the betrothal, no again. In any case, Grandpapa is no longer the issue. We've left his house, never to return. Yes, your sister said this morning that you'd run away. A most foolhardy thing to do, Prudence. He is your legal guardian. In a short time, he will be my guardian no longer. Once I turn one and twenty, I shall take possession of my inheritance, and we shall all be free of Grandpapa forever. But why go to these hysterical extremes and risk his displeasure? What if he should disinherit you? It is most unwise, Prudence, most unwise. Prudence stared at him in disbelief. She had told him in her letters how harshly Grandpapa treated them. She'd even told him the worst thing, the thing that she had told no one else. You know how unbearable it was living with him, she said slowly. I wrote to you often about it. You can't possibly have forgotten. Philip waved a dismissive hand. I am wise enough in the ways of the world to recognize excessive female sensibility when I see it. Prudence blinked. Excessive female sensibility. Philip, oblivious, continued. It could not have been easy for the old man, having five young females on his hands. If he was a little old-fashioned, well, that is understandable. And a little discipline never hurt anyone. Besides, he must be very old by now. He can't live for much longer. And then it will all be worth it. He's full of juice, you know, Prudence said slowly. So that is why you never responded. Now, Prue, be fair. I probably didn't get the letters you're talking about. You know how unreliable the posts are to India. Philip did not meet her eyes. In any case, if I'd done as you begged me, come home to take you all away, by the time I returned home, you would have forgotten whatever little problem it was you'd written about in the first place. A pretty fool I would have looked then. He didn't seem to realize he'd contradicted himself. He had received that all-important letter. 
so you simply ignored what I said. Now, now, Prue, don't be difficult. I was a world away. You have no idea of the hardships I was facing in India. But when I told you, the baby... She could not speak. He flushed. Hush, there is no need to talk of such indelicate matters. How it happened was unfortunate, but it was no doubt for the best. Indelicate matters? She walked over to the window and stared out of it blindly. She had wanted so badly to share her grief about the baby with him, the father, and now it seemed he felt none. She turned back suddenly. So you think we should have stayed with Grandpapa for the money, and simply overlooked his cruelty toward us? She searched his face. And it was cruelty, Philip, not a little discipline, as you call it. He shuffled his feet uncomfortably. Females are apt to exaggerate such matters. If you only knew the hardship, the privations I suffered in India, trying to make my fortune. Prudence narrowed her eyes. It's all about money with you, isn't it? You think we should have stayed for the money. You did not send for me when I needed you because you were too busy making your fortune. Were you always like this? Was I simply blind? Philip shrugged and said indulgently, now, would I bother you with weighty financial matters when we were courting? Females are well known to be impractical and unworldly. Prudence snorted, and misinterpreting, Philip hastened to reassure her. We men do find it charming, I assure you. I admit, even last year, I might have sung a different tune, for it looked like your grandfather had lost his whole fortune. The company nearly went bankrupt, you know, and we all had an anxious time of it. But then, four or five months ago, it took a sudden turn for the better, and now it is flourishing like you wouldn't believe. He is still worth buttering up, believe you me. Prudence felt queasy. How could she have ever thought this pompous, mercenary creature was the love of her life? He must have had this mercenary streak in him all along. How could she not have seen it? He did not even care about their child. He'd received the letter and simply hadn't bothered to respond. Her baby was an indelicate matter. Its death was for the best. She could barely look at him, let alone be polite to him. Rage and bitter betrayal filled her throat, threatening to boil up out of her and scold them both. She wanted to punch him, to scream at him like a virago. She was unable to speak. She had wasted years of her life, and worse, on an idol with feet of clay. A vain and shallow man to whom money was more important than prudence or their child. How could she have been so blind, so stupid? Gideon was right. Philip had been her rat. He sat down, smoothing his elegant inexpressibles, seeming oblivious of her emotional state, and glanced critically around the room. If you won't stay at Derham Court, I still don't understand why you are not with another relative. Your great uncle, for instance. These people you are staying with, have they cousined you into this bold and unbecoming independence? Because I'll have you know, I made investigations and I cannot like your being here. Not one bit. Staying with some woman you don't even know. The relict of some fellow in the Argentine. Good grief, Prudence. Don't you know any better? Prudence put a firm hold on her temper. Lady Augusta. According to my... My hosts, who are very respectable people, this Lady Augusta del Foreigner simply appeared in Bath one day. None of them had even heard of her at all before that. She's not listed in Debrett's. She is an adventuress, mark my words. Nonsense, Prudence began, but Philip swept on. I have had her pointed out to me in the street. She has a head of hair that would shame an opera dancer. He glanced at her own red hair as he spoke. And she paints her face. Lady, my foot. He sniffed. They make up titles over there, you know. Fustian, she is... He waved her assurances aside with a lofty hand. Be guided by one who has experienced a great deal more of the world than you have, Prudence. My hosts do not know her, and my own common sense has filled in the rest of the picture. Prudence folded her arms militantly. Her hands itched to box his pompous ears. Had she been totally blind at sixteen? 
It was a frightening thought to realize one could delude oneself so completely. In addition, there are serious doubts about this duke your sister is supposed to be betrothed to, Philip declared. One of my hosts is second cousin to the aunt of a duke and is in a position to know such things. They are acquainted with all the most important members of London society, and they know that while a Duke of Dinstable is listed in Debrett's, he actually lives in the far north of Scotland and never sees a soul. I think that shows you. He sat back and regarded her smugly, but when she didn't respond, he added, Your so-called Duke must be a fraud. No, he was a her... You have led Charity into a pretty pickle. I'll lay odds her betrothed is a nameless adventurer after your sister's inheritance. Poppycock, snapped Prudence. Your hosts are mistaken. They are extremely respectable, extremely well-connected, well-to-do people, Philip rebuked her. And as for Lord Caradice, my hosts have heard of him, and it's all to his discredit. Believe you me, he is notorious, Prudence. He is a rake, a rogue, and a libertine. Nonsense, Prudence retorted. He was a rake, I know, but to us he has been nothing but kind and generous. I will not have him slandered in this. You cannot be expected to understand. No doubt he has exerted his fatal charm on your feminine sensibilities. Prudence had had enough. Well, yes, actually he has. So much so that I am going to marry him. Philip's jaw dropped. He rallied quickly. So? This is at the core of it, you poor deluded creature. Rakes like Caradice don't marry girls. They seduce them and then abandon them. His blatant hypocrisy took her breath away. Prudence raised her eyebrows and stared at him in silent indignation. Philip reddened as he made the connection. That was different. I gave you a ring. That made it all right, did it? Well, now I'm giving the ring back. To marry Caradice, he scoffed and put the ring on the table. Yes. As a matter of fact, he proposed to me not an hour ago in this very room. Proposed? Or made your proposition? Proposed. Philip snorted. I did not hear the thunderclaps announcing that the world had changed. Did he actually say it in so many words? What do you mean? Of course he said it. So he actually said, will you marry me? and used words like marriage, settlement, wedding, church, bans, speak to your grandfather. Prudence tossed her head. No, but... What words did he use? Prudence did not want to share Gideon's tender words with Philip, but she was determined to defend him, make Philip understand. She said proudly, He told me he wanted me. He begged me to let him take care of me, to protect me. Nobody in her life had ever spoken such words to her. Protect you, Philip scoffed. You know what that means, don't you? To take a woman under your protection is another way of saying, make her your mistress. No, that's not what he meant. He wants to marry me. That's what you think. It's not what he said, though, is it? Philip shook his head. You are such an innocent prude. How do you think rakes seduce good girls? By making them think a wedding is in the offing. Rake Caradice is too clever to say the words that will leave him liable to a breach of promise case. If he did not say marriage or wedding or discuss settlements, take it from me, he does not mean honestly by you. He does, Prudence argued. He does mean honestly by me. I'm sure of it. You simply don't understand. I suppose you told him about the... the indiscretion. He meant her baby. Prudence held her head high. Yes, I did. He nodded. That explains it, then. Knows your used goods. No need to treat you like a virtuous girl. That's not how it is. Prudence's voice shook. You don't understand. I understand, all right. Why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? You are vulgar and disgusting. She stormed to the window and stared out, mastering her emotions. He was disgusting, of course, but his words shook her more than she wanted to admit. They echoed her earlier fears about Gideon's intentions. Outside, mist was beginning to gather. 
seeping up from the cold valleys. The unvarnished truth was that Gideon hadn't used the marriage words. He hadn't said, Will you marry me? He'd said, Come live with me and be my love. She pressed her hot cheek against the chilled glass of the window. Why had he put it that way? Why hadn't he used the simple age-old words, I love you, will you marry me? Like acid, the question slowly corroded away her earlier confidence. She turned. Philip sat, smug and righteous in his natty coat, an over-ornate tie. Her self-confidence, never very high, plummeted. Here was a living example of her ability to judge men. It was very depressing. All she could go on were her own feelings. She loved Gideon. She did. And he wanted her. She knew. But for what role? Philip had planted doubts deep enough to take root. This is what comes of running away from your grandfather. You should return there at once, where people respect you. People here respect me more than I've ever been respected. I shall never go back to the court. That man is out to seduce you, Prudence shrugged. I don't believe you. She had no intention of letting him see his doubts had affected her in any way. Philip, annoyed with her refusal to be persuaded, marched several paces back and forth across his room. His brow was furrowed as he considered the situation. So you're determined to jilt me, and for a man who is a known rake? Yes, I'm sorry, but I must. You realize it will make a total laughing stock of me? I don't know why it should, since our betrothal has been secret to all but a few. He paused, then shook his head. I have my pride, Prudence. Besides, the people I am staying with must know that there is some connection, since I have been making inquiries on your behalf. You had no need to make any inquiries. I disagree. Now how can I get through this mess with the least possible unpleasantness? I have my pride to consider. Yes, so you said, but... And since you have jilted me, I think it's only fair that you put my interests first in this. I don't wish to be embroiled in any awkwardness. I am to stay in Bath only another week. Would it be too much to ask if you stayed away from all public engagements for the next week, in order that we not meet in public, and thus cause awkward questions to be asked? I do not see why there need be any awkwardness. The betrothal was secret. He waved her objection away. Allow me to know what is best, Prudence. Besides, I have no wish to be associated in any way with the raffish and unsavoury persons with whom you have become familiar. Even as neighbours from Norfolk, we would be forced into unwelcome contact, and I do not wish to embarrass my hosts with the connection. Raffish and unsavoury? How dare you insult the kindest? He cut her off. Caradise is a man not fit for you or your sisters to associate with, and neither, I'm sure, is this bogus duke and his opera dancer aunt. Opera dancer, am I? came a melodious voice from the doorway. How delicious. I suspect I would have enjoyed being an opera dancer in my youth. They seem to have such fun. Lady Augusta sailed into the room, amusement writ large on her face. Only that sort of dancing is very strenuous and sometimes painful, I believe. After my first marriage, I found a much more agreeable outlet for my energy. She smiled, her meaning as clear and shocking as it was unstated. Philip straightened, affronted. He took in the bright hair and the vivid face, which anyone could see was no stranger to the paint box. Manners got the better of him, however, and he gave a stiff little bow. Lady Augusta looked him over her gaze lingering on the complicated neckcloth, the extremely high starched shirt points, the heavily embroidered waistcoat, and the tightly moulded coat with its nipped-in waist. Her smile deepened, and she said, I take it you are this Mr. Otterclogs we have heard so much about. Philip glared. My name is Otterbury, madam. I believe you have the advantage of me. Oh, I'm certain I do, said Lady Augusta with a soft chuckle. She sank onto the sofa in a languid swish of purple silk. Sit down, Mr. Otterbanks, sit down, she patted the sofa. Miss Meridew's long-lost betrothed needs stand on no ceremony here. Clearly appalled by this friendly invitation, Philip snapped at her. As to that, madam, Miss Meridew and I have agreed to sever our erstwhile informal agreement. Lady Augusta clapped her hands in delight. 
Well done, Prudence, my dear. My felicitations. Philip stiffened further. He turned to Prudence. This is no fit company for you. I disagree, Prudence said frostily. He said in a low, angry tone, You have become very willful, Prudence. It is not seemly in a lady. Pshaw, came a scornful voice from the sofa. Absolute tosh, Mr. Otterbanks, and if this is the way you did your courting, I am not at all surprised that you are still unwed. To Prudence's amazement, a dull red colour flooded Philip's cheeks. My marital status is none of your business, madam, he snapped. Be so good as to leave me alone with Miss Meridew, if you please. I do not please, Lady Augusta responded sweetly. I am morally responsible for this young lady, and I can see it would do her no good at all to be alone in your company. In fact, Mr. Ottertosh, she rose from the sofa, I think it is high time you departed. Shoebridge shall show you the way out. She reached for the bell pull and yanked hard. Philip drew himself up stiffly. I shall go, madam, since you demonstrate so little understanding of the ways of polite society, not that it surprises me in the least, and my name is Otterbury, not Otterbanks or Ottertosh. He turned to Prudence and said in a low, angry voice, Consider what you owe me. Your grandfather's goodwill is vital to my future. I insist you return to Derham Court. Never. Prudence grated through her teeth. He set his jaw and considered her for a short moment. In a more conciliary tone, he said, Very well. I dare say you have your reasons. At the very least, will you refrain from making any public appearances in Bath? He added in a low voice. It can do you no good to be seen in public with this woman. I assure you, Lady Augusta is of the utmost. We shall not argue. He interrupted. Promise me not to attend any social events for the moment. Your sisters too. Will you make that small concession to me at least? If you are determined to jilt me after all this time, it is the least you can do. Prudence regarded him a moment as she considered his request. Not to go to public balls and routs for a week. It was little enough to ask, and if his pride was truly lacerated by her betrayal, it might help him. Besides, they were in the throes of preparing for Charity's wedding. There will be little time for parties. She nodded. Very well, I agree. You promise? No public appearances for the next week? She nodded again, and Philip heaved a sigh of relief. Good. Then in that case I will take my leave. He made a shallow, frosty bow in the direction of Lady Augusta. Good day to you, madam. Then he allowed the waiting butler to show him out. Lady Augusta watched him leave. Her eyes narrowed. The moment the door closed behind him, she said, That man is hiding something. Mark my words. He has his own reasons for not wanting you to be seen abroad, and they have nothing to do with his being jilted, or my so-called past as an opera dancer. Prudence picked up the ring Philip had left behind. She was tempted to throw it out the window, but it was the traditional betrothal ring of the Otterbury brides. She might be furious with Philip at the moment, but she had no quarrel with the women of his family. Mrs. Otterbury had once been very kind to Prudence and her sisters. She slipped the ring back on its chain, and catching Lady Augusta's eyes, explained, I will give it back to him next time I see him. I've carried it like this all these years. A few more days won't matter. Wednesday dawned fine and warm. Prudence woke early, having slept little through the night. She lay in bed, watching sun-kissed dust motes dancing in the air. The first married you girl would be wed this day. Did Mama and Papa know? She wondered. Prue, are you awake? Charity pushed open the bedchamber door. She was barefoot and in her nightgown. I'm too excited to sleep. Can I come in with you? Of course, dearest. With one bound, Charity jumped onto the bed and snuggled down into the bedclothes. She hugged her sister exuberantly. I thought I would be nervous, but I find I cannot wait, and yet I am a little sad too. This is the last time we should be sisters in quite this way. I am about to become a married lady. Prue, can you believe it? Prudence laughed. Not only a married lady, you will be a duchess. Charity pulled a wry face. Now that part I'm not at all sure of, she confessed. 
I don't feel like a duchess. But you are sure about the Duke, aren't you? Oh yes, she said raptly. He is so wonderful, Prue, so strong and kind, and he is such a dear, gentle, lovely man. She blinked suddenly as tears formed on her long lashes. I cannot believe it, Prue, that such a man would care for me. I never thought, never believed I could be so happy. She hugged her sister convulsively. Thank you, dearest Prue, thank you. If it had not been for your bravery, I don't know what would have become of us. And now, here we are, and the sun is shining. I am so very in love and happier than I could possibly believe. You did it, Prue. You have brought me to that place you promised, and I thank you with all my heart. Prudence felt tears prickle against her own lashes as she hugged her sister to her. It was as if a load had been suddenly lifted off her shoulders. They had come through it. The grim days of Grandpapa were truly behind them. Charity was in love and about to be married. The married you girls were no longer alone and friendless. All would be well. It had to be. Lady Augusta poked her bright head around the door. Girls, girls, are you awake? Come, arise. There is so much to do. It is a perfect day for a wedding. Charity was radiant. Dressed in a celestial blue silk gown, richly trimmed with blonde lace. She was a vision to take one's breath away. It was as if she glowed from within. Her dress was the exact color of her eyes. Mama's eyes, thought Prudence. For a moment, she wished she had not sold Mama's sapphires. They would have looked perfect on charity, but she dismissed the melancholy thought. This was not a day for regrets. And had they not sold the sapphires, they could not have reached this point. They all looked beautiful, her sisters. Like a bunch of perfect blooms, faith and hope in the palest of pink dresses, both with slightly scooped necklines and feeling very grown up. Grace, like Prudence, was dressed in pale jonquil, with knots of blue ribbons around the hem. Oh, what perfect visions you all are, exclaimed Lady Augusta, herself resplendent in a gown of rich maroon and aqua, which clashed brilliantly with her hair. It is a crime, a positive crime, to waste this sight on a bunch of bath nobodies. Still, I comfort myself with the reflection that I shall attend to all of your court presentations and preside over your coming outs. Prudence glanced at her in surprise. Lady Augusta caught her look. You don't think I'm letting you go now, do you, Prudence? I haven't had such fun in years. After this wedding, I shall be Charity's aunt indeed, and therefore you shall all be my nieces. I never had children, you see. I was never blessed. And now, it's almost as good as having five daughters. She blinked rapidly and exclaimed crossly, Dratted weddings! They always make me excessively sentimental, but I shall not cry. I vow it. If I do, this lamp-black concoction will run, and then I shall look a sight. She glanced at Prudence and winked. Well, you don't think these dark lashes are natural, do you? Prudence laughed. I never gave it any thought, ma'am. Lady Augusta turned to Charity. Now, my dear, here is something old and something borrowed. I was married in it in Argentina, a gift from my husband. It was his mother's. She produced a magnificent handmade white mantilla, laid it carefully over Charity's shining locks, and stood back. Perfect, my dear, just perfect. You look like an angel. Oh dear, I should never have darkened my lashes. She pulled a wisp of lace-edged cambric and carefully applied it to her eyes. Now, the something new is your gown, and I must say the dressmaker has done us proud, my dears. I hadn't dreamed we would find someone so capable in this town, at such short notice. It is also something blue, piped up Grace, so that's everything. No, not quite, my dear. My nephew Caradice sent these around this morning, said Miss Prudence would wish her sister to go to her bridal wearing these stones. And she drew from a box a sapphire necklace and matching earrings. Prudence stared. But they are... they are... She was unable to speak for emotion. How had he known? How could he have guessed what this would mean to her, to all of them? Mama's sapphires, 
said Charity softly. She turned to her younger sisters and explained. Mama was married in these. They were her wedding gift from Papa. Now we shall have Mama and Papa with us at my wedding. How kind of Lord Caradice to send for them. Did you ask him to, Prue? Prudence just shook her head, her heart too full to speak. Now, here are the carriages to take us to the Abbey, said Lady Augusta briskly. In you get, girls. Grace and the twins in the first one with me, and Prudence and the bride in the second one. Wait a few minutes before you set off, Prudence. The bride should always be a little late. Oh, but ma'am, Charity exclaimed. Nonsense. It's good for the groom to be made to wait. Men need to be kept on their toes, ladies. Remember that. Never let them take you for granted. Bath Abbey glowed in the sunshine. The bishop had agreed to perform the ceremony and stood at the altar, gorgeous in his embroidered vestments. Edward awaited the arrival of his bride, pale, neat, and anxious. Gideon lounged next to him. The doors opened. The organ music swelled, filling the huge vaulted abbey with magnificence. Neither Edward nor Gideon noticed. They each had eyes only for their beloved ones. Prudence's eyes clung to Gideon. She wanted to thank him, to tell him what his gesture of the sapphires had meant to her, to them all. But the wedding began, and the moment was lost. The bishop began the service with a long and rambling sermon about the holy estate of matrimony and the solemn commitment it was. It seemed to go on forever. The attention of his small captive congregation soon wandered. In such a huge and venerable church, Prudence felt small and insignificant in the scheme of things. Oddly enough, it was a comforting feeling. Her mind was filled with Gideon. His eyes caressed her. She tried to avoid his gaze. She needed to talk to him, to have it clear between them what he wanted of her, but she couldn't discuss such things at her sister's wedding. She was aware of every slight shift and nuance in his posture. Was Philip right? Would this be the closest she would ever get to standing in front of the altar with Lord Caradice? The bishop rambled on and on, and at one point surprised Prudence in a huge yawn. She'd hardly slept the night before. Embarrassed, she tried to pay better attention. Finally, the bishop uttered the familiar words. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? It was her cue. Prudence took a breath and stepped forward. As elder sister, and in the absence of male relatives, she would give away the bride. I, I do, a ringing voice echoed from the back of the church. With one accord, the entire wedding party swung around. Great Uncle Oswald, and indeed, it was Great Uncle Oswald himself, dressed in his finest morning suit, his hat tucked under his arm as he strode down the aisle, his face wreathed with smiles. Great Uncle Oswald, here in Bath. And how could he know to come here, to the Abbey, at this time? Prudence swung around and met Lord Caradice's gaze with a silent question. Had he told Great Uncle Oswald? Lord Caradice shook his head. It seemed he was as surprised as anyone. Had Grandpapa come too? Prudence was filled with misgiving. Great Uncle Oswald was beaming, she told herself. Could she trust his smiles? He'd said, I do. It wouldn't be a trick, would it? Her anxious gaze swept the church behind him. Nobody followed him in. Grandpapa? Prudence asked as he reached the small wedding party assembled at the altar. Great Uncle Oswald shook his head and patted her shoulder. Safely back at court, he said in a low voice. Doesn't know anything about this little aff. He stopped suddenly. Good God! Is that Gussie Mangum? I thought she was in Argentina. Er, uh, yes, I suppose it is, if you mean Edward and Gideon's aunt, Lady Augusta Montigua del Fuego, Prudence said, considerably surprised by the sudden change of subject. Where is her husband? whispered Great Uncle Oswald. I believe she was widowed last year and returned to England some months ago, responded Prudence distracted. Great Uncle Oswald, how did you know about the wedding? How did you find us? Widowed, eh? muttered Great Uncle Oswald. He raised his voice. Well, let's get on with it, Chuffy. I've already said I'd give this beautiful great niece of mine in marriage, so let's finish this wedding. 
to everyone's amazement, the immensely dignified bishop responded mildly. If you've finished nattering, Ozzy, I shall. Thought you'd never get here. Never bored a congregation so badly in my life. He winked at Prudence, then returning to his usual sonorous tone, continued with the wedding service. Prudence blinked. Chuffy and Ozzy. The bishop's sprawling speech had been a delaying tactic. He must have sent for Great Uncle Oswald. But how did he know they'd run away? And why send for Great Uncle Oswald and not Grandpapa? And why was Great Uncle Oswald suddenly more interested in Lady Augusta than in his great niece's runaway wedding? It was all very confusing. Chapter 18 Now join your hands, and with your hands, your hearts. William Shakespeare Goodbye! Goodbye! The carriage rumbled away down the street, piled high with baggage. The Duke of Dinstable and his brand new Duchess, waving from the windows. Prudence, the twins, and Grace spilled out into the street, calling farewells and exhortations to write. Lady Augusta and Great Uncle Oswald watched from the steps of the house. Lord Caradice leaned against the railings of his own house, watching the departure an odd, twisted smile on his face. Prudence wondered for a fleeting moment what that look betokened, but the excitement of her sister's departure pushed it from her mind. They watched until the coach swung out of sight. Feeling suddenly bereft, Prudence turned instinctively toward Gideon. She had barely spoken a word to him at the wedding, and Charity and the Duke's decision to set out for Scotland immediately had meant an abbreviated wedding breakfast much to Lady Augusta's frustration. It was the first real opportunity to speak to Lord Caradice. But how did you ask a man whose wonderful gesture had brought magic to your sister's wedding day, if he wanted to make you his mistress? And if he did, what would she say? She needed to repay him for the sapphires, too. She hoped she had enough money left. Before she could speak to him, however, Great Uncle Oswald called her over. Now, young Missy, I think you have some explaining to do. Shall we step into the sitting room, and over a soothing cup of tea, you shall explain to me why the deuce you didn't tell me you'd run off from the court in the first place? Tea? Great Uncle Oswald? Prudence asked in an effort to distract him. I thought you didn't approve of tea. I've given Gussie's cook a packet of my best chamomile, so enough roundaboutation, Miss, and into the house with you. Meekly, Prudence preceded him into Lady Augusta's house. You were protecting me, uttered Great Uncle Oswald in amazement. You thought I was dependent on my brother. Aren't you? Prudence asked, puzzled. He was always complaining of how much it cost to keep you. He what? Great Uncle Oswald's eyebrows rose. And your extravagant ways? He snorted. Well, that I can believe. Always was the nip-farthingest fellow when it came to spending money on the good things in life. But when it came to business, now... Business? Prudence repeated. I thought his business was highly successful. Ha! Snorted Great Uncle Oswald. Was, until he and I parted ways more than ten years ago. Without me to prevent his wild schemes and mad speculation, the company went steadily downhill. No head for business at all, you know. Throws good money after bad on the most ludicrous ventures. But... He shook his head again in wonder. Can't get over it. You were protecting me. Five little girls running off to who knew where, exposing yourselves to horrible danger, only to protect me. He took out a large handkerchief and blew noisily into it. Prudence was touched. Of course we wanted to save you from Grandpapa's wrath, Great Uncle Oswald. He was forever reading of your appearance at some society event, and he would invariably rant and rave and threaten to cut you off without a penny. And then when we came to you, he was so kind and generous toward us, taking us in without a murmur, and it can't have been easy for you. But it was delightful, my dear, Great Uncle Oswald said, shocked. Don't know when I've enjoyed so much excitement as I have since you girls came to enliven my home. My life was dwindling into lonely old age before you arrived. He blew his nose again, a long, quavering trumpet of emotion. Touched, Prudence prompted him into less emotional waters. Uh, the business, Great Uncle Oswald. You were saying it was failing. Oh, I couldn't let the family company fail. 
Bad business for a start, even if it was nothing to do with me. Bad for all of us. Employees who've been with us thirty years and more. Bought out your grandfather a few months back. Flatter myself, it's on the up and up now. Philip had said much the same thing, Prudence recalled, only he had not mentioned Great Uncle Oswald at all. Do your employees know of your involvement in the company now? She asked. No. No need to make a fuss of things. Don't like it widely known I'm in trade at all, though it did get me my handle. Your handle? Prudence was puzzled. Well, good gracious, girl, don't you remember anything from your schoolroom lessons? I'm Sir Oswald Meridew, ain't I? The younger son of a baron ain't usually a knight, is he? He sat back in his chair with a satisfied air. No. Nothing of mine came to me from my father or my brother. Earned it all myself, including the knighthood. He noticed Prudence's confusion and explained. Services to the crown. Say no more. And laid his finger along the side of his nose. Prudence sat back in her chair, astounded. So, you do not depend on Grandpapa's charity? Great Uncle Oswald snorted. I should say not. Boots on the other foot, if you want to know the truth. Old fool speculations let him without a feather to fly with. Was in debt to his eyebrows, until I towed him out of the river tick. Grandpapa was in debt? Prudence was stunned. So you have supported us all along, even before we came to London. We owe you so... Nonsense, nonsense. Owe me nothing at all. Such foolishness. He blustered in embarrassment. What else am I going to do with my money, eh? Childless old widower like myself. It'll all come to you girls in the end, so don't fret about anyone owing anything, my dear. But if anyone's a pensioner on somebody's charity, tis your grandfather. And so I told him when he arrived in London last week, blowing sound and fury. He snorted again. Sent him packing back to Derham with a flea in his ear, and a warning that if he left court again without an invitation from me, I'd be cutting him off without a penny. He glared at Prudence indignantly. Do you know? He was making threats against you that would make your hair curl. Has he done that before? Laid a finger on any of you girls? Prudence could not speak for the relief flowing through her. She jumped up and hugged Great Uncle Oswald fervently. She had been half expecting Grandpapa to arrive at any minute. Instead, he was back at the court to stay. She felt so much lighter and freer. Charity was married and happy. Grandpapa was no longer a threat to them, and their future, for the first time in years, looked rosy. She felt Great Uncle Oswald's hand patting her on the back, soothing, awkward, a little uncertain. She collected herself and stepped back. Well, Missy, did he mistreat you? His kind old face was crumpled with worry, and not a little guilt. She didn't want to lie any more, now that the need to lie had passed. On the other hand, to tell this sweet man how terribly Grandpapa had treated them would make him even more upset than he was. He would feel responsible and be racked with guilt. She could see no point in raking up old grievances. Better to let it go. He was a harsh disciplinarian, she said, recalling Philip's view of the matter. But then, having five young girls to deal with probably tried his patience severely. Let us talk of him no more, dear Great Uncle Oswald. Or should I call you Great Uncle Ozzy? You are very sneaky, you know, turning up like that at the Abbey. He chuckled. Surprised you, didn't I? Thing is, went to school with old Chuffy. Can't believe he's turned into a bishop of all things. Was a shocking loose screw at school. Anyway, when Dinstable and Young Charity applied for the license, Chuffy smelled a rat. Recognized the name, of course. Knew I had my great nieces staying with me in London, so wondered how one of them came to be in Bath applying for a wedding license. Sent me a note, and I came post haste. Can't have you girls getting married without me here to give you away, can I? His smile died away, and he pursed his lips in a dissatisfied pout. Didn't think much of the wedding itself, though, Prudence. The Abbey is a fine big church, and good to have a bishop do the deed, but apart from that, a bit of a hole-in-the-corner affair for a duke and a diamond like your sister, if you don't mind me saying so, my dear. Oh, but it was exactly how Charity and Edward wanted it, Prudence assured him, small and private, with only family present. I know Charity was thrilled you came. We all were. She rose from her chair and kissed him warmly on the cheek. You are very dear to us all, you know. 
He pulled out the handkerchief again and blew another long emotional blast. You're a dear good girl yourself, and when we fire you and Caradice off, we'll do it in grand style. What? St. George's, Hanover Square, and we'll have Chuffy down to officiate. He looks good in purple, have to say it. And then a ball to celebrate. And, of course, a ball beforehand to announce the engagement. When was it that the Welsh great-aunt died again? Caradice's mourning should be done by then, surely. Prudence swallowed. The time had come for her to confess the betrothal to Lord Caradice had been a stratagem. Not a very nice stratagem, she thought guiltily, looking at the beaming elderly man before her. He was such a dear. He would feel dreadful to discover his well-meaning effort to get her settled before letting her beautiful sisters loose on society had, in fact, been a source of much anxiety to them all. She opened her mouth. But Great Uncle Oswald, clasping his damp handkerchief, smiled at her with such benevolent affection that she could not do it. And with her future relationship with Lord Caradice still unclear, she could not leave things as they were. Lord Caradice and I have quarrelled, she blurted. There will be no wedding in Hanover Square or anywhere else, I'm afraid. There. It was out. Not the whole truth, but enough. To her amazement, Great Uncle Oswald only chuckled and tucked his handkerchief away. Pooh! Lover's tiff, he said. Happens to all newly betrothed couples. Once the initial excitement wears off. What happened? Caradice balking at the prospect of a parson's mousetrap. Shouldn't let it worry you. Fellow was a rake. Bound to feel a few qualms about relinquishing his freedom, but... Prudence shook her head. No, it wasn't that. You, is it? Getting cold feet? Now that does surprise me. A rake now, that's understandable, but you? He peered at her shrewdly. Not getting missish on me, are you, Prudence? If it's, uh, conjugal matters worrying you, Gussie will set you right. No, no, she assured him, embarrassed to find herself discussing such matters with an elderly male. Great Uncle Oswald shook his head decisively. In that case, just a tiff. Mark my words. Boy was smitten. Swear to it on my life, and the glow in your face whenever Caradice walks in the door, my dear, could light a candle with it. Oh, dear Lord, had she been so obvious? That was what came of Gideon's way of looking at a girl as if... as if she were the only girl alive in the world, as if she were the only one he cared about. It was those velvet dark eyes of his that did it, made a girl feel special, loved, cherished wanted yes but what did wanted mean if gideon didn't plan to marry her she wouldn't allow him to be trapped into it by her own scheming and her own well-meaning great uncle's enthusiasm she bit her lip i'm sorry great uncle oswald but our betrothal lord caradice's and mine is definitely off and now i must i must retire for a moment thank you for coming to the wedding and you cannot know what a relief it is to me that you have dealt with Grandpapa for us. So thank you for that, as well. She kissed him on the cheek again, and hurried from the room. What a tangled web she had woven herself into. She had just severed two betrothals. No wonder her head ached. She hesitated. Upstairs was her bed, narrow and cold and private. Lord Caradise would be with the others in the front parlour. She needed to talk to him, but at the moment there would be no chance to be private. There was a wedding to reminisce about, and Great Uncle Oswald's arrival to exclaim over. She would have to sit there politely, as if the doubts were not burning her up inside, chatting of trifles while his dark eyes caressed her and his honey tongue teased. She turned toward the stairs. What she needed was a cup of hot chocolate and a good cry. We have been invited to a small party this evening by my old friend, Maud, Lady Gosforth, announced Lady Augusta, brandishing a note that had just arrived. It was the day after the wedding, and they were all sitting in the parlour after tea. I knew Maudie in the old days, before I left for Argentina. I haven't seen her for eons. Her note says she arrived in Bath a day or two ago, and has just this minute learned I was here. She sent this round, urging me to come and saying if I had house guests, to bring them too. She set down the note on the mantelpiece. How delightful! 
Maury was always the one to know all the latest gossip. Oswald, you know Lady Gosforth, don't you? Should say I do. All the world knows Maudie. It is exactly what we all need. A little entertainment to cheer us up, for there is nothing worse than a wedding without a proper party to make one feel sadly flat. Girls, you must come too. Not you. I'm sorry, Grace dear. You are too young as yet. But faith and hope certainly, for though you are not yet out, a small private party in Bath in the home of a family acquaintance is perfectly common for. Now hurry along, girls. We leave at eight. Oswald, may I request your escort? Great Uncle Oswald bowed. Delighted to, Gussie, my dear. Delighted. I shall go next door and change immediately. The Duke had given him the use of his house while he and Charity were away, so it was only natural that Lady Augusta had invited him in to tea. Lord Caradice, too, had been invited, but to Prudence's relief, some other engagement, or discretion had kept him away. She didn't know whether she wanted to see him or not. How could she keep him at arm's length to talk, when all she wanted was to throw herself into his arms? Faith and Hope followed Great Uncle Oswald from the room, excitedly discussing which dresses to wear. Prudence rose uncertainly. She had promised Philip she would not go about socially in Bath for a week, and there were three more days to go. Could a small private party be called in public? No, Prudence decided, and Philip's doubts about the respectability of Lady Augusta and the Duke had always been nonsensical. In any case, she would have the escort of Great Uncle Oswald, and nothing could be more respectable than that. Prudence went upstairs to change into a party dress. You look beautiful, my Prudence, a deep voice said as she came down the stairs a little before eight. But then you always do. She looked down at him, Gideon, Lord Caradice, gazing up at her, his dark hair gleaming. His eyes were dark and warm upon her. Her throat tightened, and she felt suddenly close to tears. Of course, it was just his way, but, oh, when he looked at her like that, with that midnight gaze that caressed and heated her from within, she truly felt beautiful. And her dress really was beautiful deep blue with a silver tissue overlay and silver trim. Thank you, she murmured. I didn't realize you were coming too, Lord Caradice. How did you ask a man? Oh, by the way, did you ask me to marry you the other day, or were you merely suggesting I become your mistress? Formality was the key to surviving this, she hoped. He stood at the foot of the stairs, smiling faintly, dressed in black satin knee breeches, striped stockings, a white waistcoat and a black waisted coat with long tails, looking darkly elegant. He must have dispensed with the bandage, for nothing spoiled the line of that elegant coat. The thought gave her relief. He was healing from the injury she had done him. Nobody else had yet come down. His long, angular face was freshly shaved, but retained that dark tint she found so attractive in him. Her skin tingled with remembrance of the sensual abrasion of those dark bristles. A faint, pleasurable frisson passed through her. Holding the banister rail, she managed to resume her progress down the stairs, hoping the heat in her cheeks did not betoken that glow Great Uncle Oswald had spoken of. Yes, Aunt Gussie sent a note around, informing me there was to be a small party and that I was required for escort duty. I did not dare refuse. A terrifying creature when crossed, my aunt. I've noticed, said Prudence dryly. Even as a lump rose in her throat, he knew she was feeling awkward after their last encounter and was talking nonsense to spare her. He strode forward as she reached the last few steps and took her hand, as if she were some fragile, delicate creature. Through her evening gloves, she felt his strength, his warmth. He took the silver tissue cloak, that was draped across her arm, shook it out and swung it around her, wrapping her in it and him. His arms were around her, and before she realized what he was about to do, he'd planted a soft kiss on the nape of her neck. A shiver passed through her entire body, and it was all Prudence could do not to lean back into his embrace. She forced herself to resist, saying in a voice that squeaked with tension, Could we talk privately tomorrow morning, please? Of course. 
he added in a low, sincere voice. Fear not, Imp. I'll importune you no more tonight. I did not mean to distress you just now, but you look so very lovely. Like an angel in a silver cloud. I could not help myself. I apologize. Prudence had no idea what to say. Just as the silence was stretching to uncomfortable limits, she recalled she owed him a debt of thanks. I must thank you for sending us the sapphire necklace. I don't know how you retrieved it, or how you knew which one to retrieve of all the jewelry I sold. She gazed up at him. It was the very sapphire set my mother wore at her wedding, and it meant such a lot to charity, and to me, for her to wear it. I will, of course, repay. His face twisted. Oh, don't, Imp. You know I don't want. Just then the twins clattered noisily down the stairs, dressed in pale yellow muslin and calling for Lord Caradice to admire them. This he did with alacrity, and her sisters were delighted by his lavish and very silly compliments. Grace hung over the banister, watching them a little wistfully. Lord Caradice glanced up and noticed her. Greetings, young Lim, he called up to her. I thought tomorrow afternoon we might visit a fair. There is one to be held in a village not far from here. Would you care to accompany me? Grace called down her assent, her eyes shining. Prudence bit her lip. Of course, he would offer her little sister some sort of consolation for being left out of the party. He was Gideon. How could anyone resist him? Lady Augusta descended the stairs in a wonderfully low-cut gown of emerald-shot satin, and a black and gold shawl draped in the Spanish manner. Around her neck was a necklace of golden emeralds. When Great Uncle Oswald arrived, he snatched his hat off and gazed at her in stunned admiration, muttering, Magnificent, begad! Magnificent! Gideon nudged Prudence, and she followed his amused gaze to where Lady Augusta was adjusting her shawl with a great deal of nonchalance and a self-satisfied little smile. Are we all ready to leave? said Lady Augusta. Then let us do so at once. Even though the evening was fine, and Lady Gosford's home only a short walk away, Lady Augusta had augured a sedan chair to carry her. I know, they are a little passé, she explained to the girls. But I always loved the look of these things when I was a girl. It looks so marvellous. A lady being carried along in a palanquin like an oriental princess, with her chichis base strolling along beside her, carrying her fan. Drat it! Forgot to bring the fan. Never mind. Oswald, you're my chief chichis beau. Pretend there is a fan, will you? To Prudence's astonishment, he chuckled coyly and pretended to carry an invisible fan. The twins exchanged glances and giggled. And indeed, it was like an oriental procession, with Lady Augusta reclining in the palanquin, carried by four liveried servants, followed by Great Uncle Oswald, who was flanked on either side by a twin in yellow muslin, then Prudence on Lord Caradice's arm, and bringing up in the rear, James the Footman. They turned the corner. I thought you said it was to be a small party, ma'am, exclaimed Prudence. Dozens of people milled in front of Lady Gosforth's house, some awaiting entry to the house, others simply there to watch. Lady Gussie peered out of the palanquin. Small, by Maud's standards, I meant. You didn't think I would bring you to something insipid, did you? Prudence had to laugh, but it crossed her mind that this might indeed be what Philip meant by in public. It was too late now, however, for they had reached the front door. Inside, despite the unfashionable early hour, it was a sad crush, by which Prudence was given to understand the party was already a success. The entry foyer and large withdrawing room were filled with people talking and laughing and exclaiming. Lady Gosforth, a tall, Roman-nosed matron, stood at the foot of the stairs, greeting her guests. Prudence thought she looked rather stern and intimidating. Then Lady Gosforth's gaze fell upon them. Gussie! she shrieked. Mordy! All formality disappeared as the two middle-aged ladies embraced like excited schoolgirls, chattering nineteen to the dozen. However, the press of new guests arriving soon forced Lady Gosforth to return to her duties. But stay here with me, Gussie dearest, and I shall introduce you to everyone, 
It's been such an age since you were in England that you must be quite out of touch. She glanced at Lord Caradice, who had reclaimed Prudence's hand and replaced it on his arm the moment she had completed her curtsy. Her shrewd blue eyes dwelt thoughtfully on Prudence, then travelled to her sisters. I see you have lost no time in meeting the latest beauties on the scene, Caradice. Sir Oswald, my congratulations. These twin angels of yours will cause a sensation when they come out. Enjoy my little party, girls. Gussie, stay with me. I want to hear all about everything. Gussie agreed enthusiastically and sent the girls and Gideon on ahead, promising to join them later. It was very crowded in the front drawing room. As they shuffled their way forward, the crowd separated Great Uncle Oswald from them. Lord Caradice cut Prudence's elbow in a protective grip and steered her through the crush, the twins following in their wake. He was greeted by dozens of people, most of them ladies. Numerous gentlemen, their eyes passing from hope to faith and back again, also pressed forward, recalling their acquaintanceship with Lord Caradice and demanding introductions to the new beauties. Eventually, they reached a much less crowded room, with French doors standing open, leading out to the terrace and down to the garden. On either side was a shallow alcove, where a number of chairs had been placed. If you care to wait here, said Lord Caradice, I shall procure refreshments. A glass of champagne, Miss Meridue? Rather fear for you, I'm afraid, Miss Hope and Miss Faith. He had been on his best formal behaviour. Prudence wondered why it made her feel so lonely. Given her doubts, formality was the safest, least distressing path, but it made her feel a little melancholy all the same. She was not at all in the mood for a party. She watched as he disappeared into the crowd. Instantly a small group of gentlemen surrounded them. They crowded around the twins, pelting them with questions, vying for the beauty's attention. Prudence was quickly relegated to the outer. She felt like the chaperone she had intended to be. But she had had a taste of being wooed, and returning to the role of the plain one was harder than she had expected. Not that she wanted any of these young men to court her. There was only one man she wanted. She prayed he wanted her in the same way, until that was resolved. She moved aside and took pleasure in watching her young sisters enjoy their very first social success. Hope, in particular, had yearned for this for so long. She was no longer the clumsy, defiant girl of Derham Place. Now she was a beacon of loveliness and grace, growing in poise by the minute. Faith, too, was in her element, glowing with shy excitement. Was it only a little over six weeks ago they'd been imprisoned at Derham, subject to Grandpapa's harsh tyranny? An event such as tonight had been a hopeless dream then, and in a matter of days it would be Prudence's birthday. Prudence! What are you doing here? It was Philip, looking appalled. Prudence offered him an apologetic smile and started to explain, but Philip cut her off. I thought I could rely on your promise, and look! You are here when I specifically forbade it. You do not have the power to forbid me anything, Prudence retorted. I admit, I agreed to forego public events for a week, but I understood this to be a small private party. At least, that's what Lady Augusta told me. Do you know the harm you have caused by coming here? You must leave immediately. I will do no such thing. There is no harm, Philip. You are overreacting. Nobody knows of our... our past. He cast a hasty glance around the room. You must leave. Trust me on this, Prudence. You have no idea how mortifying it would be for me if you are seen here with such a woman. Poppycock. She is an old friend of Lady Gosforth's, and I will not leave particularly when the twins are having such a lovely time. Her voice softened. Look, Philip. See how happy they are. It is their first grown-up party. Their first party of any sort, in fact, and I will not spoil it for them. Oh, Lord, she cannot be a friend of Lady Gosford's. You must leave now. If you do not, it will jeopardize everything I have worked for. Prudence clenched her fists. I will not leave. You are too fearful of idle gossip. I assure you, Lady Augusta is of the utmost respectability. Philip glared at her in frustration and anger. Prudence glared back. Greetings, my bantams, said an amused voice at Prudence's elbow. Your champagne, Miss Meridue. Lord Caradice handed her a tall glass, 
glanced from her to Philip, and gave her a quizzical look. Will you not introduce us, Miss Meridue? Lord Caradice, Mr. Otterbury, Prudence said boldly. Lord Caradice gave an affected start of surprise, and seized Philip's hand to shake it. Let me be the first to congratulate you on your incredible escape, Mr. Otter Shanks. Prudence almost choked. Philip's escape? From Prudence? She hadn't yet told him she'd broken their betrothal. The devil was in his smile. She trusted him not an inch. She looked daggers at him. Lord Caradice smiled blandly back at her. Philip bowed stiffly. My name is Otterbury, your servant, Lord Caradice. He glanced at Prudence, then added in a suspicious tone. Escape from what, may I ask? Why, from the tiger, of course. Lord Caradice took a leisurely sip of champagne. Philip stared. I beg your pardon? Prudence suddenly realized what he was talking about. She pressed her lips together and tried to keep a straight face. Lord Caradice frowned. Was it an elephant? That was it, yes. You were sat on by an elephant. I must say, you've recovered well. It hardly shows. Of course, your head is rather an odd shape, but no one would ever suspect it was the elephant, I assure you. A small snort of laughter escaped Prudence. She tried to turn it into a cough. Miss Meridue, you must be careful of the bubbles in champagne, Lord Caradice said solicitously. Philip stiffened even more. I have no idea what you're talking about. I understood you'd been eaten by a tiger or squashed by an elephant, and yet here you are, Gideon smiled affably. I don't suppose you'd care to tell us the tale of your escape. He tucked Prudence's hand through his arm and regarded Philip with every evidence of fascination. Philip focused on the hand and frowned. He glanced at the door again. Miss Meridue, it is time you left. The company is... He shot a significant glance at Lord Caradice. Inappropriate, Prudence explained. Mr. Otterbury wishes me to go home, Lord Caradice. He's afraid my presence here tonight with your aunt and yourself will reflect badly on him. Lord Caradice turned to Philip in mild surprise. On you? My, my hostess is a relative of Lady Gosforth, Philip said stiffly, and I was concerned her ladyship would be unsettled by the look in Lord Caradice's eye, he faltered. Lady Gosforth is the aunt of a duke, you know, he finished feebly. Yes, I know. She and Aunt Gussie have been friends for years, Gideon explained in a friendly fashion. He added, Aunt Gussie is the aunt of a duke too, and was once the sister-in-law of one. Ah, Philip said in a strangled tone. Mr. Otterbury suspects the Duke of Dinstable is an impostor, Prudence offered helpfully. Philip made faint noises of embarrassed denial. No. Is he? An impostor? Lord Caradice was enchanted. I shall tell Lady Gosforth at once. She is his godmother, you know. How exciting. Puce with mortification, Philip ran a finger around his collar. I must have been misinformed. I hope you haven't taken offence, my lord. Oh no, not at all, Ottershanks. Any friend of Miss Meridue is a friend of mine. She's the sister-in-law of a duke, you see. Otterbury, croaked Philip. And I'm a duke's cousin, and was once the nephew of a duke before he died. Do dead dukes count? Philip mumbled something and bowed again. Prudence buried her nose in champagne. There you are, Prudence. Caradice? A voice said from behind. Wondered where you'd got to? Twins seem to be having a good time of it. There's dancing in the back parlour, Prudence, if you and Caradice want to join in. I'll keep an eye on the girls here. He noticed Philip edging inconspicuously away. How'd you do, sir? Philip bowed swiftly and turned to leave. So Prudence took great pleasure in calling him back and introducing him as a gentleman recently returned from India. India, eh? Have a few interests there myself. And what were you doing in India, young Otterbury? Ah, Maudie, Gussie, here you are, Great Uncle Oswald said. Prudence and Caradise are off to dance. I suppose I should come with you then, Lady Augusta said. No need for that, Gussie, Great Uncle Oswald stopped her. Betrothed couple don't need chaperone in at a private party. 
A betrothed couple? Lady Gosforth exclaimed. Caradice is betrothed? Ha! Surprised you, did I, Maudie? Thought you were always ahead of the news, didn't you? Betrothed? Philip sounded shocked. No, no, Prudence insisted. It is a mistake. I am not betrothed to Lord Caradice. Yes, you are. Great Uncle Oswald contradicted her. No, I told you it was off. Prudence darted a guilty look at Lord Caradice. I'm sorry. Nonsense, Great Uncle Oswald declared. A tiff, that's all. Two of you were smelling of April and May on the way here tonight. No, we were not, Prudence said despairingly. Truly, we were not. Actually, I thought you smelled of gardenias, Lord Caradice said. And I was wearing a cologne scented faintly with sandalwood. It may have worn off, it is very subtle. But you definitely smelled of gardenias and moonlight. She gave him a wrathful look, which he returned with a limpid smile. Prudence felt like shaking him. She was embroiled in a stew of her own making, admittedly, and all he could do was say she smelled of gardenias and moonlight. The foolish man. Did he want to be trapped into having to marry her? Philip muttered so that only Prudence could hear him. So your uncle has forced his hand, eh, Prudence? Well done. Prudence winced. Instantly the humour left Lord Caradice's eyes. Got something to say, Clotterbury? Spit it out. If you don't like Prudence being betrothed to me, tell it to my face. I am not betrothed to you, Prudence wailed. Course you are. Great Uncle Oswald contradicted her. But what's it got to do with young Clotterbury, eh? Clotterbury, explain yourself. Philip's mouth opened and closed silently, like a codfish. When did this betrothal happen? Lady Augusta demanded, distracting Great Uncle Oswald's attention from Otterbury, who heaved a sigh of relief. Several weeks back, Caradice came calling on me in his court and clothes, asked my permission. I gave it, betrothed all right and tight. Not publicly announced yet, because of his Welsh aunt, of course. Rake Caradice caught at last, Lady Gosforth exclaimed with delight. Why didn't I know about this, Gideon? Lady Augusta demanded, clearly aggrieved at not being first with the news. And what Welsh aunt is this? Auntie Anne Harrod, Gideon informed her solemnly. Lady Augusta thought for a moment and then declared, You don't have an Auntie Anne Harrod? No, he agreed in a sorrowful voice. She is dead. Seeing that the conversation was heading down an impossible path, Prudence declared in a loud voice, Lord Caradice and I are not betrothed and never were. She turned to him, her eyes beseeching him to rescue her. It is all a misunderstanding, isn't it, Lord Caradice? He just looked at her, a small odd smile on his face. His eyes were dark and suddenly serious. Their audience fell silent, awaiting his answer. Prudence suddenly realized he was not going to save her. He was going to be stupidly noble and confirm the betrothal story to protect her reputation. But she couldn't allow him to become entrapped by a public declaration at a party held by one of the Tom's biggest gossips. It was not fair. She had entangled him in so many lies of her making. It was time she set him free. Set them all free by telling the truth. The only man I have ever been betrothed to is Philip Otterbury she announced loudly. Remembering she still carried his ring on a chain, she pulled it out of her bosom. See? This is the ring he gave me. There was a small, shocked silence. With one accord, the group swung around to stare at Philip, who looked as if he'd just swallowed a snail. Clotterbury? Great Uncle Oswald exploded. But you've only just met the fellow. You can't possibly prefer him to Gideon. Lady Augusta exclaimed. Oh, but this is delicious, began Lady Gosforth. Be quiet, Maud, snapped Great Uncle Oswald and Lady Augusta in unison. Philip gaped at this disrespect for the aunt of a duke, then shrank, realizing everyone was staring at him with varying degrees of hostility. Is this true, Clotterbury? He gave a sickly smile and hesitated, not knowing what to say. Yes, it is true. Prudence came forward and took his hand. He tried to pull away, but she wouldn't let him. She held up the ring. See? This is the traditional betrothal ring of the Otterbury family. 
Philip swallowed. All eyes were upon him. He tried to speak, found no words came out, cleared his throat, and said finally, Actually, it's not. Not? Prudence stared at him in shock. But you told me it was handed down for generations. Philip shook his head, looking a little green. It's not, he swallowed. It's a ring I got from a pawnbroker, made of paste. Prudence blinked, trying to take it in. You cannot be serious. I've carried this ring for more than four years, she whispered. She looked at Philip, but he wasn't looking at her. He was looking altogether green. Paste? From a pawnbroker? Gideon met her stricken gaze, knowing what the ring had meant to her. She'd carried that blasted ugly thing on a chain for more than four years, like a ball and chain, courted her grandfather's wrath by doing so, and had even risked her life with a highwayman over it. Almost. A worthless old piece of trumpery from a pawnbroker. A symbol of love from a weasel. Damn Otterbury to hell and back. Gideon strode forward, snatched the ring from Prudence's slackened grasp, gave it to Otterbury and said, That's enough, I think. A foolish charade, my prudence, but that's enough. You and I are betrothed, and that's final. And in front of everyone, he planted a kiss, hard and possessive on her mouth. After a moment, prudence struggled out of his embrace and stood there, staring at him. So here you are, Mr. Otterbury, an arch voice said into the silence. I had quite given up on my rat of fear, and now everyone has gone into supper. Must I expire of hunger and thirst before you remember me? A lady in a blue lute string sack joined the group. She slipped her arm familiarly through Philip's, nodded at Lady Gosforth, and smiled around the group with faint inquiry. Gracious, how serious everyone looks, and I thought it such a lovely party. She seemed perfectly sure of her welcome. Otterbury, doing his imitation of a fish, looked even greener than before. Gideon noticed Prudence's reaction. She had no idea who this young woman was. He wondered if Prudence realized the lady was increasing. The proud curve of her belly was not quite disguised by the folds of her gown. Uh, yes, sorry. I shall take you in to supper immediately, Philip muttered. Come along. He began to bustle her away in a manner that had Gideon's suspicions bristling. He blocked the lady's way. Will you not introduce us, Clotterbury? The lady tittered gaily. Otterbury, not Clotterbury. People do have trouble with the name, but that is the most amusing of mispronunciations I have yet encountered. And you are? She looked expectantly from Gideon to Philip, who didn't utter a sound. His face was ashen. I am Caradice. Gideon bowed suavely. And this is Miss Meridew, her great uncle, Sir Oswald Meridew. My aunt, Lady Augusta Montigua del Fuego, and I gather you know Lady Gosforth. The lady curtsied to each of them, and then, since there was no introduction forthcoming from Philip, she said with simple pride, I am Mrs. Otterbury. And as if there could be some doubt, she added, Mrs. Philip Otterbury. Prudence went extremely still. Gideon wanted to wrap her in his arms, so she could not be hurt any more by this stupid clot and his silly, vacuous wife. He took a cold, resistless little hand in his, tucked it under his arm, and then, to make sure, laid his hand over hers. My felicitations, Otterbury. Mrs. Otterbury, he said coolly. A secret wedding, was it, Otterbury? Oh, goodness me, no, Philip's wife laughed. Why ever would it be a secret? I cannot imagine, Gideon said in a hard voice, and looked at Otterbury. I gather the marriage is of recent date, Mrs. Otterbury tittered again. Heavens no, she glanced coyly down at the bulge beneath her gown, smoothed it with a deliberate hand, and said, We were married more than six months ago, in India. With a sigh and a whisper of silk, Prudence fainted away. Chapter 19 Love Can Hope, Where Reason Would Despair George Littleton Gideon, who had been watching Prudence like a hawk, ready to snatch her away at the first sign of distress, caught her in his arms. 
For a moment, the idea crossed his mind that it might be like that other time, a feint to escape an uncomfortable situation, but the dead weight of her in his arms told him the truth. She had indeed fainted, and no wonder, he thought savagely. She had produced that damn pawnbroker's ring with such innocent courage. He knew why she did it too. That look she had given him after he'd claimed her with that kiss. The sort of look people gave when they were about to jump off a cliff or burn their bridges. She'd said she wouldn't entrap him. She had given him her promise and meant to abide by it, a testament to loyalty. And she'd been made to look a fool, bad enough for the swine to have married without telling her, worse to reveal it in public, at a party where Prudence was effectively pinned to a board like a butterfly for all her feelings and thoughts to be displayed. Hard enough for anyone to have their declaration of faith and fidelity smacked in the face so brutally but for his new wife to be presented in such glowing, smug fecundity, there could be no crueler reminder of the babe Prudence had lost, and still mourned. She lay helpless, unconscious against his chest. He didn't want to put her down. He wanted to stride off with her to his home and care for her in privacy. He wanted to take her upstairs to his bed and simply hold her, let her weep and rail and grieve. He wanted her not to be alone. If any pillow was to be drenched with her tears, he wanted it to be his. He wanted to be the one to hold her, to dry her tears, to comfort and tend and love her. Put her down, said a voice beside him. Never, thought Gideon. She needs air, boy, and my smelling salts. Lay her down on this sofa. Aunt Gussie instructed him. Reluctantly, he laid her on the sofa and held her hand chafing it gently while Aunt Gussie administered the smelling salts. Prudence came around in a moment. In two, she'd repudiated his hand, thanked his aunt, and struggled to her feet. Alarmingly pale but very poised, she approached the faithless Otterbury and his bride, a brittle smile on her face. Please accept my felicitations, she said, both for your marriage and for the forthcoming happy event. Philip, I'm sure your mother is delighted. Perhaps this explains why we have not heard from her in recent months. Otterbury nodded vaguely, looking uncomfortable. Another story there, thought Gideon savagely. Not for a moment did she betray the terrible blow she had just been dealt. No trace of bitterness escaped her. She was unique, Gideon thought proudly. He moved closer in case she needed a little support. His hand cupped her elbow. He could feel the tension in her, vibrating like a bowstring. She moved away, imperceptibly, deliberately breaking the fragile contact between them, again. She did not want him. You will be wanting your supper, Mrs. Otterbury, she said with quiet grace. Yes, yes, so she is. Come, my dear. Hurriedly, Philip escorted his wife from the room. Little weasel, said Aunt Gussie. I knew he was hiding something, asking you to stay indoors for a week to save his pride at being jilted, pretending it was me he didn't want you to be seen with, and all along he was trying to prevent his wife from meeting his fiance. How did he think he could avoid it? They plan to leave Bath tomorrow, Lady Gosforth said. Aunt Gussie snorted. That fits. Prudence shook her head. It doesn't matter anymore, she said wearily. I think I would like to leave now. I have a terrible headache. If you will excuse me, Lady Gosforth. Yes, of course, my dear. Great Uncle Oswald, Lady Augusta, may I leave the twins with you? They are having such a lovely time, and I would hate to ruin it for them. Yes, yes, my dear, said Sir Oswald in a gruff voice. Don't give him another thought. Shouldn't I come with you, Prue, dear? Asked Aunt Gussie. Prudence shook her head. No, no, I thank you. I really would prefer to be alone. Only her extreme pallor and the faint tremor in her voice revealed her distress. I shall escort you, Gideon announced. No. Aware she had overreacted, Prudence moderated her tone. Thank you, but no, Lord Caradice. I require no other escort than our footman, James. He is a stalwart fellow and will give me the support of his arm if I need it, though I shan't need it, 
I'm sure. Prudence just wanted to escape. Deeply embarrassed by her truly feeble response to Philip's news, she needed to get away, to sort out her feelings. The last thing she wanted was to have to deal with Lord Caradice now, when she was in such a pathetically vaporish state. He would want to put his arms around her. He always did. She was just as likely to fall into his arms and sob out all her woes. And what an even more feeble creature she would be if she allowed it. She would not. She didn't want his pity. She didn't want anyone's pity. You must, he insisted. There is no question of it. I shall escort you. Thank you, but you shall not, she responded firmly. She was starting to get irritated now. Would no one let her make a graceful exit and escape from this dreadful scene? Take my palanquin, said Lady Gussie. It is the perfect thing. Then if you feel faint again... No, thank you, dear Lady Augusta, but truly I prefer to walk. I am quite steady on my feet now, I promise you, and will be all the better for a little exercise and some fresh air. But you cannot, began Lord Caradice. She held up a hand. It is but a short step, and the night is warm. I shall be perfectly well, thank you. She stood and picked up her shawl, which had slipped to the floor. Lord Caradice took it from her and wrapped it around her. Prudence forced herself to resist the warm appeal of his protectiveness. She needed to think, and she could not do that while he was near. Besides, for once in her life she wanted to be able to consider what she, Prudence Meridy, wanted without having to take into account the desires, plans, or orders of a man. She was no longer bound to Philip. She was about to turn one and twenty and would thus be free of Grandpapa. For the first time in her life, she could be her own mistress, and she needed to make a few decisions, reasoned decisions, not those guided by emotion, not by fear, obligation, guilt, or love. If Lord Caradise was with her, she knew what would happen to reason. It would fly out of the window and be replaced by emotion. No, please, she entreated him. But come and see me in the morning. Finally, reluctantly, he agreed. His eyes dark with emotion, and so Prudence had her way and left the party to walk home with only James the footman in attendance. Prudence walked slowly along the pavement, caught up in her own thoughts. Beside her walked James, the silent shadow. She tried to make sense of Philip's situation. Why had he simply not written to her and told her he wished to marry another? She had given him repeated opportunities in her letters to speak up. She'd even assured him that if he wished to sever the connection, she would not reproach him. Even if he felt awkward, he should still have written to her immediately on his marriage. Why had he not? When had he married? Six months ago, his wife had said. She worked it out. Six months ago. She walked along, head down, trying to recall the letters she had received four or five months ago. But she could not recall any letters. He had stopped writing more than six months ago. Suddenly, she came to an abrupt halt. Words Philip had spoken a few days before started to make sense. It looked like your grandfather had lost his whole fortune. She frowned, trying to recall his exact words. She had been thinking of other things at the time. The company nearly went bankrupt, you know, and we all had an anxious time of it. Philip had stopped writing during that anxious time, had stopped writing to his betrothed of four years, the heiress whose grandfather had lost his whole fortune. And he had looked around and found himself another heiress. What had he said of his hosts? His in-laws, no doubt. Extremely well off, extremely well connected. Her mouth twisted wryly, not to mention related to a duke. A far better bargain than prudence of the bankrupt grandfather, who was only a baron after all. Of course, money. It was Philip's driving force. So stupid of him to lie, to pretend otherwise. He could not have hidden his wife from her forever. Surely it would have been both easier and simpler to have told Prudence he was married. The whole thing was a mystery. It was also a relief. She needn't feel guilty about jilting him anymore. She was a different person, and not only because of the past four and a half years. It was Gideon who changed her. 
He had ruined her for one such as Philip. Gideon had taught her what a kiss could be. He had shown her that love really could be joyful, and that life was for laughter as well as serious things. She wanted him, Gideon, and in the morning they would speak, and she would tell him what was in her heart. She was so deep in thought that she did not hear the clip-clop of horses, nor the sound of wheels on the road behind her, or if she did, she did not spare it a thought, not until it was too late. Gideon prowled around the party, brooding, scowling, and generally giving the lie to all those who thought a rake was supposed to be charming. It had gone against every instinct he had to let her leave with only a footman to accompany her. He wanted to be with her. Damn it! He needed to be with her. He wanted to take her in his arms, to kiss away her distress, her feeling of betrayal. She would be home now, in bed, his little love, no doubt sobbing her eyes out over a cowardly, faithless, unworthy weasel and his stupid pregnant wife. Prudence should not be by herself at a time like this, no matter what she thought she needed. But she was stubborn, his lady. And he could hardly complain about her fiery streak of independence when it was one of the things he loved about her. Only he did want to complain of it. Right now he didn't want her to be stubborn, or independent, or brave, or bloody self-sufficient. He wanted her in his arms, damn it, where she belonged. A lady in a low-necked bronze silk gown undulated toward him, a sultry smile of welcome on her face. Gideon glowered at her. How could he have ever thought this sort of empty dalliance had any appeal? She continued to flow toward him, open invitation in every movement of her luscious body, her smile deeper, more knowing. Gideon bared his teeth at her, and she stopped, blinked, and hastily undulated away. Damn it! He couldn't stay at this blasted party. Sir Oswald would take care of his aunt and the twins. He might just pop out and stroll along to his aunt's house. To do what? He thought savagely. Stare at Prudence's empty window. Well, it was better than being here, he decided, and began to thread his way toward the hall. Hearing a sudden commotion at the front door, he quickened his pace and arrived just in time to see a man in livery stagger inside, blood pouring from his head. A lady screamed. Another fainted. There was a flurry of activity as a small knot of people gathered, then hung back uncertainly. Get a cloth quickly, rapped Gideon, as he lunged forward to catch the man who was swaying on his feet. He carried him into the kitchen, out of the way of the guests. You, butler, send for a physician, fast, and you, fetch the Oswald Meridue here at once, he ordered, his heart racing, for he knew the injured man. It was the young footman, James, last seen escorting Prudence home. What happened, man? Where is Miss Meridue? Taken, gasped James. Sorry, my lord. They jumped me from behind, knocked me down. He raised a hand to his wound and winced. Took Miss Prue. Carriage, black carriage, bay horses, one white foot. Gideon swore. Sir Oswald arrived. Prudence has been abducted. Gideon said tersely. I'm going to follow them on horseback. You! He snapped his finger at a nearby footman. Fetch me a horse, the best in the stables. Sir Oswald, demonstrating the ability to take immediate action that had made him a rich man, turned to an onlooking servant. Fellow, run around to my house and tell them to prepare my traveling chaise and fetch my pistols too, and hop to it. The servant raced off. I'll be close behind you, Caradice, my boy. Gideon nodded and said urgently to the injured footman, James, did you see which way they went? James frowned as he tried to gather his senses. Toward moonrise. Gideon squeezed his shoulder in thanks. Good man. Right. I'll be off. I'll get her back. Don't worry. He stood and said almost to himself, Who the devil would snatch her off the street? James's hand shot out and grabbed his coattail. Thought you know, my lord. Twas her grandfa, the old lord. I saw him. Gideon stared. Why would her grandfather abduct her off the street? James fought for consciousness. Hates her. Hates Miss Prue. You've got to find her, my lord. In one of his rages he was. His head fell back and his eyes closed, but he managed to whisper. Last time. Old devil. 
Nearly killed her. Gideon swore again as he raced from the house. A late guest was just dismounting from a fine-looking bay gelding. No other horse was to be seen. Gideon couldn't wait for the one to be brought from the stables. He strode forward and snatched the reins from the man's hand. Need to borrow your horse, sir. Emergency. Lady Gosforth will vouch for me. And before the man could utter a protest, he'd leaped into the saddle and galloped off. His mount thundered toward the rising moon, as his gaze scoured the night for a black carriage pulled by four bay horses, one with one white foot. Prudence lay huddled on the seat of the coach, numb with shock, fear, and confusion. One moment she'd been strolling along the street on a warm night, deep in thought, and then suddenly she'd been roughly seized and flung into a vehicle. She could see nothing. She was half smothered in some sort of thick cloth, like a cloak or a blanket. It was dusty. She knew that, as she could breathe only through her nose. A rag of some sort had been shoved into her mouth and a gag tied over it, preventing her from screaming or even breathing. Her hands were tied tight, with thick rough twine that cut into her skin. The carriage moved fast. It bounced over cobblestones, over drains and ruts thudding into bone-jarring holes, swinging and swaying around corners at a fearsome pace. Prudence was tossed back and forth by the movement. Blind and bound as she was, it took all her concentration to remain on the seat. She was tossed to the floor several times. Hands grabbed her and hurled her back on the seat, not gently. Finally, she managed to wedge herself into the corner of the vehicle and steady herself by bracing her feet against the floor on the side of the carriage. Only then was she able to consider her position. For a few wild moments, she'd imagined she'd been mistaken for someone else, kidnapped for profit, or abducted for immoral purposes. There had been shouting when she was taken, but she'd been too occupied to notice, wholly occupied in fighting the rough hands that bound her. Hampered by the cloak over her head, she hadn't stood a chance. There were three men at least. Two had climbed on top of the carriage. One was the driver she'd heard them. Another man was in the carriage with her, the leader. He'd addressed not a word to her, but she heard his cane rap on the roof, and the carriage had lurched off. She could hear him breathing, wheezing stertorously. He had said not a word, but slowly, imperceptibly, she realized who it was, and fear lodged like a knot in her chest, for even through the heavy blanket she could smell him, the fusty, goaty old man smell of him. Grandpapa. She tried to say something through the gag. Thwack! The cane smashed across her shoulder and neck. Even through the blanket it hurt. He had not spared his strength. Silence, bitch! Beneath the blanket, Prudence closed her eyes and braced her body. She knew he would not stop at a single blow. He never had before. Blind as she was, she would not know when the next one came, so she must be ready. She would survive this. She hunched her head into her shoulder and waited, and waited. Thwack! The cane smacked across her arm. Don't wriggle! It would be a long night. She sent up a quick silent prayer that she would live to see the dawn, and waited for the next blow. It was a long time coming, but then... Send me off on a wild goose chase, would you bitch? Down to London! Thwack! Then all the way to Derbyshire! Thwack! and then on to Scotland. Thwack. Prudence swallowed. She'd hoped the lie had bought them enough time, but... Thwack. Waste my blunt on expensive frippery. The cane cut sharply across her legs, and the instant reflexive gasp of pain almost choked her because of the gag. The blanket did not reach to her legs, and the deep blue silk and silver tissue overlay provided no protection at all. Her beautiful party dress. Thwack on her ankle bone. She heard the silver tissue rip, and he grunted with satisfaction. Fine feathers do not make fine birds, Missy. Prudence could do nothing but endure. She braced herself for the next blow, but he seemed to have calmed a little. The silence stretched, the only sound the horse's hooves on the road, and the creaking and groaning of the moving carriage. Wondering how I found you, eh? Surreptitiously she flexed her toes. They moved. Her ankle throbbed, but it wasn't broken. She sighed in relief. She might still be able to run, if she had the chance. 
young Otterbury wrote. Letter waiting for me when I got back from Scotland. He let me know where you'd run off to. Ha! Currying favour. Used to work for me. Did you know? Left the company some time ago. Been trying to get reinstated ever since. The fool. Do him no good. No good at all now. The last piece of the puzzle. Prudence thought wearily. Philip had betrayed her at every turn. In every way. The silence in the carriage stretched. And stretched. Thwack. Damned or be locked up for your interference, you doxy. Locked up? What did he mean? This was not the frenzied attack of her youth, her grandfather in a spitting rage. There was something more, more leisured about it, brooding, as if he had all the time in the world, and slowly building up to something. She dared not think of what. She did not know what was preferable. A burst of anger that was over in one violent outburst, or this waiting, not seeing, not knowing, imagining all sorts of things. It was more horrifying somehow. Long periods of silence, and then suddenly, thwack! I am Derham of Derham Court. I'd see us both dead before I'd let myself be imprisoned. Imprisoned for what? She wondered. See us both dead. She huddled on the seat, choking for breath under the blanket, swallowing convulsively on the gag. She had never felt so alone. This time, there was no one to help her. No sisters, no servants to interfere. She was alone with him, helpless, in the dark, in a carriage, on the road to hell. For the moment the blows were intermittent. It was not so bad. It was frightening, cowering in the corner, never knowing when or where to expect them. But it was better than a frenzied attack, less physically damaging, she hoped. It might be more endurable in the end, whenever the end would be. But she would not give up. She would not be defeated. She had seen the light of happiness, and it was within her grasp. He muttered to himself from time to time. Sometimes she could hear the words, sometimes she could not. Sometimes they made sense to her, sometimes they did not. Sometimes whatever it was would enrage him, and he would lash out at her. The only warning, the whistling of his cane through the air. Run off with your lover, would you? Thwack. Harlot! Faithless whore! Her ear rang with the blow, drowning out the ugly names he was calling her. Names did not hurt anyway. He'd called her those before. Her lover? How had he discovered that? It did not matter. She did love Gideon. She did not care who knew it. She didn't have to hide it now, not even from herself. She loved Gideon. She conjured up his face in the dark, clinging to the thought of him, her beacon in the storm, Gideon. His dark eyes that teased her to laughter and at the same time promised untold wicked pleasures. And we will all the pleasures prove. Pleasures, not pain. She kept that thought at the forefront of her mind. The horses would need to be changed at some point. It was a long way from Bath to Norfolk. They'd have to get fresh horses soon. Even though the early fast pace had steadied, there might be an opportunity for her to escape. She tried to flex her cramped limbs unobtrusively, thwack, across her shin. To block out the waves of hatred coming at her, she clung to thoughts of Gideon. Gideon, who made her feel beautiful. Gideon, whose kisses warmed her even now, as she was trapped in Grandpapa's cold and bitter hell. Gideon, who'd grown up as a sad and lonely little boy, in a house without love. He'd needed so much to be loved, even if he didn't know it. And he'd said he wanted her, needed her, plain Prudence Meridue. He'd told her so with dark and potent heat in his eyes, and poetry on his lips. Come live with me, and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove. And she'd let herself fall prey to doubts allowing the words of men like her grandfather and Philip to influence her. Blind, foolish prudence. Doubting the man who needed her so much. The man she loved with all her heart, only because he was a rake. So what if he had not used the right words? He had wanted to love her, and even if... Thwack! 
What if she died tonight? What if she died without ever having the chance to tell him how much she loved him? Without ever knowing what it felt like to make love with him? She would not die. She would survive this. She had to. She had to tell Gideon she loved him. She didn't care about the consequences. And she was going to make love with him at the very first opportunity. Gideon arrowed his steed into the night. He'd gambled on his instincts, his instincts that said the old man would make for his lair, for Derham Court. On the outskirts of Bath, he'd spotted an old chap on a bench by the main road, nursing a mug of ale in the warm evening. He wrenched his mount to a halt. Have you seen a black carriage pass by in the last half hour, drawn by four bay horses, one with a white foot? The old man considered a moment. Don't know about a white foot, sorry, but there were a black carriage right enough. Passed by here like the devil himself were atop it. Sporting no lights they were neither. Foolishness this late, when the moon's naught but a sliver. If you stay here another hour, and tell a gentleman with white hair what you told me, he will give you another of these. Gideon flipped him a guinea, and raced on. He could make better speed than a carriage, but even so, he feared for prudence. James's words rang in his head. Hates Miss Prue. Last time, old devil nearly killed her. Nearly killed her. His mind was heavy with dread, even as his body urged his mount to greater speed. Gideon recalled Hope's careless referral to the way he beat them all, but thrashed Prudence. If he'd hurt Prudence, her grandfather was a dead man. He raised headlong into the night, praying for Prudence's safety and wishing he'd worn spurs and boots to the party. Rope burned into Prudence's wrists. She'd struggled surreptitiously for the last hour to loosen the knots and free herself, but her efforts were in vain. Almost. She had not managed to free herself, but she'd gripped the edge of the blanket covering her head. Inch by inch, she gathered it, and it was now one big tug away from coming off her. She could run, and she could see. There would be a chance for her to try to escape, and there must be. She waited for her moment, her arms cramped painfully. She flexed her fingers to get her circulation moving again. Mercifully, Grandpapa seemed to have subsided. He had said nothing for many minutes now nor had the cane come whistling out of the darkness. She wondered if he had fallen asleep. She hoped so. But she dared not risk pulling the blanket off her in case he wasn't. She couldn't make a move yet, not until the carriage stopped. It would be madness to jump from a moving carriage in the dark. And she wasn't that desperate. Yet. It seemed an age before the carriage finally slowed. The sound of the horse's hooves changed. The road's surface was different. A town? A toll road? Would they be stopping for a change of horses or to pay the toll? Inconspicuously, she flexed what muscle she could, preparing for possible action. It was a coaching inn. She heard the ostlers come hurrying out, heard the order for fresh horses. There was some slight argument about it, and she heard her grandfather slide across to the other side of the carriage to deal with the innkeeper's impertinence in delaying him. With her bound hand, she felt for the handle of the carriage door and twisted. It opened. In a flash, she tugged the blanket from over her eyes and jumped out into the courtyard of the inn. Her knees buckled beneath her from the last hours of inactivity, and she staggered. There was a shout behind her. Prudence stumbled doggedly forward, the blood rushing painfully back to her limbs with each step. A golden slab of light spilled across the cobblestones. The door of the inn stood ajar. Inside were people who might help her. Without hesitation, she made for the light. She burst through the door and looked wildly around her. The tap room was almost deserted. Two old men seated by the fire stared at her with mouths agape. A motherly looking woman was wiping down a table with a cloth. There was no one else. Prudence ran toward the woman, uttering noises of distress through her gag. Heavens to Betsy, the woman exclaimed. Whatever is going on? Look, Arthur, some villains tied this poor lady's hands and stuffed a horrid rag in her mouth. A middle-aged man, presumably Arthur, popped up from behind the bar and stared at her. How do you know she's a lady? One of the old men asked. Prudence cast a frightened glance toward the door. She uttered urgent-sounding noises. Oh, why were these people so slow? 
Look at her clothes, Gapeseed, said the other. Fine as fivepence she be, or was, until someone ripped that silvery thing she's wearing. Cost a few quid, that would. Take no notice of these lummoxes, dearie, said the woman. We'll look after you. She laid a comforting arm around Prudence. Arthur, she's shaking like a leaf, poor little thing. I don't know what trouble you're in, miss, but you're safe now. My Arthur will protect you. She reached to unfasten the gag. Who's done this terrible thing to you, dearie? Crack. It sounded like a gunshot in the small taproom. I forbid you to untie that woman. Her grandfather's voice rang out, echoing with the authority and arrogance of generations. Leaning heavily on a silver-tipped ebony cane, he limped into the centre of the small, low-ceilinged taproom, as if he owned it. His cane was in his left hand. A horsewhip was in his right. Despair flooded Prudence as she saw the effect of his bullying, aristocratic entrance on the villagers in the inn. They were frozen. Crack. The occupants of the room jumped as one when the whip cracked again. Her grandfather's two burly henchmen stepped into the room after him, a silent message to any who might consider disobeying the man with the whip. She is a dangerous madwoman. Move away from her, alewife, for your own safety. The lash of the horsewhip stirred and caressed his boot like a living thing as he flicked it back and forth. Prudence shook her head vigorously in denial of her grandfather's charge. Her eyes beseeched the woman to give her the benefit of the doubt, to defy her grandfather and unfasten the gag. At least if her mouth were free, she could speak in her own defence. The woman did not move. Nor did she move away from Prudence. A tiny spark of hope flared in Prudence's heart. I said move away from her. He regarded the woman as if she were an insect. The lash stirred again. I don't take orders in my own inn, she responded boldly, giving him back look for look. What have you to do with this lady? How do I know you mean well by her? Prudence nodded frantically at the woman to confirm her words. Grandpapa did not mean well by her at all. Insolent trollop! I am Lord Derham of Derham Court, Norfolk, he paused to let the words sink in, and this is my runaway wife, who I am conducting to Bedlam. Now step aside, and my men shall conduct her back to the carriage from which she escaped. Runaway wife? Bedlam? The Bethlehem Royal Hospital, where lunatics were locked away. She felt sick, terrified. Could he really mean to lock her up in Bedlam? Once she was shut away there, no one would ever believe her story. No one would ever release her, and in that hellish place she would indeed go mad. She shook her head desperately at the woman. She doesn't look like a mad woman to me, the woman said slowly, and she's awful young to be your wife. Let's see what she's got to say for herself. Again she reached for the gag. Don't touch her, you fat trollop! The lash bit into the soft flesh of the woman's bare arm and as she cried out in anger and pain, he grabbed her and flung her roughly aside. She hit the bar hard. Hoy! Leave my wife alone, you! Arthur came forward, his fists bunched menacingly. I don't know with toffs mishandling women, especially not my woman. Casually, Lord Derham slashed him across the eyes with his whip. With a shriek of pain, Arthur fell back, clutching his eyes. His wife crawled forward to help him. The whip writhed and flickered like a snake. Anyone else? The silky threat cowed the silent spectators. He didn't wait for a response. He grabbed Prudence by the hair and began to drag her toward the door. She kicked and struggled as hard as she could. Come quietly, you little bitch! He roared and lifted the whip handle to clout her into insensibility. Touch her and I'll kill you, Derham! The whip handle stopped in midair. Prudence sagged in sudden thankfulness. She knew that voice. Gideon. Thank God. Thank God. Her grandfather turned and regarded the newcomer with outrage. You're what? How dare you bluster in here making threats against me? Who the devil do you think you are? The lash flickered out like a striking snake. Gideon stepped closer. I am Caradice and I will not stand for violence against any woman, let alone this one. This woman has naught to do with you. She is evil, and I... She is my wife, too. 
Chapter 20 One word frees us of all the weight and pain of life. That word is love. Sophocles Wife! Lord Derham's eyes almost started from their sockets. His face paled, then flushed suddenly with rage. He shook prudence like a dog shakes a rat. You foul little slut, I'll... He raised the whip again. Let her go! Gideon grabbed Lord Derham's wrist, squeezing it like a vice, harder and harder until the bones threatened to crack. Her grandfather swore, and suddenly prudence was free. She staggered. Stand away, sweetheart. Gideon said gently, steadying her on her feet with careful hands. All his attention was on her. She tried to warn him, but could only make a muffled sound through the gag. Her grandfather's whip whistled through the air and lashed Gideon across the back of the head. He barely flinched. Just pushed her gently toward the corner of the room. Get him! Her grandfather roared, and the two burly henchmen leaped at Gideon. He ducked and swung a punch that landed with a crunch on the shorter man. Blood spurted from the man's nose, and he staggered back. His partner struck Gideon a two-handed blow on the back of the neck, and Prudence watched, horrified, as her beloved staggered under the impact, then without turning, rammed his elbow backward. It connected audibly with the man's ribs. The man tried to grab his ear. Gideon responded with a mighty punch to the stomach. The man grunted and kicked out. Gideon slammed another punch to the head, then a third to the jaw. Prudence yelled helplessly through the gag as the second man came rushing across the room, an iron poker raised. She kicked a stool into his path, and the man went sprawling on the flagstones. The poker clattered to the ground. She darted forward and kicked it out of his reach. The man scrambled to his feet just as Gideon felt his partner with one last frightful punch. Come on then, my bucko! Gideon beckoned him, his fists raised. A faint smile lingered on his lips, and his eyes were lit with a devilish glint. It looked almost as if he enjoyed this appalling brawl, she thought incredulously. The man took one step forward, then hesitated. Go on, you filthy coward! Get him! roared Lord Derham, spittle and rage dripping from his lips. He lashed at the man with his whip. The man stepped back out of range. He glanced at Lord Derham, then at Gideon. Then at his partner, sprawled bloody and insensible on the taproom floor. He shook his head. Get him yourself, my lord, he said. I've had enough of this business. And he left, ignoring Lord Derham's shouts of outrage. Gideon, his chest heaving and blood welling from a cut above his eye, stared across the room at Lord Derham. Slowly, the light of battle faded from his eyes. He lowered his fists reluctantly. I cannot in all decency fight a man of your age, sir, he said. Let us agree that there has been enough violence tonight. Admit defeat, and you may leave here unmolested, though I would gladly see you hanged for what you have done to prudence. His fists clenched again, and he took several deep breaths before he continued. But I am young and in my prime, and you are more than sixty and but recently recovered from injury. He glanced at Prudence and added in a softer voice. She has suffered enough distress this night. You are her grandfather, after all. We will all be related. Prudence felt unbearably moved by his gallantry. Oh, what a beautiful man he was. We'll be related. You're not wed yet. No, but we shall be as soon as possible. So Pax, Derham? Prudence felt her eyes flood. Lord Derham shrugged, and gave a grunt that seemed to indicate assent. He stumped toward the door, scowling, but silent. Gideon watched for a moment, then reached for Prudence's gag. I'm so sorry I took so long, love. Are you all— Slash! The whip cut across his hands, narrowly missing Prudence's face. Gideon pushed her behind him and advanced on the old man, a murderous light in his eyes. He was pale, his mouth hard and unsmiling. His dark eyes glittered with a fierce and implacable rage. Prudence had never seen him like this. She wanted to call out to him, but the gag was still in place. 
She wanted to help, but her hands were still tied. She watched helplessly as her grandfather limped across the room in an insane rage, whip lashing furiously at the man she loved. Crack! Admit defeat, would I? Gideon ducked as the lash swung above his head, but did not stop his advance. Slash! Give in to an insolent puppy! The lash cut his ear. Gideon moved forward. Smash! The whip missed Gideon and sent a tankard of ale spinning across the room. Slash! At his face again. The old man was trying to blind him, he realized. Nothing could blind him now, Gideon thought savagely. The old man had had his chance. Too old for a fight, am I? With a hiss, the lash snaked out at him again, and this time Gideon lifted his arm to receive the full brunt of it. He heard Prudence whimper as the lash slashed into him, but Gideon made not a sound. He bared his teeth in a grim smile, lowered his arm, and yanked hard. The whip flew out of the old man's hand. Behind him, Prudence made a small muffled sound. Gideon calmly unwrapped the lash from his forearm and took the handle in his hand. Fond of the whip, aren't you, Derham? You're very skilled with it. We've all seen that. He cracked the whip an inch in front of the old man's nose. Lord Derham stumbled backward. I admit, I haven't had the practice you have. Snick. A button flew off Lord Derham's coat. But then I haven't been practicing on women and little girls. Snick. Another button went rolling across the flagstones. The occupants of the room watched in silence. Gideon's face hardened. He repeated, Women and little girls. He slashed at Derham with each word. By the end of the sentence, not a button remained on the coat. They are harlots, one and all, shouted Lord Derham, taking courage from the fact that so far he hadn't been touched by the lash. The whip is all they understand, and as for you, I'll have you hanged for this. Lord Derham shook his fist at Gideon. The whip lashed, and a thin red line blossomed on the fist. How old was she when you first used your whip on her, eh? Eleven? Twelve? And what about Grace? Gideon punctuated each word with the whip. You are an obscenity. You should never have been allowed to rear young girls. It is a miracle they have emerged so sweet and pure. Pure. Lord Derham snorted. What drivel has she been telling you? She is about as pure as... With a single enraged punch, Gideon knocked him out cold. Ignoring the prone body on the floor, Gideon flung the whip into a corner and went instantly to Prudence. He took her into his arms, crooning and murmuring tender reassurances. He untied the gag, flung it in the fire, and called for a knife. It made short work of the ropes around her wrists. He swore when he saw how raw and chafed they were, and he hugged her gently to him, smoothing her hair, her cheek, checking to see if she was whole and unharmed. Prudence kept saying, It's all right, it's all right, over and over, as if he needed reassurance more than she did, and indeed, he blamed himself sorely. I'm sorry, love, I should have been there with you, I should have walked you home, I'll never. Hush. She smoothed his hair back tenderly. It was my choice, and they took us by surprise from behind, and I'm all right. Grandpapa has done worse than this to me. But you, your brow is bleeding. He nearly blinded you. And your injured shoulder, how is that? She asked distressfully and tried to examine his hurts. Foh! Makes me sick to my stomach. Lord Derham had come to and struggled to his feet. He observed them sourly. Get out, old man, if you value your life, Gideon said in a hard voice. She'll betray you. They all do. No concept of honor. She is already another man's leavings. Did you know that, ha? Huh? Gideon glared at him, but said calmly enough, What do I care for that? Virginity can be given away, or lost, or wrested from a girl by force. It matters not to me. What matters is honor and a loving heart. My prudence is the most honorable woman I've ever known, and she has the truest, most loving heart in all the world. 
Prudence could not see for tears. Pah! Her fancy man! Wants you to marry her, does she? Is she carrying your bastard in her belly, eh? She did that once before, you know, but I beat it out of her. You beat it out? Gideon could not finish the sentence. He felt sick with fury. Her baby! The old man snorted righteously. Thrashed her until she dropped the mongrel pup. There are no bastards in my family. I beg to differ, Gideon said coldly. He was gripped by a rage he had never before experienced. To have this evil old man boasting that he'd thrashed a young girl until she miscarried. He'd never heard of anything so barbaric. And it was prudence, his sweet, loving prudence, who'd had this vile thing done to her. For that, you evil old man, I'm going to kill you. Gideon advanced, murder in his heart. Crash! Lord Derham sank slowly back to the floor, in a welter of pottery shards, stale crusts and vegetable peelings. Gideon blinked. Ah, now, that makes me feel a lot better. The landlady stood over the prone body, grinning with satisfaction. Call me a fat old trollop, would he? Try to blind my Alfred, the horrible old basket. She poked at the old man with her foot. He did not stir. She faced Gideon. Now don't be angry with me, sir. I know you had every reason to want to kill him, the black-hearted old goat. She glanced at Prudence and added in a lower voice. I've never heard anything so wicked and heartless in my life as what he'd done to Miss here. But if you'd have killed him, you'd have to flee the country. And where would that leave your lady, eh? She nodded. Better I bash him over the noggin with the pig's dinner. She glanced around the room and grinned. And I can't say I didn't enjoy it. Fat old trollop indeed. She was right, Gideon realised. In his rage he probably would have throttled the old man, and it would have been murder. He stared at the landlady, shaken, then collected himself. Madam, he said. You have saved me from myself, and for that I humbly thank you. He bent, and with all the grace he could muster, kissed her hand as if she were the grandest duchess in the land. And as for his insults, I wouldn't let them rankle. The man obviously feared and hated women. There would be nothing so threatening to him as a magnificent woman in her prime. He kissed her hand again, this time as a man kisses the hand of a beauty, and added mischievously, with or without a bowl of pig slop in her hand. She giggled and blushed, then bustled off to fetch them all a drink to settle their nerves. Ha! What's all this? said a voice from the doorway. Good God! Is that my brother Theodore lying there on the floor? Why is he covered with vegetable peelings and onion skins? Prudence, my dear girl, there you are. Are you all right? Great Uncle Oswald rushed across the room and embraced her heartily. Prudence burst into tears. She tried to stop herself, but she couldn't. They just seemed to flow out of her, though why she should turn into a watering pot now was a mystery to her. She hadn't cried when Philip betrayed her. She refused utterly to cry when Grandpapa beat her, or when those men were fighting Gideon. So why she should cry when it was all over, and a dear old man rushed up and hugged her, she could not say. She could only sob helplessly. Great Uncle Oswald dabbed ineffectually on her shoulder, murmuring such things as, there, there, and tut, tut, and after a few moments she heard him say, Here, Caradice, this is more in your line than mine, and she was transferred to a much stronger, warmer embrace as Gideon wrapped her to him. The sobs came harder then. He swung her into his arms and carried her upstairs. He found the inn's private sitting room, pushed the door open with his foot, and carried her to the settee, where he sat with prudence cradled in his lap held tenderly against his heart as she sobbed. He held her in silence, stroking her hair as each sob reverberated through her body and his. There was little passion in the embrace, just warm, comforting strength, and slowly the storm of weeping passed. A wood fire crackled in the grate. She lay against his chest, listening to the beat of his heart and the gentle hiss and pop of the flames, wishing the moment could last forever. He shifted his arm slightly, awkwardly, and recollection flooded back to her. 
she sat up. Your injured arm. Did you hurt it again in the fight? Should you be holding me? He ignored her question, just hugged her tighter. I'm sorry. I should have come with you. Should have insisted on walking you home. Hush. She laid a hand over his lips. It's over now. Truly over. Yes, it is. Gently he tipped her face to his, and possessed her in a long, tender kiss. She must have made some small sound, for he instantly loosened his embrace. Am I hurting you? No, she murmured, winding her arms around his neck and pulling his mouth back down to hers. It was bliss being held like this, holding him. She'd wondered if it would even happen to her again, and now she just wanted to lie in his arms and kiss him, savoring the moment, planning nothing, thinking about nothing, except Gideon. Reveling in his warmth and strength and tender protectiveness and kisses. I should have protected you. I promised to keep you safe, but... Hush. It doesn't matter. His face remained guilt-ridden, troubled. He stared at her left arm. That old swine has bruised you. A hot bath will help, but truly it looks worse than they feel. I can scarcely feel any pain, now that you are here. I've ordered a brandy to be brought up to you. It will help you sleep on the way home. Oh, I know how exhausted you are, with all that has happened this night, but a brandy will help you relax. His eyes were dark with concern. For this to happen is bad enough, but on top of... I'm sorry about Otterbury Prue. I'm not, she told him. I'd already severed the betrothal. He stared, uncomprehending. That day you called on me, and I said Philip was coming at two o'clock. I was short with you, distracted, because I was nerving myself to break the betrothal in a few moments' time. You broke the betrothal that day? Yes. I told him I could not marry him. I cannot understand why I ever imagined I loved such a man. He didn't even care about the baby, Gideon. A quiver passed over her expressive features. Oh, love. He stroked her cheek. To discover he had a wife who was increasing, too. It was a monstrous way to break the news to you. It was a shock. And, yes, I cannot deny that for a moment I was hurt. I don't understand why Philip didn't tell me straight away. She shrugged. I'd already told him I wouldn't marry him. I think he was worried his wife would find out about me. She sighed. You were right. I imagined I was in love, but I was not yet seventeen and so lonely. And I did not then know what love felt like. Not truly. And you do now. She gave him a glowing look that took his breath away. Oh, yes. Gideon suddenly could not breathe. You told me you wanted me, she reminded him softly. He nodded. Well, I have wanted you almost from the moment we first met, she said. I did my best to resist you for the sake of my promise to Philip, but I could not. My will, no matter how much I tried to bolster it, could not override my heart. I think I was yours from that very first day. He said nothing was frozen. You once asked me to come live with you and be your love. Is the offer still open? The obstruction in his throat moved. You know it is, he croaked. Prudence. You are my heart, my soul. I too never knew it could be like this. And he kissed her. Kissed her as if she was rare and precious. Kissed her, mouth to mouth man and woman, elemental, offering her his taste, and his mouth, and his body, and his heart. A bad business, a very bad business, Great Uncle Oswald entered the room. I brought you a posset. Gideon and Prudence leaped apart. Then Gideon deliberately drew her back to his arms. You are mine. We have nothing to hide. Prudence smiled and leaned against him. No. She could not hide how she felt if she tried. 
great uncle Oswald set down the steaming posset and hurried across to the fire. Cold to my bones. Never mind it's a warm night. Whoever would have believed it? My own brother kidnapping little Prue here. And the way he's treated you, my dear, well, it shocked me to my bones. I can tell you. The old man looked very worn and tired. What did he think he was doing, I wonder? Did he think we wouldn't hunt him down and fetch you back? Prudence was silent. There was nothing to say. He spread his hands to the fire and shook his head in bewilderment. Must have bats in his belfry. As if we wouldn't stop scouring the countryside till we found her, eh, Caradice? We love this little lass, don't we? His voice broke, and he pulled out a large yellow handkerchief and blew his nose forcefully. Gideon held Prudence tightly, in wordless assent. Prudence could say not a word. Her heart was too full. No one in her life had stood up to Grandpapa for her, and now she had two champions defending and protecting her, and saying they loved her. It was more than she'd ever dreamed of. Her eyes filled again. Truly, she was becoming the veriest watering pot. Great Uncle Oswald stuffed the handkerchief back in his pocket, now, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but I've had him tied up. Not what you'd expect for a baron, but he was uttering the most frightful threats and carrying on in an appalling fashion. So he's tied up like a parcel, and I'll be away with him in the carriage back to the court. Give him some time to cool down, and then I'll find out what the devil he imagined he was doing. Not sure what the future will hold for him. He sounded barking mad, uh, most peculiar. But whatever happens... He'll never harm you again, Prue, my dear. That I promise you. He kissed Prudence on each cheek and gave her a big hug, then stumped to the door. I'll be off then. But it's the middle of the night, exclaimed Prudence. Best time for it. Travel at night. Don't want the whole world to see me transporting my brother all trussed up like a Christmas goose. Best not be seen or heard in daylight. He patted her shoulder. Besides... You'll sleep easier knowing I've got him locked up safe at Derham Court. You've had a frightful ordeal, my dear, but it's over now. Prudence was obliged to own he was right. She would sleep better knowing Grandpapa was far away, but Great Uncle Oswald was an elderly man. He should not be racketing about the country in the middle of the night at his age. She tried to be tactful. But what about you? You must be tired too. Do you not want to sleep? Great Uncle Oswald looked at her in amazement. Of course I want to sleep. Well, then. It's the coachman who has to stay awake, not me. I'll sleep like a babe in the carriage. Never you fear. Can sleep anywhere, me. Comes of travelling so much when I was younger. He patted her shoulder again, then turned and gave Gideon a straight look, man to man. Caradice, I'll leave Prudence in your hands. Take good care of her, lad. She's a bonny good girl. One of the best. Gideon looked him in the eye. I know, sir, he said. I'll take care of her. My life on it. He was getting the hang of this vow thing, he realized. It wasn't nearly as difficult as he'd imagined. Not when Prudence was involved. I'd like a bath now, before I go to bed, Prudence declared, as Sir Oswald's carriage disappeared into the night. Gideon stared. Do you mean you wish to stay the night here, at this inn? Yes. But don't you want to return to Bath? You have no chaperone, now that Sir Oswald has left with your grandfather. No, she agreed. But I have done quite enough travelling for one day, so here I shall stay. You may arrange a bedchamber with the landlord while I arrange a bath. And off she went to find the landlady. Shrugging, Gideon went downstairs to bespeak a couple of private bedchambers. Luckily there were two, one on either side of the private sitting room, where the late events had taken place. He ordered fires to be lit in both chambers, and a brandy to be brought for himself, and sat down to mull over the events of the night. Some time later, Prudence appeared at the door. She was dressed in a garish, flowered dressing gown, much too large for her. Her skin glowed from her bath and her hair curled in damp, flame-coloured corkscrews around her face. She looked fresh and wholesome, and when she smiled shyly at him, 
Gideon had never seen anything more beautiful in his life. I thought you would be in bed by now, he said. How do you feel? She smiled. Much better, thank you. The landlady had some herbal salve that was wonderfully efficacious. That and the bath have made a new woman of me. Are you thirsty? Hungry? Shall I order? No, thank you. All I need is to speak to you. She pulled a chair up opposite him and sat down. She folded her hands in her lap, wiped the palms, then folded them again. When I was first tossed into the coach, I was very frightened and confused. I don't think I will ever forgive my... Please, just listen. He subsided, so she continued. When I realized it was Grandpapa, and that he was in as black a mood as I'd ever experienced, well, she took a breath and blurted it out. I thought I might die before this night was through. He nearly killed me once before. The time she lost the baby, thought Gideon. My poor, no, please. She held up her hand to stop him. I want to say this. I need to explain. At first, all I could think of was that I would die. And then I thought of you. My thoughts of you made me feel better, stronger. Her eyes were misty as she said softly, I know you blame yourself for not protecting me, Gideon. But no one is to blame except Grandpapa for the kidnapping. And you did protect me, in a way. I could have been lost in terror, but I wasn't. I knew you'd come. That gave me strength and hope. And because of it, I was able to escape the coach and reach help in the inn. Gideon felt immensely humbled. He would probably go to his grave regretting that he let her walk home alone. But her forgiveness touched him deeply. While I was trapped in the coach, I thought, what if I die without ever making love with him? He made a small choked sound, but she continued. What if I never get the chance to tell him how much I love him? Her eyes were luminous with unshed tears. I will waste no more of the time I have on this earth, and I want to tell you now that I love you with all my heart, and all my soul, and all my body, and tonight I want to lie in your arms, if you'll have me. If he'd have her? Didn't she know he'd give his life for her? He swallowed. Are you sure of this? She nodded. Quite, quite sure. The look in her eyes drove every coherent thought from his mind. He could say not a word, for fear that he would weep. It took him a moment to gather himself. After all she had been through tonight, Otterbury's public betrayal, and then her grandfather's violent kidnapping, she wanted him. Prudence wanted Gideon. Trusted him to love and comfort her. Tonight, I want to lie in your arms. Slowly, Gideon stood. He remained still and silent, looking down at her, this small, beautiful, gallant lady who had come to mean all the world to him. He could not speak, could only feel. And slowly, slowly, he held out his hand to her in a gesture old as time. It trembled a little. Without hesitation, she placed her hand in his, her smile unshadowed, trusting, full of more love than he had ever dreamed of or deserved. And so his heart thick with love and pride and humility, Gideon led his prudence to the bedchamber. Chapter 21 And we shall all the pleasures prove. Andrew Marvel the bedchamber was small and spare and simple. There was one bed covered with a simple blue counterpane, a few rag rugs, a dresser and a chair. There was a faint smell of camphor in the air. The room was spotlessly clean and a fire crackled merrily in the grate. Two brass candlesticks gleamed in the firelight, one on the dresser, which had been lit, and one beside the bed, which had not. Wind tossed the nearby trees about, and rattled the panes of the small windows, 
but the candles in their room glowed with a sure and steady light, undisturbed by any draught. They were well protected from the world outside. Prudence dropped his hand, hurried over, and turned back the bed in a housewifely manner. She took the unlit candles and carefully lit them from the ones on the dresser, then turned and looked at him, her eyes huge in a pale face. She smiled briefly, licked her lips, then tried it again, a brave little smile. She was nervous. Of course she was. Despite Otterbury, despite the pregnancy, she was still very much an innocent. He tried to think of what he could say to reassure her. He could think of not a word. I'm not afraid, she said, though she was shaking like a leaf. Just a little bit cold. Her hands gripped the landlady's dressing gown convulsively, crushing it to her in bunches of anxiety. I know. He took her hand and untangled it from the bunch and drew her closer. The scent of camphor was all around him. His fingers were trembling too, he noted wryly. He raised first one cold little hand, then the other, and kissed each reverently. Cold hands, warm heart he said, aware even as he said it of the inanity. All his address had deserted him. I want this. I really do. She smiled tremulously, moved closer, and lifted her arms to wrap them around his neck. I know. And suddenly they were kissing, and all his hesitation dissolved. His mouth was gentle, teasing, coaxing, reassuring. She tasted of warmth and sweetness and prudence, and he could not get enough of her. He had all the time in the world, he told himself, though his body was rigid with desire and trembling with want. But this night was for prudence. Her satisfaction and pleasure were all he desired. He reached for the tie on her dressing gown. He undid it, slid the sleeves down her arms, and tossed it over the chair and one small mystery was solved. Underneath the landlady's voluminous flowered dressing gown, Prudence was wearing the landlady's equally voluminous best linen nightgown. Gideon knew it was her best nightgown, not only by the lace and satin ribbons that adorned it so lavishly, but by the faint odour of camphor that clung to the garment. This was a nightgown that had been put away for years, saved for a special occasion, and brought out now very slightly yellowed, but still perfect, starched and unworn. A bridal nightgown. He might wrinkle his nose at the scent, but he had no quarrel with the landlady's sense of occasion. This was the most important night of his life. His bridal night. Gideon swallowed thickly. He undid the first button of the nightgown. The buttons were small, mother of pearl, and the buttonholes tight. His hands were clumsy and shaking, as if he had never unbuttoned a woman in his life. But this was prudence. He undid another button, and something lodged in his chest as he saw the mark. A long, dark red blotch across her neck, marring the porcelain perfection of her skin. He swore under his breath, leaned forward, and blew on it gently. Poor little love. Is it very painful? She shook her head. Don't worry about it. She reached for him again, but instead he caught her hands in his. A moment. Something else had caught his eye. He lifted a curl and found another dark mark beneath her left ear. Gideon stared at the marks, appalled. Suddenly he was disgusted with himself. He should not for one moment have even thought about taking Prudence to bed. He had been selfish, thoughtless. His little love had been humiliated kidnapped, jolted across the country in a carriage and beaten by a madman. She must be utterly exhausted and in pain, yet all her thoughts were for him. He was not worthy of such a woman, but he would learn to be. They would not make love tonight, not the way he'd so stupidly anticipated. She would be too sore, too tired. Tonight I want to lie in your arms, took on a new meaning, protection security, comfort. That's what she really wanted tonight, not a thoughtless randy rake in her bed. 
She needed him to hold her gently and chastely while she slept. Enough men had made demands on his prudence today. She needed Gideon's tender care and protection, and he vowed she would get it. He looked at the dark bruises on her skin and tried to swallow his rage. There are more of these? A few, she admitted reluctantly. Mostly on my left side. He was very angry, but truly, you need not worry. The herbal salve and the bath has made me forget my bruises. I let you down, imp. I should have killed him. Hush, you did not let me down. You saved me. I was never so glad in all my life as when you walked in that door, as I knew you would. She kissed him, her mouth soft and sweet. And I am glad you did not kill him. She stroked one finger down the line of his jaw in a loving gesture. If you had, the shadow would have hung over us both forever. Forget him. Forget what has happened. It's in the past, and to rue the past is to dwell there in shadows. She cupped his face in soft palms. Her eyes implored him. Right here, right now, you and I are alive in this room together. Let us celebrate that. He took her hands in his, and lifted first one, and then the other to his mouth and kissed them. Wise, as well as beautiful. How did I ever deserve to win you, imp? She bit her lip helplessly. Whenever he called her beautiful, it robbed her mind of any semblance of sense. She knew it was not so, but when he said it, she felt beautiful. He smoothed back her hair and traced her cheekbones with his thumbs. You, my little love, are exhausted. I think you have been through quite enough this day. What you need now is not another man making demands on you, but a good long sleep. Let us leave our celebration until tomorrow. You will feel better then. We have plenty of time after all. Climb into bed and go to sleep. I will hold you and keep you safe through the night. He bent and kissed her mouth softly. I'll not leave you, imp. Prudence thought about it. Outside the wind was picking up. Raindrops spattered in gusts against the windows. She was tired and her bruises ached. She did want to sleep, but more than that, more than anything, she wanted to lie with Gideon, to be possessed by him and to possess him back. Her world had been shaken to its foundations today, and she needed to make it right again, to put an end to her old life and begin a new life now, with Gideon. That would heal her more than any amount of sleep. He started to withdraw his hands, and she clutched them firmly. I know I am tired, and I will sleep later. But I want you, Gideon. I need to lie with you. I don't mean just lie down on the bed. I need to know you. She shook her head in frustration. Oh, I don't know the word for it. Why are girls kept so ignorant? It's positively gothic. She tried again to explain how she felt. Everyone wants something of me. But nobody ever asks me what I want. Well, I want you. Now. Tonight. I want to give myself to you. I want you to possess me in the way a man possesses a woman. I want to take you into my body. Her cheeks suddenly flamed, and she looked away, flustered by the strength of her desire. I'm sorry. That sounds completely shameless, I know. She looked back up at him. But that's how I feel. The sudden burst of feminine self-confidence drained abruptly away. If you would like to, that is. She added in a small voice. His dark eyes devoured her. He said in a low, ragged voice, Imp, you have unmanned me with such a declaration. If I would like to. He tried to smile and failed. I've never wanted anything more in my life. I've wanted to make love to you ever since I first met you. The hardest struggle of my existence has been to keep my hands off you. So you will lie with me tonight? I will. His voice was husky with emotion. He cradled her in his arms, barely holding her, and yet she felt wrapped within his embrace. 
His body touched lightly against the full length of hers, hard, masculine, and gentle. She shivered in his arms and pressed closer, reveling in his heat, in his strength. This was what she'd promised herself in her darkest hour. This was what she needed now, Gideon. He lowered his mouth to hers. His lips were so gentle. She marveled dazedly at his effect on her, that the touch, the caress of his mouth on hers could set other parts of her body to such aching, craving, yearning. She made a small sound deep in her throat, and he pulled back instantly until he barely touched her. His mouth gentled, and he covered her cheek, her jawbone, her eyelids with soft butterfly kisses. He was being careful of her. She didn't want to be treated like an invalid. She wanted passion, possession. She reached up and wound her arms around his neck, pulling him closer, pressing herself against him, and immediately he deepened the kiss. She tasted him and gloried in the sensation. It was this she craved, the unique, intoxicating flavor of Gideon and desire. His kiss was slow, intense, and drugging. It reached deep into her, body and soul. His hands roamed over her, caressing, sending hot shivers in their wake. Sensations, needs she'd never before known, grew deep within her, quivering to life, spreading, rippling, building. He returned to the buttons on her nightgown and continued undoing them. She jumped as his hands touched skin. She'd been so lost in the embrace that she'd almost forgotten what they were going to do. She knew what to expect next. She braced herself. He soothed her with soft kisses on her mouth, the hollow of her cheek, her jawline, and her neck. He undid another button, and she braced herself again. He stilled, and simply held her for a long moment, then reclaimed her mouth in an exquisitely tender kiss. She reassured him. I'm not. You don't have to worry. I've done this before. She tried to control her shaking. I want you, Gideon. I truly do. I know, love. He gathered her closer and pressed tiny kisses across her eyelids. All the stiffness drained out of her. Slowly, reluctantly, he relaxed his embrace. She floundered her way back to reality, feeling suddenly bereft. His gaze was dark and compelling in the shadows of the candlelight. Only a whisper of breath separated them. Will you assist me to disrobe, love? Prudence blinked. She had expected him to want to keep unbuttoning her clothing. Philip had rip. No. She wasn't going to think of that time. This was too precious a moment to spoil with thoughts of the past. Gideon wanted her to undo his buttons. Exactly what did he mean by disrobe? How much? She realized suddenly that he was waiting, a soft, unreadable look in his dark, dark eyes. Oh, yes, of course, she blurted, and hurriedly started to undo the buttons of his waistcoat. Her fingers were all thumbs. Perhaps we should start with my coat. It's rather a close fit. Oh, very well. She began to drag the coat off him. Her cheeks were hot. She had never done such a thing before. It's a very nice coat, isn't it? Yes, it is. He kissed her as she tugged at it. Very well cut, and the fabric is very fine. She draped the coat over the back of the chair and returned to his waistcoat. The waistcoat is very nice too, quite elegant, beautifully embroidered. What did you say to a man when you were taking his clothes off? Yes. It is a nice waistcoat. He smiled at her with such a tender look in his eyes that she blushed even more. She removed it and surveyed his shirt. It was tucked into his breeches. His breeches? Oh, heavens! She swallowed, then grabbed fistfuls of his shirt with determined hands and began to tug. It's a lovely shirt too, isn't it? He said conversationally. Very fine linen. There was a thread of amusement in his voice. She looked up at him. Are you making fun of me? His eyes were dancing. Never, my love. Never. 
He drew her close and kissed her thoroughly. I love your conversation when you're nervous, but indeed, I promise you, there is nothing to be nervous about. I'm not nervous, she lied, as she pulled his shirt tails free. He kissed her again. I am. She stared. But you've done this hundreds of times, he smiled ruefully. Not like this. And never with you, my love. With you, everything is different. And in case she doubted, he repeated it again. Everything. It almost sounded like a promise. She could not quite catch her breath. Emotion filled her throat. He pulled the shirt over his head and tossed it carelessly aside. He was bared to her gaze, and she could not stop looking. His skin was golden in the candlelight, shadows and angles, the shift and curve of muscles as he moved. He was beautiful. She reached out and touched the skin of his chest, running her fingers over the warm plains, learning his texture. She had not known men could be beautiful. A hollow ache stirred deep within her. He kissed her fingers, bent and swiftly removed his breeches. She averted her eyes hastily, shyly, but could not resist one quick glance. He was wearing drawers underneath. He caught her glance. Nice linen drawers. Her response was halfway between a laugh and a sob. His gentle teasing dissipated the raw tension inside her as nothing else could. She shook her head helplessly. Come here, he said softly, and she came to him in joy. He kissed her long and deep, and she kissed him back with everything that was in her heart. His hands roamed over her, creating the most spectacular sensations through the fine linen nightgown, leaving her hot, shaky, and breathless. She pressed against him, wanting more. His chest was lightly furred, and the texture and feel of it enchanted her. She rubbed her hands through it, wanting to feel him against her, skin to skin. Yes, that was it, what she wanted, skin to skin. She began to drag impatiently at the buttons of her nightgown. His hands joined hers, and in seconds her nightgown too had joined the pile of discarded clothing. He stared at her. Feeling suddenly self-conscious, she sucked in her stomach, and her hands moved to cover her nakedness. He reached out and stopped her, saying in a deep, husky voice, You are beautiful, my prudence. She stood there, his gaze warming her, dissolving her doubts. She ought to feel ashamed, standing so modestly naked before him. Yet she didn't. She felt beautiful, proud, desired, and a little bit exposed. She glanced at his drawers. In seconds he had removed them, and for a moment she could only look him in the chest. Slowly, slowly her eyes dropped, and it was her turn to stare. Not beautiful, magnificent. He lifted her and carried her to the bed. Effortlessly, she felt light, fragile, feminine in a way she'd only ever felt once before. It carried her then, too. And then they were on the bed, in each other's arms, touching, caressing, exploring, loving. He was so careful of her bruises, she wanted to weep. With hands that shook slightly, with fiercely reined in need, he turned her gently onto her good side, and facing her, began to work his way down her body, kissing, stroking, licking. Everywhere he touched, she felt beautiful. She touched him wherever she could, kissing, stroking, wanting to return the pleasure, but barely able to think. His hands were slow, deliberate. They skimmed, pressed, stroked. She shivered, loving every new sensation. He lightly brushed the undersides of her breasts with his fingers, in slow, aching circles, and she moved against them. Her eyes clenched shut against the waves of pleasure, as if they could somehow spill out and escape. Her skin felt paper-thin, tissue-thin, aching with pleasurable sensitivity. The scrape of a bristle, the firm pressure of a mouth, the slow trail of a big, warm hand across her body. He moved higher, 
brushing oh so lightly over the slopes of her breasts, and she arched helplessly toward him. More. More. He licked one tight, aching nipple, and it was like a warm, silken bath. He lifted his mouth. The cool night air pinched at her damp, deprived flesh, sending more ripples through her. Blindly, she clutched his head and brought it back to her. More. His mouth closed, a hot possession. Yes, she screamed and arched almost off the bed, then opened her eyes with sharp embarrassment. He made a sound deep and low in his throat and took the other breast in his mouth. The hot driving sensation swamped her before she could say anything. Vaguely she felt his hand seeking between her legs, and she realized he was about to take her. She tried to brace herself for what she knew would follow, but he simply covered her with his hand, cupping her, warm and soothing. So she relaxed and gave herself up to the glories his mouth was performing on her breasts. And then his hand began to move. He stroked her lightly his fingers just skimming, circling, pressing gently, achingly slow. Shivers of pleasure followed his every movement. Gradually the rhythmic stroking increased, still too slow, too light, tantalizing. She pressed herself against him, and a long, strong finger slipped inside her, and the pace and pressure of his rhythmic stroking increased. It built, a roiling, explosive pressure within her. She moved helplessly under his caresses, pushing herself at him, around him, against him. She wanted it to stop. She wanted it never to stop. She wanted... She wanted... She did not know what she wanted, and, oh, the frustration of it was eating her alive. Devouring her. Swamping her. She gripped him harder, her limbs moving restlessly, frenziedly. She felt his hand shift, his fingers seek and find, and she half came off the bed in surprise as a shard of pleasure splintered her over and over. She began shuddering uncontrollably. What was happening? She half-heartedly tried to push him away, but instead her body was pushing at him, demanding, seeking, wanting. It was as if some force, some power beyond her will had taken over her body. She was a fallen leaf, swirling helplessly in a whirlpool, being swept along toward a waterfall. Then his hands moved again, and all thought was driven from her mind. Gideon's body was taut as an arrow, trembling like a bow about to snap. He could hold back no longer. In one smooth movement, he entered her. Her muscles clamped around him, and she began to move with him in a hot, primeval rhythm. He felt her climax coming. She cried out in shock, a little panicky. I am here, love. Go with it. Do not fight it. She clung to him, and he held her tight and felt her shatter all around him. His own control splintered, and he let the dark waves take him, take them both. Deep within her, he felt his body explode, and all he could do was hold her and keep her with him as he, too, shattered, into blessed nothingness. It was still dark outside, but a few birds were chattering in the trees surrounding the inn. It would be dawn soon. The wind had dropped. A chill was in the air. Gideon slipped from the bed and padded across to the fireplace. Embers were still glowing dully, so he stirred them up and added first some kindling, then coal, until a warm, bright blaze gilded the room once more. He did not want this night to die, for who knew what the dawn would bring? He never trusted dawn. He slipped back under the covers and watched her sleeping. God, she was beautiful. Her pale silken skin was flushed and dewy, her glorious hair a fiery tangle of curls clustered about her face. He touched a gleaming tendril. It curled possessively around his finger. He looked at her nose and smiled. Women were funny. She hated this nose of hers, the masterful little nose she'd looked down at him so often. He loved her nose. It was perfect. He bent over and kissed it lightly. She stirred and muttered and vaguely swatted him away. He lay there, watching her, thinking about the night they'd passed. 
He thought he knew all there was to be known about the activities of the pet chamber. He had not known it could be like that. Like this, he thought, as he watched the rise and fall as she breathed. Who would have believed that simply watching her breathe could move him so deeply? She was more precious to him than life. He was used to loving easily, but loving deeply. She moved. The covers shifted. In the firelight she was all cream and gold and rose and flame. Fresh need built in him. Her shoulder was bared, hunched against the morning chill. A beautiful shoulder, marred by an ugly bruise. He kissed the shoulder. She sighed and smiled in her sleep. She was not in pain then. He kissed the shoulder again. She moved, shifting the covers. Breasts, creamy, rose-tipped, and more than beautiful. He tasted them lightly. Beautiful, but not his current goal. He slid lower, kissing and nibbling his way down her body, exploring and tasting each soft, delectable curve. Sleepily, luxuriously, she arched against him, and as she stirred, he reached his goal. He tasted salt, and heat, and woman. His woman. The one he hadn't known, hadn't believed existed, who had made a man out of a sham. His mouth claimed her. G Gideon! Her voice was hesitant, surprised, a little embarrassed. Morning, love, he said, and continued with his task. She gasped, but said no more. She communicated her pleasure in squeaks and gasps and silent tremors, and with small convulsive clutches at his hair as she melted all around him. And as he took her to climax, she cried out, shuddering against him, the words he had once dreaded and now craved to hear. I love you. Prudence sighed. It was a glorious sunny morning, one of those days where it seemed the whole of England smiled. She stared out of the carriage window, staring blankly at green fields, clean, prosperous villages, rolling hills. Gideon and she would be married, she knew. She ought to be over the moon with happiness. She was, almost. One tiny question niggled at the back of her mind, like a sore tooth. Did he really want to marry her? He desired and cared for her. She knew that now. How could she not, after that blissful night they'd spent together, and the blissful morning? But did he truly desire to marry her, the way she wanted to marry him? And did he love her, the way she loved him? Because he hadn't yet said it. He hadn't said the simple little words, I love you. He'd spoken of want and need, not love. He'd called her love, but endearment slipped easily off his tongue. And he still hadn't uttered those simple little words. Will you marry me? Was he being noble? Was his decision to marry her another kind of rescue, an apparently blithe acceptance of his fate? If it was, he would be kind and try not to let her see it. He was gallant that way. But she would know eventually. To have only kindness and gallantry and duty, and not his love. She would rather die. He wanted her now, she knew, could feel his eyes on her, her body still thrilled with secret knowledge of his wanting. But he hadn't indicated it was any more than that. Want and need were wonderful, she had to admit, but they were not enough for her. True love grew and grew. To love, and be loved like that, was what she'd yearned for all her life. She had to know. She would have to ask him, but it was so difficult to ask. She sighed again. That's the third time you've sighed in as many minutes. What is it, my prudence? His voice was tender, concerned. I need... I need to ask you something. Oh? She hurried on. It is a little difficult to ask, after such a night of... of blissful splendor. Blissful splendor, eh? She felt herself blushing. Yes, but... When you asked me the other day in Lady Augusta's parlour to, to live with you and be your love, what exactly did you mean? He was silent, so she hurried to explain. 
Oh, I, I know you very kindly claim me as your fiancé when Philip let me down so publicly, and I know you told Grandpapa I was your wife-to-be, and so I know you're obliged to, um, because I know you're truly noble at heart and will marry to protect me, so I am not doubting your intentions. His eyes darkened. But back then, in Bath, in Lady Augusta's parlour, did you actually mean to invite me to be your mistress? He stared at her, and she squirmed slightly in embarrassment. I'm sorry, but I do need to know. It's all right if you did. It wasn't really all right, but she desperately needed to know the truth. I just need to clarify matters. In my mind, I know it will not change anything, just please tell me. She found she was wringing her hands quite painfully. She stopped, folding them in a ladylike fashion in her lap. Have you finished, Imp? She looked up from her folded hands. Y yes He reached out and took her hand in his. Prudence braced herself to accept an unpalatable truth with dignity. Firstly, let me make one thing quite clear. I did not ask you to become my mistress. Whatever gave you that idea? Philip said. He shook his head. I might have known. I thought all that was the past. She bit her lip and nodded. I know, it is. I'm sorry. And at first I did believe you had asked me, very indirectly, to marry you. But then he pointed out you'd only spoken of protection and said, Come live with me and be my love, and we shall all the pleasures prove. Her cheeks heated again as her body remembered the previous night, when he had proved pleasures beyond any imagining. Well... I wasn't sure any more. He closed his eyes, put his head in his hands and made a sound halfway between a laugh and a moan. When he opened his eyes again, they were darkly rueful. That piece of verse, my dearest love, was not a rake asking you to be his mistress, but a poor, hopeless fool, desperately in love for the first and last time in his life, and making a terrible mull of his first ever marriage proposal. Prudence could not breathe. My dearest love, in love for the first and last time in his life, desperately in love. He shook his head and smiled apologetically. I am not very good at proposing, you see. I haven't had a lot of practice. I was desperate to win you, but it wasn't going well. I thought poetry would help. He let go of her and ran a hand through his hair. God help me. I thought it was romantic. Oh, but it was. It is. Prudence clutched his hands again. I'm sorry I doubted you. It was just my regrettable past, I know. I'm not a rake any more. There is only one woman in the world for me. My Prudence. And there, in the jolting carriage, he knelt down at her feet, took her hand in his, and said, My dearest love, Will you please say you will marry me, and make me the happiest man on earth? Oh, yes, she breathed. She could not see him clearly for tears. Yes, please. Oh, I am so glad. It was so distressing to find I still had doubts, even after we... We, um... She paused, still not having a word for what they had done together. At a moment of blissful splendor, he prompted rising, his eyes laughing, yet tender. Yes, that. Filled with feelings that had to burst from her or explode, she flung herself at his chest, and they fell back on the seat. She wrapped her arms around him and kissed him hard, on the mouth, on the chin, on the jaw, on the mouth again. I love you, Gideon. I love you so much. Oh, Prue, he groaned. You are my life. My love, my heart. Oh, but he tasted good, and he felt wonderful. Her hands, her mouth grew greedy with pleasure and desire. She wanted more of him. May I open your shirt? He grinned. You may open anything you wish. It's just that I wish to touch more of you. You feel so very nice, she explained as she tugged his shirt open. So do you, love. He reached for her, but she stopped him. 
Not yet. This is my turn. Sit still, please. He sat back, his eyes dancing. Bossy little creature, aren't you? Her hands roamed over him, learning him, delighting in his differences. The hard-angled muscles of his body, the rough friction of hair where she was smooth, the powerful strength of him where she was soft. Remembering what he had done to her, she licked his skin, tentatively at first. She ran his taste around in her mouth, savouring it. So this was the taste of love, a little salty, a little tangy and dangerous, yet with an underlying rightness. His chest was all firm planes, lightly sprinkled with dark hair, wonderfully abrasive. She spotted a tiny disk of raised dusky skin, like her in a way, and yet so very unlike. Remembering how exquisitely pleasurable it had been, when he took her nipple into his mouth, she touched her tongue to it and licked. He moaned with pleasure. It was a most satisfactory sound. She felt filled with feminine power. She moved to the other nipple and repeated the process, licking and sucking. Beneath her she felt his arousal thrusting against her. What a shame they would have to wait. She rubbed her body against him, and he groaned again. You're killing me, Prue. Mmm. She purred against his chest. She licked his nipple once more, then bit him there lightly, experimentally. His body bucked beneath her, and all his restraint dissolved. His mouth took hers. His hands caressed her feverishly, running down her back, her sides, her buttocks. Each time he shook and arched against her, an echoing response rippled through her, and a growing tension and a kind of aching hollowness intensified deep within her and he had taught her last night, and again this morning, what that had meant. She felt her skirts being pushed higher. Gideon? In a carriage? Yes, love, in a carriage. Prudence smiled to herself. She had a lot to learn, she could see. She would not have to wait for the shift and glide of his body deep within hers. How quickly it had become familiar. No, not familiar. Necessary. She craved it, craved his touch, craved their joining. With eager hands she unbuttoned his breeches. No nervous conversation this time. Softly, tentatively, she reached out to touch him. He groaned with pleasure and pushed against her hand. With growing confidence she explored him, explored his heat and power, silk over steel. He moaned, and without warning lifted her to settle over his lap. He still amazed her with his ability to lift her as if she weighed nothing at all. But then she forgot to think anything at all, as gently, surely, he guided her to where she wanted him to be. He lowered her onto him and showed her how to move. Rhythm. Power. Passion. Possession. She flung back her head and let it engulf her. Derham always was a dreary, joyless creature, but this is appalling, even for him. Lady Augusta hugged Prudence yet again. She'd done it frequently since Prudence and Gideon had arrived home several days before. But you're safe and sound now, with those who love you. Prudence hugged her back, unable to say a word. She'd come a long way since the grey days at Derham Court. Her world was brimming with love. She was surrounded by it, filled with it, incandescent with it. In truth, she had almost forgotten the terrible trip with Grandpapa. It was days ago now, blissful days awash with love and stolen moments of ecstasy. Gideon loved her. She was going to marry him. Bats in the belfry, Great Uncle Oswald announced. He had arrived from Norfolk a few minutes before. They were all gathered in the front room at Lady Augusta's house. He shook his head. Goes to show. Prudence and Gideon looked at each other blankly. "'I don't follow you, Sir Oswald,' Gideon said. "'Rats in the attic,' he explained. Then, when they still looked blank, he said, "'My brother Theodore, talking all sorts of rubbish, raving on and on about Prudence and the others, mixing Prudence up with her mother.' He shook his head again. "'He hated my mother,' Prudence commented. He blamed her for enticing my father away from Derham Court, never to return. 
Great Uncle Oswald snorted. Your mother had nothing to do with it. Your father left the court for the same reason I did, because Theodore was such a damned impossible swine to live with. There was a short silence. You're all thinking I should never have let him take charge of five little girls, and you're right. He mopped his forehead with a handkerchief. Thing is, he was a difficult fellow to get along with then, but it was a natural difference of opinion. I couldn't stand having my brother lording it over me as if he were my father. It got worse over time. Losing your father, his sole heir, put him in a rage for years. He looked at them ruefully. Maybe that's when he started to go peculiar. Maybe the rats have been roaring at his upper stories all this time. You mean you think he is insane? asked Gideon bluntly. Great Uncle Oswald nodded. That's the word with no bark on it. Thought he was a little unbalanced when I saw him in London, but he's always hated being thwarted. Now, he grimaced, raving on about prudence, threatening to kill her, swearing about her breeding bastards. Forgive the language, my dear. He turned to Gideon. He's even carrying on about prudence putting him in debtor's prison, for heaven's sake, and if anyone's to blame for that, it's himself. Yes, he mentioned debtor's prison, Prudence said. I don't understand. Great Uncle Oswald looked grave. No easy way to put this, so I'll just spit it out. It seems he's embezzled your fortune, Prue. Your sister's too. That's why he kidnapped you. With your twenty-first birthday next week, and you assume in guardianship of your sisters, Theodore thought if he locked you away, he'd get more back and nobody would find out. Prudence started. You mean we have no money? My sisters and I are... Calm down, Missy. You'll get your inheritance. I'll sort it all out and put everything back in place, never you fret. Everything's invested in the funds, safe and sound, and a little more besides. Oh, but... You cannot be expected to... Pish, Tosh! He waved his hand in airy dismissal of her objections. You girls will inherit my fortune when I pop off, so what's the difference? Besides, I've got a lot to make up for, leaving you with Theodore all these years. I ought to have kept a closer eye on you, but I didn't, and I'll have to live with the guilt of that. I can't make it up to you, but I can do this, at least. So no argument, Missy. He blew his nose again, a long, definitive blast. Lady Augusta put the question in all their minds. So, what will happen now? Great Uncle Oswald sighed. I'll not put my brother in Bedlam, for all the world to gawk at, but I've got him safely locked away at Derham. Get some reliable staff in to take care of him. A Dr. Gibson has agreed to oversee the matter. He looked around the small gathering and said, Well... I can't have him wandering loose, the way he's behaving. He'll kill someone. He's stark staring mad, my dears. He paused, looked at his nails, and added casually, Why? You wouldn't believe what Theodore did to young Clotterbury when he came calling. Clotterbury called on him, exclaimed Gideon. Whatever for? Great Uncle Oswald shrugged. Seemed to think Theodore owed him something for telling him that Prudence and the girls were in Bath. There was an outbreak of indignation at this. I hope you showed the vile little tick the door, exclaimed Lady Augusta hotly. Oh no, Great Uncle Oswald said innocently. I agreed with him. He was owed something. Oswald, how could you? Lady Augusta exclaimed in disgust. So I showed him in to see Theodore. He buffed one nail carefully with a tiny chamois buffer and added, and locked the door, of course, can't let my brother roam free, you know. What happened? Oh, well, there was a lot of shouting and banging and crashing around. But I'm not the sort of fellow who listens at doors. Manners, you know. I came back, half an hour later, thinking they'd finished the interview. And when I opened the door, the most peculiar thing. Young Clotterbury had got himself all dirtied up. Shocking the state he was in. Bleeding from the nose. I fancy Theodore broke it for him, and one of his ears looked bitten most odd. He'd lost a tooth or two, and the rest of him was black and blue. His natty outfit was in shreds, too, positive shreds, and all the buttons ripped off. He shook his head in sorrow. Beautiful clothes they were, too. Must have cost him a pretty penny, and Theodore ruined them. Clotterbury staggered out of there and scuttled off home, looking like something the cat coughed up. 
He gave them all the smile of wicked innocence. Got his reward, didn't he? Never let it be said a Meridew didn't pay his debts. Gideon gave a crack of laughter and hugged Prudence. Lady Augusta clapped her hands. Excellent work, Oswald. I too have taken young Otterbury's future in hand. Maudie's friends are his employers, you know, and we've arranged a nice posting for him. A small island in the southern hemisphere, rather distant, but delightfully peaceful. Supervising sheep, I believe. Sadly, his wife and child to come won't be able to accompany him. I'm told the island is hideously wind-blasted. There was another outbreak of laughter. Lady Augusta nodded in satisfaction. Now, enough about those dreary men, Oswald. We have a wedding to plan. To Prudence's surprise, Great Uncle Oswald just stared at Lady Augusta and blushed. Oh, Gussie! To Gideon's amazement, Aunt Gussie blushed also. She said testily, I meant these children here, Oswald, Prudence and Gideon. Their wedding, not any other one. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Great Uncle Oswald agreed. But he did not stop gazing at Lady Augusta and Lady Augusta's blush didn't go away for the longest time. Prudence looked at Gideon, her eyes wide. Great Uncle Oswald and Lady Augusta. He grinned, winked, and lifted her hand to kiss it. Sir Oswald cleared his throat. St. George's, Hanover Square, I trust. Gideon looked at Prudence, a question in his eyes. Wherever you want, my love. Prudence smiled back. Bath Abbey. A week from today. If we can get word to Charity and Edward, I would like them to be there with us. Does nobody wish to get married in St. George's? grumbled Sir Oswald. He darted a look at Lady Augusta. She coloured up again, but addressed herself to Prudence and Gideon. And where do you plan to take Prudence for her bride trip, nephew? Gideon looked down at his bride and grinned. Into Italy, of course. Prudence gasped. Italy, was all she could say. She hugged his arm and gave him a wavering, brilliant smile, knowing her eyes were filling again. Italy. But why Italy? asked Lady Augusta, amid general exclamations of excitement. Gideon sighed theatrically. It seems I must instantly flee the country. My tailor is pursuing me because of certain bills someone impetuously dashed into the fire. Later that afternoon, Gideon and Prudence were ensconced in the cosy back parlour at Lady Augusta's. He was sprawled, loose-limbed on the sofa. She was snuggled next to him. A fire crackled in the grate. Outside, wind and sleet pelted the windows. Gideon said, You know, Imp, looking back, I have idled away the years and wasted myself in folly, and all to no purpose. What do you mean, no purpose? Can they be purposed to idleness and folly? Oh, they can, indeed. In the shallow life I adopted, I was trying to avoid love. I thought it was a weakness, you see. A point of extreme vulnerability. I thought love killed my father, but I was wrong. It wasn't love that caused him to kill himself. It was loss of love. Prudence took his hands in hers and said passionately, No, he was wrong. He may have lost your mother, but he had you, his son, to love and to love him back. If he had thought of you instead of himself, he would have remembered that love, and it would have healed him. Even when no one loves you, there is always someone to love. Someone who needs to be loved. Always. You just have to look outside yourself. As I did, he kissed her tenderly. And I saw you, sitting on the edge of an Egyptian chair, scared stiff, clutching that ugly great reticule, and I fell in love. And then you defended me from your great uncle, and I fell even more deeply, in a way I never believed possible. I did too, though I fought it for the longest time, she said shyly. I thought it was your rakish wiles I couldn't resist, but it was you, just you. I love you, Gideon, more than even I believed possible. His grip tightened around her. And I love you. I'll never let you go, Prudence. Never. 
If you ever run away from me, I want to come with you. Nestled within his arms, she hugged him back. Good. I would insist upon it anyway. I never believed Mama's promise would come true for me, but it has. Sunshine and laughter and love and happiness. She laid her face against his throat. And see, it has all come true. All of it? What about the sunshine? Gideon looked out at the grey sleet, still hammering against the windows as it had for the last hour, and then down at the bright head of the woman in his arms. She looked up at him and smiled. Ah, yes, he said softly. I can see the sunshine now. This concludes The Perfect Rake by Anne Gracie, narrated by Heather Wilds. Copyright 2005 by Anne Gracie. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Anne Gracie, care of Nancy Yost Literary Agency, and was produced in the year 2020 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright there too. Please visit tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.